four commissioners here. No word on Commissioner Tarkanian. All right, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, commence with the uh, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United States, the United of, America, States of America, to the republic, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for, all. justice for all. Amen. Thank you, sir. Okay. We, uh, we'll start with public comment. Public comment will be taken during the beginning and at the end of the board meeting. Additional public comment periods may be allowed on individual agenda items at the discretion of the chair. It is requested that members of the public provide public comments on those items in the agenda that are considered to be germane to the agenda. Okay, I'm on. Sorry. Um, start video. Public comment is limited to three minutes per person per speaker on matters over which the board has jurisdiction, supervision, or control. It is requested that public comment be respectful of during and viewpoints and that individuals do not engage in personal attacks or become disruptive of the orderly conduct of the meeting. In addition to opening public comments, the public comment will also be taken on the following agenda items when they are discussed by the board. These will include items two, three, 12, 14, five minutes will be allowed. At this time, public comment will be taken on those items that are within the jurisdiction and control of the Board of County Commissioners. Natalie. Mr. Chairman, I just want to acknowledge that Commissioner Tarkanian was able to log in. He's with us now. Okay, good. Welcome, Commissioner Tarkanian. Okay, Natalie Wood for the record. Um, we will start with opening public comment. I do have uh, three individuals who have noted that they would like to make opening public comment. We will start with Jim Slade. Um, if anyone else wants to make public comment, please um, raise your hand or um, send me a chat um, for opening public comment. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Go ahead and state your name for the record and then I'll start your five minutes. Five minutes, you're very generous, thank you. Uh, Jim Slade, at your first meeting this year, some priorities for the county. Majority expressed their desire to control growth in part by limiting master plan amendments and variances, by being diligent in making sure that required findings for them meet both the letter and intent of county code in the master plan. You also stated your concerns about our most precious resource, our water and traffic congestion. You reminded us of the widespread desire to keep our county rural and the growth doesn't pay for itself and should not be a burden to existing taxpayers. At the January 12th Planning Commission meeting, staff was asked, quote, if they had any sense of direction from the new county commissioners regarding development. Tom Dallaire responded, quote, not yet. What? Was he not listening to what you all said eight days earlier? At the Planning Commission meeting on February 9th, I quoted extensively from the board's comments on development so that they would better understand what the board expects. At that same meeting, however, the first agenda item was for possible action discussion on a second two-year extension for CTH Minden for a special use permit and major variance for a 130-unit, three-story senior living facility on Ironwood Drive. That is what was approved in 2017 and given an extension in 2019 and was addressed in the agenda packet and the staff presentation. In the subsequent presentation by the applicant, however, to everyone's surprise, they stated they had a new concept for the plan for only a two-story building with only 88 units. 
This project site is zoned neighborhood commercial, which allows a maximum height of 35 feet. The earlier proposal requested a major variance. The main reason expressed being, quote, the architecture of the building includes 10 foot ceiling, creating an open and spacious feel for residents. That has nothing to do with any required finding for a variance, none of which were met. Yet the planning commission back in 2017 ignored that and approved the major variance. Now, however, the applicant proposes a two story building yet still wanted the variance extended. They gave no justification whatsoever as to how it still met any of the required findings. Hence the variance was unwarranted. One commissioner stated, quote, this project has changed very significantly from what was originally proposed. The design has changed, the height requirement has changed, the whole concept has changed. Even the applicant admitted that the extra height was just for aesthetics, that they didn't have the details, the design was just a concept, and they would respect whatever decision was made by the planning commission. Shockingly, with no reference to whether any of the findings were actually met, the planning commission voted four to two to extend the major variance again, while reducing the maximum height by a mere four feet. This item is not expected to come to the board at this time, but you should request to hear it. It's also clear that you need to have a joint meeting with the planning commission and staff so that they understand the board's direction regarding development. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jim. Next I have is Natalie Yanish. Natalie, are you there? Hi, um, sorry. Hit. Am I coming through? Yes, if you want to do opening public comment. Um, I was commenting on item number 12, and so I'm not, not sure on that item yet. Okay, so, great. I will hold until then. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, I'll put you back in the hold for that one. Okay, and then I do have um, Christopher Ireland has his hand raised to talk. Christopher, did you want to provide opening public comment? Yes, thank you. Um, and you'll have five minutes, so please state your name for the record and then I'll start the timer. Great, I'm Christopher Ireland and as you can see, I'm not a guy. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that I'm gonna be able to be on here for when you get to vacation rental issues. So I just wanted to say that I hope you will include that the Marriott is now offering vacation home rentals as part of their hotel points program. There's several residents in the Tahoe Township that can be rented directly from the Marriott. Um, this seems to mean that the Marriott can increase its presence without any review or approval from the county. So I'd like to understand what any commissioners know about this and what, if anything, can be done. Thanks. All right, thank you, Christopher. And then do we have anyone else that would like to provide public comment at this time? Uh, Natalie, I would. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Dan Coverley, Douglas County Sheriff. Uh, commissioners, I just wanted to update you on the status of uh, Sergeant Lenz. Uh, he has been cleared for full duty and will return back to work on Monday. Also wanted to uh, express my thanks to you and the community in general for the outpouring of support and love that was shown to Sergeant Lenz. And uh, we appreciate it very much and, and it means a lot to us. And I just wanted to say thank you and, and give you the update on he's coming back to work, which we're very excited about. Sheriff, that's great news. Thanks for the update. Thank you. Okay, and then um, Doug, you had your hand raised. Did you want to speak now or do you want me to go through the rest of the public that have comments? I'll, I'll wait. Thank you. And then Mark, does that work for you as well? We have one more um, member of the public that has their hand raised. You're muted, sir. I, yes. Um, well, uh, I'll just take a quick moment here and say that uh, what uh, Sheriff Coverly uh, uh, gave us the news on is probably the best news I've heard in a very long time. 
and uh, I am so glad that uh, that uh, Sergeant Lynn survived this, and uh, and so uh, I welcome him back to the force. And uh, thank you, Dan, for that information. Appreciate it. Okay, Todd Stroop. We have opening public comment. Thank you. Todd Stroop with Tahoe Douglas Fire for the record. In regards to item 11, we are concerned about the unintended consequences of making this change. We believe that requiring fire sprinklers for manufactured homes is needed to avoid loss of life in the event of a fire in a mobile home park. In the Tahoe Township, we do have mobile home parks where fire access is very limited and we can't get engines close enough to the homes. In addition, the minimal setbacks to other homes and the wildland is going to increase the potential for a conflagration event. The only option is for sprinklers. The proposed ordinance will create an increased risk for those occupying these homes and their surrounding communities. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I have one more member of the public, Lynn Muzzy. Lynn, are you there? Yes, I am. All right, go ahead and state your name for the record and then I'll start your five minutes. Sure, it's Lynn Muzzy. Okay, we're good when you are. The Nevada Policy Research Institute has exposed Governor Sisolak's lie that his COVID emergency powers are authorized by NRS 414-060. NPRI research says this statute merely allows the governor to cooperate with federal or state officials on emergency management issues, period. We're hearing that the governor may drop these mandates in May as the COVID case count subsides but this new revelation blows cover, Sisolak's cover story that his mandate follows the science of public health. It doesn't seem likely that Sisolak, who lied to assert his power, will reduce or drop his mandates no matter what COVID case counts indicate. I encourage you to pass an ordinance similar to the other rural counties that would assert Douglas County's authority to ignore Sisolak's illegal mandates and partner with our businesses on COVID mitigation. If the governor drops his dictates, we will all celebrate. If not, we will have the mechanism in place to end the needless harassment of our business community. A few years ago, then Commissioner Dave Nelson and some of his constituents worked with our DA and Sheriff and the BOCC to pass a resolution making Douglas County a Second Amendment sanctuary. This served to make county government the shield between the gun grabbers and law-abiding Douglas gun owners. Commissioner Nelson put Douglas County in the forefront as the people's Second Amendment protector. I urge you to do the same for your tax-paying business constituents. Regarding your new public comment telephone protocol, it stinks on ice. The recorded line provided a flexible time frame for BOCC commenters to leave messages. Making callers hang on or until they're called is a needless inconvenience, particularly for business owners. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, and I do not see any other attendees. Doug, if you still wanted to make your comments. Thank you, my name is Doug Ritchie. I, I live in Minden. Um, I grew up in the 80s, uh, high school, college, and uh, one of the formative experiences of my youth was listening to Rush Limbaugh on the radio, kind of like Paul Harvey, and uh, he passed away yesterday um people have, he was a polarizing figure but he was always very funny he had a good sense of humor and he always believed in american exceptionalism um the belief that uh, america was a unique place we have a constitution that believes that powers are derived from the people and not from the government and um i wanted to note that i don't know if governor sislak is going to issue an order requiring flags to be at half staff like he did for Sheldon Allison, but um, 
I did want to note that uh, Rush, Rush Limbaugh um, was a great voice in America. Well said, Mr. Ritchie. Thank you. Natalie, do we have any further comments? I do not see anybody else that would like to make public comment at this time. Well, at this juncture, we'll go ahead. At this time, public comments will be taken only on those items that were within the jurisdiction and the control of the board. And uh, we will move on the agenda to the approval of the agenda. It's an action item for possible action, approval of the uh, proposed agenda. The board of commissioners reserves the right to take items in a different order to accomplish business in the most efficient manner to combine two or more agenda items for consideration and to remove items from the agenda or delay discussion relating to items on the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Would one of the commissioners care to make a motion? Oh, I, so Mark Gardner, I will make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Is there a second? I'll second the uh, motion to approve the agenda. All right, we have a motion to approve the agenda and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The motion is carried to approve the agenda as is. N now we'll have uh, a motion to approve the previous minutes. It's for discussion to approve uh, the draft minutes of the January 4, uh, 2021 special meeting and the January 7, 2021 regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners. Would anybody like to make a motion? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Gardner. Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, I don't know if we can do this uh, both at the same time. I don't, uh, we can, Doug. I see you shaking your head, yes. So I will make a motion that uh, we approve the minutes of both the January 4th, 2021 special meeting and the January 7th, 2021 regular meetings of the Board of County Commissioners. I'll second. We have a first and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. The motion to uh, approve the minutes, the previous minutes uh, is carried. Now we'll move on and adjourn as the Board of County Commissioners and convene as the Douglas County Liquor Board. For possible action, discussion to approve the on-site unrestricted retail liquor license for La Hacienda del Sazon, represented by its owner, Alejandro Vincente, and two on-site managers, Furman Vincente Urbano, Laura Nova, Alejandro Vincente, Furman Vincente Urbano, and Laura Nova have each signed a waiver of notice of hearing. Uh, Los Andes, Los, La Hacienda del Sosa is located at 1685 Highway 395, Suite B, Minden, Nevada, 89423. Captain Michiterian. Morning, Commissioners. Captain Michiterian is unavailable today, so myself and Sheriff Ron Elgis will be uh, handling this part of the liquor licenses. Um, they have now they have now completed all the proper paperwork and we've gone through it and we're not contesting their application. Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, uh, they have been approved for a liquor license. 
item number two for possible action discussion to approve the addition of an on-site retail unrestricted liquor license to the existing on-site beer and wine li liquor license package, retail liquor and restricted gaming license for Nevada Restaurant Services Incorporated, DBA Dottie's number 194. Dottie's number 194 is represented by General Manager David Michael <clears throat> Barnes, Manager Kathy McConaughey, and Dottie's number 194 is located at 1124 Super Center Lane, Gardnerville, Nevada, 89410. Captain Elgis, or Under Sheriff hey, Elgis. Yeah. Sorry, Under Sheriff Elgis, for the record. Um, this is an addition to the original um, application. And again, we're not contesting, and everything looks in order. Thank you. Sir, thank you. All those in favor of this motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any op opposition? The motion is carried. Thank you, Under Sheriff Elgis. We appreciate it and good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys too. Have a good day. Now we'll adjourn as the Douglas County Liquor Board and reconvene as Board of County Commissioners. And the consent calendar is a motion to approve the consent calendar items A through E as presented. Is there any other consideration? Hearing none, Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve the consent calendar items A through E as presented. We have a motion by Commissioner Rice. Do we hear a second? I'll second it. We have a first and a second to approve the consent calendar items A through E. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The opposition signify by saying nay. The motion is carried. All right, now we're at the administrative agenda. Item number one, for presentation only. Presentation by the Carson Water Subconservancy District regarding water resources for the Carson River watershed. Ed James, Mr. James, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, Ed James, General Manager for the Carson Water Subconservancy District. And today I'm going to give you kind of an overview of water resources for the Carson Valley. Before I get into it, I think it's important to focus on the entire watershed. <laughs> because <laughs> down the watershed does affect what goes on in Carson Valley. So just generally, the Carson River has two forks, the East and West Fork. They start up in Alpine County, flow down through Douglas County, they come together, then on to Carson City, down in the Lyon County, into La Hontan Reservoir. From La Hontan Reservoir, the water flows into Churchill County as part of the Newlands Project. Um, important thing to know about the Newlands Project, it's one of the first Bureau Reclamation projects. There is also, if people don't know, a canal that brings water from the Truckee River over to the Lahontan Reservoir to the Newlands Project. And this is critical because there is no way the Newlands Project would be able to provide agricultural water needs just from the Carson in normal or dry years. So the Truckee is a critical source to the resources. So I tell people that this causes us to be connected to the Truckee by the ankle. And so things that happen on the Truckee River also have an impact on the Carson. So currently, what are some of the water supply issues or situations? First of all, the Carson River is fully appropriated. That means all the water in the Carson has been allocated. And this also reflects if it's a dry year, average year, or wet year. This water, through administration of the Alpine Decree, is distributes the water. It's only in extreme wet years like 2017 that you may have any extra water. So basically, if you're looking at a water supply and if you're new to the system, 
you will have to acquire water from existing source because there's new, there is no new water available. 95% of the water on the Carson River is used for agricultural purposes. There is some water used for municipal use in the system. There are five major groundwater basins in this watershed. Every one of them is overappropriated. That means that the amount of water on the books is greater than what's actually physically available in the basin. However, the good news is except for one basin, every, the actual pumping is far less than the appropriated amount. So we are still pretty much in equilibrium in most of the groundwater basins. We have limited upstream storage. So we really depend upon mother nature, which also then means that the river is really operated on a year to year basis. You could have one year where you're having total water wet, excess water everywhere. And then the next year you'd be in a drought. There is no carryover storage. So you really have to operate the system on a year to year basis. Another thing is the interaction between groundwater and surface water. Now in Nevada water law, there are two different sections. There is the groundwater law and there's also surface water. And in the past, the state engineer actually administered these quite separately. But in reality, the hydrology, these two are connected, and especially for the Carson watershed because the river goes right through Carson Valley. And so there's quite a bit of interaction between groundwater and surface water. And the state is struggling about how to handle this situation and this may change in the future, which could have an impact on resources. There are some water quality problems, which I'll kind of go over, and then also some runoff pattern changes that we have seen. So first talk about groundwater pumping. This chart is taken from the Department of Water Resources pumping data. They put out an annual report. And the way they read this is the bars are the actual groundwater pumped and they're shown on the left side of the y-axis of how much water is done. And then the black line is the surface water flows at the Carson City gauge. And you can see the flow amounts on the right-hand side. A couple of things I wanna point out is the green bars are the agricultural use. And you can see how they fluctuate versus the flows in the river. When you have high flows in the river, like in 2011 and 2017, you'll see that the green bars are much smaller because the farmers can take surface water. And then in dry years, like 14, 15, you can see that the agricultural needs are much higher. And this is a bigger reason for why you have differences in pumping in the Carson watershed or Carson Valley. And you can see in 2015, almost 38,000 plus was pumped during that year. While in 2017, it was just under 25,000. Okay, following up again with the state engineer's pumping record. This is a summary of categories of how the water is inventoried. Um, you can see under irrigation, it's the biggest um, commitment of 51,000. Then you have municipal and M uh, Q and M for 34,000 wildlife, which is over just under 6,000, other uses and then domestic wells. Now, most domestic wells do not need a water right, but there are a few small ones that do have a water right. So the total commitment in 2018 was 94,607. You can see how much was actually pumped in 2018, where admissible, quasi-admissible had the highest use of 12,000 and then irrigation was 10,000. Wildlife, most of that water is used for the fish, fish hatchery you have there. Um, for domestic wells, under Nevada water law, you're entitled to two acre feet per domestic well. However, most of the time people do not use that much water. And so when they calculate how much water is actually being pumped, the state engineer assumes an acre foot per domestic well. And that's how they come up with the total of 29,399 acre feet for 2018. Now this tells you how much water was extracted, but how much water is available. Now a lot of people have heard the word perennial yield and the perennial yield is basically a, defined as the amount of natural re, um, precipitation that falls in the valley that recharges on a long-term average. 
So this is a long-term average over the period, but this may not be the most appropriate number for consideration water supply in Carson Valley due to other factors, which I'll get into, and also because of recharge due to agriculture. So this number is a good starting point, but really it's a basin yield that you may be more interested. And that is something that the USGS is gonna be talking about in their proposal to maybe get a much better handle of how much water you really have in the future. I wanted to talk briefly about this regional water system pipeline that was put in. There's a lot of confusion with this pipeline and the purpose. This pipeline was put in and the reason for it was not because, and actually this pipeline I should say serves North Douglas County, Indian Hills and water to Carson City. This pipeline was not put in because these communities were running out of water. They actually had plenty of water. The reason for this pipeline was because the arsenic standard for water quality went from 50 parts per billion to 10 parts per billion. And basically everything north of the airport was around 35 parts per billion. So once the federal government changed the standard on that, many of the existing wells no longer could produce to meet the water quality standards. Uh, back in the early 2000s, CWSD did an analysis to see what it would it take if every community was to do their own wellhead treatment. And what we found that the, if every community was to do that, the cost would probably be three to four times more than a regional pipeline and then the annual O&M cost would be significantly higher. So a regional pipeline was a way of really reducing costs to the overall community to, um, versus doing a wellhead treatment. This here again is some groundwater pumping. And I wanna point again, the bars are the total amount of this pumped. This green line is agricultural. What I wanna point out is the purple line it's showing here is the um, municipal water use and you can see it bounces up and down. You can start seeing it going up in 2014 and then you see it coming down. What's interesting to point out is that in 15, 16, 17, some of the water that's in this number actually goes to Carson City. So this does include water being exported into Carson City. And you can see even with that demand on there, the water usage has gone down. The main reason this is going down, and this is ha happening all over the watershed and also through the West, is that in 1415, we had some major droughts and the community realizing that they live in the desert started to do a voluntary cutback and that voluntary cutback actually started becoming a permanent cutback. And so you're actually seeing through conservation that even though there was a growth in the area and you're expanding the use to Carson City, the total use for M&I has gone down. So what are the threats to the water supply? I'm gonna talk about water quality. I'll talk about downstream demands and then runoff pattern changes. So with water quality, I already talked briefly about this, but arsenic is a big issue. Everything that has a red dot is studied, this is studied done by the USGS, has an arsenic above 10 parts per billion, which is the standard. And so as you can see here, you have quite a bit of areas in Carson Valley where you do exceed the 10 parts per billion. Where the river flows through this, most of the water is actually under the 10 parts per billion, which is why on the regional pipeline, they looked in this area to pump water to serve it. Now, one of the concerns to the community is, as you continue to pump all this water, are you gonna start drawing arsenic into these wells? And that is a concern that the community has. Um, it does not impact the amount of water you have, but if you have to treat it, it'll increase your costs. So this becomes an economic concern to the community. And that's part of the study that USGS is gonna propose is to look at this to see what is gonna happen in future pumping if that's gonna actually draw in arsenic into those wells. The other concern is nitrates. Um, a study was done years ago because originally people were pointing their fingers that the increase in nitrates was due to agriculture. Well, actually the study was done, we found out that really the increase is due to septic tanks. 
And this is the Ruhlenstroth area here. That was a study, again, done earlier by the USGS. And it's interesting to know that even though the Carson River flows really close to this community, the recharge does not come to Ruhlenstroth from the river, but from the pine nuts. And so one of the issues we're seeing is that the water levels in this area are dropping because the domestic wells are extracting more than what's able to come off the pine nuts to recharge it. But the other issue here is the increase in nitrates. And everywhere you see a red area, it shows that the nitrates exceed 10 parts per million, which is again, the drinking standard for the area. And what's interesting to note is where these red spots are, are where some of the older houses are. And so they have some of the oldest septic systems. So there is a concern that this area may find as they continue to go through, they stay on septics, that the water level in the future may no longer meet the drinking standards. So let's talk now about downstream demands. This is a picture of Lahontan Reservoir. And it's interesting to note that Lahontan Reservoir does not have a call on the river, but they are entitled to all water that flows freely down to the river. It's kind of a nuance that is important to understand when you look at administering the Alpine Decree. So that basically means that when there's not upstream users from agriculture, Lahontan is entitled to the free flow of the river. So when does Lahontan fill? In the winter and springtime. And down in the lower area, they're quite concerned about this groundwater pumping, you know, decreasing flows in the springtime that would actually go and fill into Lahontan Reservoir. So this is a concern that the downstream users are looking at, and it's something that CWSD has been trying to get a handle of what may be the impacts. What I wanna show you is this graph here. And what I've done is I've taken the Carson City gauge and I subtracted the flows from the East Fork and the West Fork. So basically how much is coming in the Carson River and then how much is leaving. And you can see that was every year, there is less water leaving Carson Valley than coming in, which makes sense because a lot of the water is used for irrigation. One thing is kind of interesting to note is that more water is consumed in Carson Valley in wet years than it is in dry years. And the reason is that the Carson Valley has a bigger agricultural demand and then what is physically available. And so when the river starts dropping, many of the water rights go out of priority and cannot divert water. But if you have a wet year, they can actually divert water for a longer period of time. So the actual amount of consumed water is higher in wet years. Now there are times like in 1983, you can see there was more water coming out and that was a very wet period. And that means water from the pine nuts and the mountain range actually were providing water through there to offset that. The one thing I wanna point out, and this is something to be look at, is look at 2000 year, 2000 forward. And you can see that the deficit is greater than it was historically. This again is a concern to the downstream users of, wait a minute, is there more water being used in the upper watershed than historically was the practice? And if that's the case, is that water that should have gone to Lahontan? This is something we are still investigating. I do not have a good answer at this point. We're still trying to get a better handle on it. They're trying to figure out what's happening because these numbers here, like in 2009, cannot be just justified because of pumping increases. There is something else occurring that we're trying to understand. Now, it might be that there is some you know, upstream diversions. This is record from the Federal Water Master of how much water is diverted upstream. The only problem with this is that the Federal Water Master does not record all the ditches. So we really don't know if we are seeing impacts because of some of the other ditches or there's an increase. And again, here's 2009, which isn't that much bigger than some other years. 2011 was a wet year, more was diverted, as I told you why, wet years. So again, we're still trying to get a feel, handle on what's happening. Why, if you look here, and I did the same analysis here, taking the Fort Churchill gauge and subtracting what's coming from Carson City. So basically, this is from Carson City down to Lahontan. And you can see, again, a deficit because of agriculture taking water out, there are some wet years. But you'll note here now that there is a trend to having less impacts in the future. 
or from 2000 forward. And so we're not seeing the impact as much here. This one really can be tied to agriculture diversions. In the lower watershed, they do, do measure all the ditches. And you can see the long-term trend that there is less water being taken out because a lot of the agriculture has been converted to M&I uses. Now, there's a lot more work that I want to do on this. This is not part of the USGS proposal coming forward, but we are trying to look at it. And some of the things I want to look at is how does the lower watershed compare to the upper watershed and seeing the overall impact. But these are things that you should be aware of as you start figuring out that this could be an impact to your supply. So let's look at change in runoff patterns. Um, CWSD has recently hired Loomis to do a study. It's called a water marketing study. It's basically funded by the Bureau of Reclamation on ways to enhance the sustainability of water supply. And one of the analysis they did was they looked at flow rates in the Carson and looked at changes from 1940 to 2018. And if you look down here, you can see at the West Fork, and I'm just going to focus on this bottom line here row, you can see on the West Fork, the change over the period of time is almost 8%. On the West Fork and on the East Fork, it's about 4%. What's interesting is the West Fork is a smaller watershed than the East Fork, but is also a lower elevation watershed than the East Fork. If you combine the two, you're just under 5%. But then if you start looking at the Carson City gauge, you're almost at a 9% change. So there's definitely something occurring in through Carson Valley that's reducing the flows. Now, one of the things that should be pointed out that when you get down to Fort Churchill, the impact we see is just under 4%, which is less than what Mother Nature is not providing us anymore. And that is probably due again to the reduction in agriculture in that area. This is another graph shown, this was done by DRI. This was done several years ago. And what this shows on the left-hand side on the y-axis is a fraction of annual flow. So this is not a hydrograph, but a fraction of the annual flow coming through. And they took the data set from 1941 to 2009 and broke it in half. And they compared the annual flows by month here. And I want to point out here in March, you can actually see a significant increase in flows coming down the East Fork and again, there's no upstream storage, so this is what Mother Nature is providing us. It's coming down greater than historically occurred. And then if you go over to June, you can actually see the opposite. There was more water historically coming down the river in June than there is today. And these are statistically significant figures, and this is a concern and trend going on in the future. And so this area is some of the work that has been done by the USGS. This is taking a lot of different models for climate change. And there's about 39 different model runs in here. So that's why the lines are all under different assumptions going through here. But basically what this is showing is a trend that the temperatures are increasing. And if the temperatures increase, that means two things. One is the runoff will be coming off earlier than we have historically seen. And also we'll see more rain than snow. And this will also have an impact on recharge and flows down the Carson River. The last thing I wanna talk about is the balancing the water resources. And this is really critical. Again, I always get questions. Are we running out of water in Carson Valley? Well, the short answer is no. There is quite a bit of water in Carson Valley. But the question is, how do you wanna use the water? And if all the water is fully allocated, there's that balancing act. And I always like to call this a three-legged stool. If you start trying to take all the water for immiscible use, you're going to be chopping the stool down. You're going to be an off balance over here. It's that balancing act that Douglas County really needs to face. How much agriculture do you want to see? How much growth do you want to see in the environment? All three depend upon each other. And again, if you start sh shifting the water from one to the other, you will have an off balance and you will not be in balance in the future. And that's a critical element that you really should be considering when you look at your water resources. So that's a fairly brief overview. There's a lot more details behind this, but I know you have a large agenda. So are there any questions at this time?
Do any of the commissioners have any questions for uh, Mr. James? Uh, Walt Noasad, Commissioner Noasad, do you have a question? I think you're muted. Ed, you're muted. I'm not muted. Not you. Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's hard to see these things. There we well, go. All right. Um, Uh, do you do you take measurements at various points in the in the valley or in, on the uh, in the aquifer area? If so, how many? Are you talking about groundwater levels or surface water levels? Uh, groundwater. Um, we do not, but we help fund the USGS to do sampling, and also the state engineer does. And I believe that on monitoring wells, there's probably fifty to a hundred different wells throughout the aquifer. Thank you. Do any of the other commissioners have a question for Mr. James? Uh, Commissioner Gardner? Uh, uh, Mr. James, very uh, good presentation. Uh, I'm not sure that everybody understands the difference between surface water and groundwater. Uh, so surface water, as I understand it, comes directly out of the Carson River. Is that and, and then groundwater comes out of the aquifer itself, directly out of the water. Is that correct? It is correct. However, both of them are interactive because a lot of the groundwater is recharged by the surface water through the river and through agriculture. And actually, when you move through from the south to the north, um, when the river comes from the east, east fork and west fork comes into Carson Valley, it's called a losing reach where water is actually leaving the river, going into the aquifer. But as you move further north, the aquifer starts to pinch and you actually have a gaining reach where water from groundwater is now coming in to become part of the surface water. Okay, so I guess my question is, uh, ranchers and farmers, agricultural, uh, their primary water source is uh, a surface water, as I understand it. And, but in a drought year, because that surface water is not available, they have to go deeper into the groundwater. Is that a correct statement? Well, what they had to do is turn on their wells. And these are um, supplemental wells. Okay. And that's why you see during dry years, they pump more water um, than they do in wet years. Now, typically they don't pump as much as what they would take on the surface because it costs them a lot more to operate. Okay. But uh, you know, during a wet year, it's more economic for them to take the water from the river and recharge or basically spread it on the fields. But when they do run out of water, they would then turn to their wells. Thank you. No other questions. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. James, I have a ton of questions, but we'll be here all afternoon. <laughs> and I'm sure the other commissioners have plenty of questions as well. This is a very interesting topic and we have, we appreciate your presentation. It's straightforward and easy to understand. And um, you've been working a lot the last couple of days. So thank you very much for your presentation. And I'd love to get together with you and we can go over the nuances because there are a lot of nuances, but, and I'm always willing to talk about water. It's one of my favorite subjects. So thank you. That's excellent. We'd we'll love to have you back. All right. All right, gentlemen, move on to item two for possible action, discussion to approve a concept proposal to evaluate the effects of groundwater management options on water resources in the Carson Valley submitted by the U.S. Geological Survey, USGS uh, Nevada Water Science Center at the request of county manager and authorized by the county manager to enter into an agreement for services with the USGS in a formal and acceptable um, to legal counsel for an amount not to exceed $359,500 for Douglas County's contribution to the same through the fiscal year 23-24. Kip Allender, USGS supervisor and hydrologist and Patrick Cates, county manager. Gentlemen, you have the floor. Kip, do you want to start? 
You bet. Thank you, Chairman. Um, for the record, I am uh, Kip Allender, the Supervisory Hydrologist with the USGS Nevada Water Science Center. Uh, just before I proceed, I want to make sure everybody can see me and hear me okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I have a presentation I'm going to attempt to share right now. And we'll see what happens. And I think you're seeing the participant screen. Mr. Chairman, uh, before he starts on his presentation, if I could just make a couple of statements. Um, uh, yeah. This scope of work has been uh, under review for quite a while. We were considering this, um, I guess about a year ago um, for consideration for funding and given our fiscal uncertainty uh, at the start of the current fiscal year or when the budgets were approved, we had deferred the scope of work. Um, I think both of these items are very important scopes of work to understand um, our aquifer and water management issues in the Carson Valley, as well as some water quality issues. And um, there have been previous studies done by USGS. This helps further the science. And for me, one of the important pieces of this um, is to be able to use this to help us develop a water resource plan for the county, uh, which is required by statute. Uh, we have several years in order to complete that. There'll be a lot of pieces that go into that. And this is sort of the underlying science um, input to that effort that we'll be making over the next several years. Thank you. So I'm going to share this again. This time I'm going to use a different screen. Let's see if this works. Okay. So do you see the full screen of the presentation now? Yes. All right. Yes. Very good. Okay. So um, here we go. So this, I'm going to talk about this concept proposal for that we've put forth for evaluating the effects of various groundwater management options on the water resources of Carson Valley. And I just wanted to go through this presentation and give an over, overview of the concepts behind this um, study, this proposed study. So to begin, I wanna talk about uh, the history of some of the water science that we have done in the basin. Uh, we did a similar study uh, back in the two, earlier 2000s, and it was published in a report in 2012, uh, where we initially developed uh, what we call a groundwater flow model to represent the system and to um, run simulations to make projections on, uh, on the effects of future pumping on the, on the water resources. Uh, and so the, uh, at that time, the uh, motivation for this study was related to rapid growth that was occurring in the Carson Valley. Um, the early, late 90s and early 2000s saw uh, really rapid growth. Um, there was some concern that that growth rate was gonna continue and that there was gonna be significant impact on the water resources. And so we embarked on the study and, and produced these results. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that study um, and some of the limitations of that work uh, and why the, it needs to be updated. Uh, so that work was focused on the Carson Valley uh, hydrographic area, which is shown in the lower right, um, and, which is basically defined uh, by the inflow of the West Fork uh, Carson River at Woodford. So we call that, that's our Woodford's gauge, as well as the East Fork Carson River uh, just above Gardnerville uh, at that gauge. And then the, uh, the terminus of the boundary of the study area, the lower boundary of the Carson Valley is the Carson River at Carson uh, stream gauge, which is uh, downstream of the valley. So uh, as Patrick mentioned, uh, some of the motivation for updating this evaluation is that is for the uh, Douglas County master plan, which has uh, been, you know, which is updated routinely. And they've been using the previous study, which was published in 2012. Uh, and a lot's happened since 2012, the, the original projections, which I'll show a slide on that, uh, the original growth rate projections were, were very exaggerated um, from what really happened. And so that study really kind of missed the mark. And so in order to really have to inform the, the master plan and planning in the Carson Valley, uh, an update of that work is needed. Also, as Patrick mentioned, 
there, there's SB 150, which, uh, which was passed by the state legislature in 2019, which requires that all local uh, counties and cities and, and, and governing boards to develop and maintain a water resource plan. And this uh, update of the water resources uh, for the Carson Valley would contribute, would be able to contribute to this, um, to this planning. So the previous study uh, that was completed in 2012 looked at uh, pumping through time in the Carson Valley up through the 2005, and then made these projections, this forecast based on that rate uh, into the future 60 years um, to see what the impact was. But the, the approach taken was really oversimplified and it was really exaggerated where they just said, let's estimate all the pumping just increases to up to that potential future amount immediately. And so 2005 was like normal pumping rate. And then 2006, they estimated municipal pumping would go up to near 40,000 acre feet and then hold steady for a period of 60 years, which isn't really a, a, a realistic uh, approach for projecting uh, growth and impacts on the water resources. Uh, but they were evaluating what the conditions were going to be like in 2060. So the end result was not that uh, affected by the way they did this projection, but still it wasn't a very realistic approach to uh, making forecasts on impacts to water resources. So, and, and that estimate of the growth was based on that earlier growth rate. And since then, it's the, the growth projections in the Valley have been, uh, have been refined. Um, there's, as everyone's fully aware, there's a lot of um, concern about having rapid growth or from converting uh, much agriculture to development. And so it's important to have a more realistic projection. This shows the projection from that earlier study. Uh, the, the map figure shows the water table uh, drawdowns, how much the water levels decline and how much of the water came out of the groundwater storage. The green area is being five to 10 feet, the tan area about 10 to 20 feet. And then in the Garden of All Ranchos and, and near the Fish Springs Flat, they're projecting the greatest drawdowns of more than of 20 to 40 feet or even more. And so there was pr pretty serious uh, concern about the projections uh, from that study um, because of the, the way that the growth rate was projected. It also projected that there would be a significant impact on uh, Carson River stream flow, uh, that there'd be large increases in the losses from the Carson River. That's what the box plot on the right shows with the blue bars representing like what the what, what we call a baseline scenario is if there was no additional growth, that's what the um, that's how much of the losses would be coming from the river. And then the red line uh, indicates that the, how much loss would be coming from the river with all that projected growth. The uh, map on the left also shows the distribution of pumping that was uh, in that projection uh, with the large red circles representing the large pumping wells, mostly the municipal supply wells, as well as some of the uh, irrigation supply wells. So the objective of the proposed study is to uh, reevaluate the effects of various groundwater management options on Carson Valley water resources. And when we say, wh what do we mean by Carson Valley water resources? We mean, what's it do to the groundwater levels, to the water that's in storage within the aquifer system, as well as the flow in Carson River? Because as Ed was talking about, earlier, the groundwater and the surface water are connected in Carson Valley. And that's, and it's really important to look at both simultaneously in order to get a picture of what the impacts are on the water resources, because, because everything is connected. So the approach for this study is to update the data sets. Uh, the previous study used data through 2005. Since 2005, there's been 15 years of data that's been collected that can be used to inform the models and to adjust the models to do a better job at representing the system. Uh, these figures just show uh, cumulative uh, fluxes into and out of the groundwater systems um, and some of the data that would need to be updated. Uh, for instance, uh, the stream flow, the water that's going in and out from the stream flow, uh, water that's leaving the system through uh, vapid transpiration or through crop, crop uh, water demand, crop use, crop water use, uh, pumping from wells, 
uh, as well as from uh, recharge from the mountains uh, and, and valley uh, from, from irrigation. Also other data that needs to be updated is the pumping record uh, in the, that's used to uh, run the model and then looking at the responses in the groundwater levels. And I know that the next item, Ramon Naranjo is gonna talk about some of this data. Um, and so that those water levels changes in the groundwater system inform the model, you adjust the properties of the model to better simulate those groundwater conditions uh, to know that you're doing a better job representing the system. And then the other thing we need to update is where changes in wells uh, locations, new wells that have been installed, uh, as well as uh, different pumping that's occurred uh, from the wells since 2005. Once you have all that data, you update the models. These two figures more or less represent the what the model looks like. The figure on the left shows the plan view of the different uh, geology that makes up the aquifer system, the basin fill units. Uh, and then there's a cross section through it that represents the, the three-dimensional aspect of the aquifer system or the depth of the aquifer. Uh, it is much steeper on the west end of the valley and shallower on the east end of the valley near the Pine Nut Mountains. Uh, the figure on the right shows the same geology, but superimposed with all the surface water features uh, on top of the groundwater system. So the main features, of course, being the east and west um, Carson River, and then also all of the uh, irrigation ditches, as well as uh, any of the drains within the system that, because all of these control the way that the groundwater work. And so we take all that information, update the models, and then re-simulate the system to make sure it's doing a good job. And once, we, uh, once the model is doing a good job representing the system, we use it to estimate what the impact of the various growth scenarios are on the water resources and, and, and then make these forecasts uh, up to 80 years, up to 100 years in the future. And so this is really where a lot of the involvement with the, the various groups takes place is to develop these realistic scenarios. And what we have listed here are just kind of the real broad range of the scenarios that are being planned. Uh, various growth rates centered around the 2% growth rate that's discussed in the master plan. Uh, we do like to also simulate something that's more extreme, such as the 3% growth rate, as well as uh, lower growth rates that may be more probable, 1% uh, or half percent. Uh, one of the uh, scenarios that was discussed by the water purveyors that they'd really like to see uh, is understanding what the impacts are of the development plans that are on the books that have already been approved. What are, the, what are those gonna do through the water resources? And then also, I mean, Ramon's gonna talk more about this and Ed's mentioned it some that there's an issue with a lot of the domestic well um, areas with the nitrate. And so one of the thoughts is, is would it be beneficial to convert some of those domestic well systems to municipal supply? Would that help improve the groundwater conditions in those areas? Uh, and so we can run those types of scenarios uh, in, in the model as well. And then Ed talked some about the potential changes in runoff patterns of the Carson River inflow. I know there, there's a lot of concern. It's like, well, what's, you know, you, you have all this, um, these scenarios, these growth rate scenarios, but what's that look like superimposed on to what the changes in the Carson River inflow might look like in the future? And so there, those are some potential scenarios that would be considered, as well as the possibility of conservation measures being implemented in the future. And then the last set of scenarios is related to, um, because it's a model, you can set it up to, uh, to run the, and pump and use your uh, infrastructure in a way to try to optimize the water use in order and minimize the impacts to the system. Uh, we call that optimization. Uh, and, and the model will be used to, to run optimization scenarios to come up with strategies for uh, how to use the water system to the most beneficial use in the future while minimizing impacts. This slide shows the same slide earlier with the projections, but this time kind of giving us a sense of a more realistic projection where we look at 1%, 2%, and 3% uh, growth rates or various percentages in there that we just threw that in there for um, just to, to get a sense of what the growth rates look like. 
Um, and so we'd do that with municipal supply, may consider doing that with domestic supply, could de decrease domestic supply in the future if it switches over, uh, if it's to be switched over to municipal supply. And I need to make sure it's clear that that's just some domestic well users that would be switched over um, as well. And then the black lines kind of represent the range for the, for the total, for the total uh, water use. Uh, this, this slide, it, it, we'll be updating this because right now we're just showing projections from 2005. Obviously, we're going to update the water, the, the pumping through to 2020 and then base the projections from 2020 on. So, so this is just to show kind of the, to generalize the visualization of growth scenarios uh, that would be run with the models. The details of the scenarios need to be developed with the local water users uh, and the local water groups. And we have it built into the concept proposal that we developed them with Douglas County, with the planning department, uh, with the county manager's office, as well as uh, public works, as well as all the local water systems, because they have a, a great interest in uh, how the use of their supply uh, and would affect the resources in their areas. And then, Obviously, we want to also involve the Carson Water Sub Conservancy District uh, in the development of the scenarios because, uh, as Ed demonstrates, he's got a really big picture understanding of the entire system, and we need to have a, a good understanding of the scenarios and how they relate and will inform uh, the big picture in the Carson River Basin. So the timeline as proposed, this is a three and a half year study that would be starting uh, this, this spring. Uh, and then ending at the end of the uh, state fiscal year 23-24, uh, the, the model update and uh, data compilation would occur in the first year and a half, uh, and then switch over to evaluation of the scenarios uh, in the fiscal year 22-23. And, uh, and then the final publication would be at the end of uh, fiscal year 23-24. Uh, one of the things that we'd like to build into our projects is, uh, is routine updates to um, our cooperating agencies. And so we plan quarterly updates to Douglas County, to the county manager's office and, um, and, and the planning. Uh, and then we also like to do an annual update to uh, stakeholders. Uh, and the plan here would be for us to return each year if it, was, if it works out with the commissioner's schedule to do a public meeting and update on the progress of the work uh, as, as we're moving forward. So we'd plan uh, two interim updates uh, plus a final uh, update on the results of this study. And uh, this final slide uh, shows the planned distribution of the, the cost for this work. The total cost uh, was around uh, $550,000. Um, and the USGS does a cost share, and we'd be uh, picking up around $194,000 of this study. And then we'd be asking Douglas County for just under $360,000. Uh, this is spread out over a, a three and a half year period uh, with that uh, bottom line there uh, representing the, the impact to Douglas County uh, for, for each of those fiscal years. And uh, so with that, I'd be glad to uh, have any discussion or take any questions. Uh, Mr. Uh, Callender, we appreciate the presentation. Um, <laughs> somebody's pooch. Um, and uh, if we could, are there any comments from the public? And then after that, we'll get the commissioners comments or questions, if we can do it that way. Is uh, Natalie available? Natalie Wood for the record. Um, I do have one attendee that's raised their hands to make public comment on this item. Um, okay. So I'll start with Jim Slade. If anyone else would like to make public comment, please raise your hand. Jim, are you there? I am. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. sir. Okay. Um, I have uh, just a few comments on the uh, potential study that 
probably are really directed at Mr. Uh, Allender, although also to the board. Um, you know, when you go about making an estimation of future growth as it relates to the availability of water and the level of our aquifer going forward, um, you know, I think as you suggested that you, you need to show a range of scenarios, but um, I think if you're not already educated on our growth management ordinance, you need to get a primer on that because we have already now close to 2000 unused allocations that could be used at any time. And we now have over 400 yearly allocations and growing every year. So the potentially in the next five years, um, we could have 4,000 new homes built in Douglas County, an additional 10,000 people. And that would be essentially a 20% increase in our population in five years. Now I understand that that's kind of the upper end, but that's higher than any of the numbers you just showed. So you need to make sure that you understand uh, the unused allocations in our growth management ordinance in order to have perhaps a higher top end of your study. Uh, you know, it's not just 2%. The fact that the 2% has been compounding for 20 years, yet the population of Douglas County has increased very little. I mean, we'll find out sometime this year, I guess, but the estimates that are that it's only increased by a, a thousand or 2000 people in the last decade. So the fact that the allocations have been compounding at 2% and the population has not means that that number is actually higher than 2%. Um, the one estimate that I would urge you not to pay much attention to, one that we, you would hope would be the best, but which pretty much everyone agrees is totally unrealistic, is the state demographer's estimate that we will have 0.9% growth for the next 18 years or something. You know, his estimates always seem to be backward looking. I would hope that he was right. You know, I'd be happy to uh, stipulate to an additional 1800 people, which I think is what he says we're gonna have in the next uh, uh, 15, 16 years, uh, that would be fine. But uh, I don't think you should put much credence in his estimates. Um, Obviously the last 12 years have been an anomaly and, and looking forward should not be based on that. It should be based more on the huge backload of uh, approved developments that we have in the pipeline and the fact that uh, those are starting to be utilized. Um, and I would hope, I don't know where you're gonna get your information from Mr. Allender. I would hope that you would reach out to, not just to our community development department, um, for your estimates because uh, they have their own perspective. I would hope you would get uh, ideas on that from a variety of people. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jim. Do we have any more public comment? I do not have anyone else that has no day raised their hands that they would like to provide public comment. Okay, we'll go to the uh, commissioners. Do any of the commissioners have any questions or public comment? Mr. Chairman, I have a question. I just want to make sure that I'm clear in my own mind when looking at these graphs. Uh, okay, Commissioner Rice, go ahead. Dom domestic versus municipal. I'm going to assume that municipal is water that has been uh, treated and piped and that domestic would be the individual wells that are functioning in our residential section. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. That's how we understand it as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Alejander, uh, I have a couple questions. Does the... Uh, do you get a lot of data from the Carson River Conservancy 
that they provide to you that you use? Uh, yes, we would be using all the, the data that is available. Um, and I think the next uh, presenter is going to talk uh, about that concept. Um, but we, what we do is we take the data from all the available sources and then we run it through our, our shop basically to make sure it's credible data, that it was reasonably collected and that it we feel that's representative of the system because we don't want data that's not representative going into these models because that would really tend to skew things or could, could lend to poor behavior from the models. And so we, we have a process we go through to quality assure the data that we use. But we also like to be informed by whatever data that is available. So, um, so we would uh, use the data from the Carson Water Sub Conservancy, what data they have um, and that we also deem to be of sufficient quality. The reason I ask this is that there seems to be some redundancy in the information provided. Now, Mr. James just provided this information and it appeared that there was some redundancy with your data and the data he provided. And uh, the question I have is for doing this survey, and the reliability of the Carson Water Subs Conservancy Group. Uh, they're here every day, they're working on it and watching it. Um, why is your survey more valuable than what they could provide? Well, I think um, that the data that they're using is similar. Well, we use a lot of the same data and sources as the Carson Water Sub Conservancy District. Um, and a lot of the data that they show is the USGS data that we collect. We collect uh, a, a large quantity of data. We collect all the stream flow data from on the rivers and the flows. Um, we, we obtain our data from the federal wash, water master as, as they do. Um, and the water levels, we either collect the water levels um, ourselves um, or we get the same data from the, uh, the state division of water resources um, and so as well as the pumping records. And so I think uh, it, the, the redundancy appears that way because we're using the similar data sources for a lot of our stuff. The, the direction I'm heading in here is uh, we already pay federal taxes for the services provided by the USGS. And now we're being asked for 300, you know, almost 360K, just additional funds. Um, we understand that there has to be a report provided, but um, I, I have a hard time seeing why the Carson River Subconservancy uh, couldn't provide adequate information to support a report on water for the county your argument, sir. So, um, and I guess that, that question sounds like it's for, for Ed, um, and I don't know if Ed's gonna come on here, but um, I, I think what I can speak to on that is that the USGS receives appropriation from Congress to partner with local, state, and um, federal agencies uh, to evaluate water resources, but we have to have a funding partner in order to access those funds. Uh, and so for us, the funding source that we, you know, that we want to use um, requires having uh, local partners. And so that's, that's, that's our requirement. So and um, this question will be directed towards Mr. Cates. Was this presented to the township of Minden? Uh, yes, sir. Um, it was presented to all the water purveyors um, in the Carson Valley, including the town of Minden. What were their decisions? Um, I believe all the water purveyors uh, voted in support of this study. And I, I would just also add that um, I, I've done work with USGS in years past at my time with the Department of Wildlife, and this is their funding model where they partner um, on funding where they contribute some and uh, local governments or state governments uh, contribute uh, as well. Okay, thank you. Budget work is set up by Congress. And I, I are there any further? 
Are there any further questions from the commissioners before we take this to a vote? Uh, Commissioner Gardner. Uh, Commissioner Ingalls, uh, Chairman Ingalls, I see that John Sheridan also has his hand up and then James has his hand up. Uh, I would imagine that uh, Mr. Sheridan being a member of the public uh, has comments that uh, would like to come in, in the public comment area, even though uh, I think we've already had that, but maybe not. Um, but uh, I, had, I did have one specific question uh, and maybe Mr. Cates can answer this better than Mr. Allender. Um, so we have a Douglas County master plan update that's required in 2029. Uh, and this specific item on this agenda calls for the Carson Valley uh, uh, water resources of the Cal Carson Valley. Does our 2029 plan uh, that's due to the state not require the South County and the Walker River uh, watershed to be included in that study to the, to the state in 2029? Uh, for the record, Patrick Cates said, yes, sir, it's supposed to be a complete study, uh, a complete plan for the entire county. So it would have to take into account uh, South County as well as Lake Tahoe. Yet this water study is only being done on behalf of the Carson Valley watershed. Uh, so uh, that I have to... Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, sir. Well, I'm, I'm just saying here, here we're providing, here we're going to spend money to provide a water study uh, on behalf of Carson Valley, yet we have two other watershed areas that are going to have to be included. What financial provisions are we making with the GF, USGS or our own county for provision of including those two watersheds uh, in addition to the Carson Valley uh, in the future? So, um, I, I realize the importance of this. Uh, there, our planning commission has been calling for a USGS water study for some time uh, for the Carson Valley uh, to address the water availability versus the growth that we're encountering in our county. But um, I'm concerned that we're not including the other two as well in this process so that we have a comprehensive study and then we're only having to pay for this once rather than having to come back and pay for another study later on that's going to include the Walker River watershed and the Lake Tahoe watershed. Sir, I, uh, for the record, Patrick Cates, I, I think the approach, because the Carson Valley uh, is the bulk of the county, uh, it's where most of the residents live and by far has the most complex water usage that we wanted to get out early and start tackling this topic. Um, uh, we do need to look at um, uh, the Walker uh, Basin as well, although that's a much more uh, discreet area of the county. Um, and there's a lot of other different issues with different players. It seems like it's an entirely different scope of work. It is something that we do need to address in the future. But because of the complexity of the Carson Valley um, uh, area specifically, uh, we wanted to get started on this and then consider uh, the South County and the Tahoe uh, Basin uh, at a later time as a, as a different scope. So, so my follow-up question would be to uh, probably Bill Richter. I know he's on the line here and he's uh, our, our director of public works. Do we have the resources in-house to provide the additional data required to include the uh, Tahoe Basin and uh, South County and the Walker River uh, watershed when it comes time to prepare the report for the state. Do we have the resources in-house in rather than having to uh, uh, pay for an additional study to uh, supplement the, the data for the 2029 update? Uh, uh, Phil Richter, Director of Public Works for the record. Um, uh, I, would I would say that no, we do not have those resources in-house. Um, and, and do understand that as public works, I, and I think I want to make this clear, it'll, it, I'm giving a presentation later, but it, I need to make it clear that as public works, we operate a uh, water utility um, essentially in the north part of the county 
and then in some ancillary locations. I mean, we have we have three public water systems at the lake that we operate. We have uh, the public water systems down in the Jones Peak, uh, Sheridan Acres, and Sierra Country Estates. But the bulk of our operations are in the in the northern part of the county, and we represent a very small portion of of the municipal water supply for uh, for the Carson Valley itself, um, for the valley. Um, you know, and, and there's multiple water purveyors down here. So our reach really doesn't go down to the South County um, in any in any way. Topaz uh, Ranch Estates runs its own water system down there and really is the major purveyor that impacts that, uh, that watershed. So, so I think we'd have to partner with them in the future to look at their, at, at their future development and, and uh, issues down in that part of the, of the county. Okay, I guess, I guess that's part of my concerns is that uh, we're gonna pay for the uh, water study. Potentially, we're gonna pay for the water study for the Carson Valley, but uh, we need to also take a look at uh, uh, helping out uh, both the uh, Tahoe watershed or the Tahoe Basin and the South County when it comes time, uh, the entities that are involved with that so that it's not completely out of their pocket, so to speak, in regards to preparing a countywide report that has to go to the state. So thank you, Mr. Victor. I appreciate the information. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cates, you have the floor. I'm wondering if you might want to call on Ed James for any comments he may have on this. Yes, I would. If he's available. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, Ed James, Carson Water Subconservancy District. To me, Paul reference from Charles Dickens. Um, I represent the ghost of watershed past, the ghost of watershed <laughs> present, but I cannot represent the ghost for the watershed future. And that really is more the USGS role. Um, a lot of the information I've used is gathered from them. And I'm showing you, but really for projections how to go in the future, you really need that ghost of KIP to really get you going there. And that information there, I can provide a lot of information there but it really, um, as you project for the future, that's tricky, especially if it's in the future. So um, I would strongly recommend that there, you might see a lot of overlap because we're talking about what's happened, but to really give you good information for the future, I think the USGS is the only way you really can do it. We don't have the tools here at CWSD to do that. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. James. Uh, Mr. Sheridan, are you available? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I apologize. I would have liked to make public comment earlier on, on an executive board meeting for the Nevada League of Cities on residential property taxes. So my, my apologies, sir. That's okay, you have the floor. Um, I wanted to talk on um, what Ed James has stated and touch on um, Kip's presentation. I, I wanna clear it up right away that this is not a re um, report required for the county to complete SB 150. The county has all the data they need to complete the requirements of SB 150. That is the master plan they just completed. They have a USGS report with a water resources plan that identifies how much water they have in the valley, dry years <clears> and <throat> wet years. That report has identified in, the, in this hydrogeo basin where the wet water is and where the dry water is. That report went further into pumping scenarios of pumping more where wet water is and dry water. So I just wanna make it clear that if you couple that with the county code, which designates how much water is to be allocated per dwelling unit, those three are to be used in combination to complete the requirements of SB 150. So I want to make it clear to the county that they have all the data already required to complete SB 150. Now I wanna to touch on data specifically. Data, uh, I kind of knocked Dr. Navarro when he came to the Gardner Bill Rancho's GID to present. And I wanna note that I'm speaking as a member of the community of the Gardner Bill Rancho's today. But I knocked Dr. Navarro for science has become a, a pay to play. And I'm not knocking the work that the USGS does the problem that I am going to identify is they can only produce a document 
that as good as the data that is provided. I have been working for two years to try to get the county to communicate with the individual water purveyors so we could come up with a holistic plan to address the water needs of this valley and then request for a, a study. This is not what that does. This study currently is gonna provide data to support a narrative that I believe past board members to support their motives. Now, with that being said, the ranchos stands to lose the biggest because the county is in a predicament currently to supply water to the Ruinstroth area. Ed James has identified that he has said that septic tanks have increased nitrates in that area. I want to note that Ed James has neglected to say that decreasing water levels are also contributing to that. We have seen a 20 foot decrease in the Ruinstroth area. He also mentioned that we are not at our perennial yield and that our basin is in equilibrium. That is untrue. We have seen more than 20 feet in the Gardnerville ranchos and I've only been on the board for two years and I am in constant discussion with Greg and we're, we're always in, it seems a discrepancy that he says there's nothing occurring with the wells in the Gardnerville ranchos. Well, I find that to the contrary. We, we drilled a brand new well four, 75 feet deeper by the well or by the river. We were expected to get back to capacity of 700 gallons per minute. That was the capacity that was drilled in 1975. Brand new well, 75 feet deeper, and we're getting less than half the capacity. So I'm not buying something's going on within the aquifer. And that's where I want to go back to the USGS is only as good as the data they are provided. They're not going to get any of the ranchos well for data. And I can guarantee that they're going to get data that supports a narrative that's driven by the motives of a previous board. Again, I also want to mention the data that Ed James states. That's a really big discrepancy going on in the North Valleys. He claims that our river in the North Valleys is a gaining stream in terms of groundwater storage is pouring into the river. Well, we're seeing at the confluence of the East and West Fork gauges in between there to the Carson City gauge, a loss of a significant loss of stream flow. He counters that with he suspects that he thinks less senior surface water right users are taking that water. I, I tend to disagree with that knowing that coming from the headwaters year after year, since the data he's collected, we have less and less water coming down from the headwaters. So I find it hard that less senior water right users are using that surface water. And if they were using it as surface water, we would be getting recharge from the secondary recharge. I honestly suspect, suspect that we've hit a problem in that area of over pumping the groundwater as well. And now that has now become a losing stream in that area. So again, we're only as good as the data that's provided. And I don't think we're there yet to go forward with the USGS. Um, we need a plan with all the purveyors involved. And, it's just, and when I say that, we have a master plan document that identifies receiving area. The Gardnerville Ranchos is not an advisory body of the county. We are the water utility. We provide water rates at one third of the rate of the county. We have been excellent stewards to our residents in the county. It has been identified we don't have the wet water, but it also has been forced upon us that we have a large receiving area and we have no say. So again, I think there has been, it's been a point to go forward with this study without actually getting all the water purveyors on board of what kind of study is actually needed. And that's just around groundwater management. I, I do wanna to touch on, because I got to get back to this other meeting, co uh, commissioners. But um, Dr. Navarro is also going to touch on the arsenic study. The arsenic study doesn't go far enough because all it's going to identify is static groundwater levels and concentrations. It's already been identified that the harder we pump groundwater wells, 
the increase in carcinic, arsenic is increasing. There's nothing identified in that study as we're going to look at pumping the wells and the arsenic concentrations as a result of. And I want to also specify, it's not, a, it's not a, about arsenic moving into that zone. I wanna end with Carson City has built a pipeline down here because of the astronomical cost to treat arsenic. Water has become a commodity. And so they have come to where they do not have to treat the arsenic, it was much cheaper. And if we have to get to that point, then it's gonna, it's gonna be an astronomical, the quality standard of life and the quality of life for our current residents is gonna go down. The cost of water is gonna go up. The increase on rationing is gonna go up. And I'm gonna end with the solution to pollution is dilution. And we don't want to over pump our groundwater aquifer. Ed James put up a number on that chart. I've identified about 10 to 12,000 acre feet of groundwater we can use to build rooftops more. Ed James, Ed James chart shows we have about 20,000 remaining municipal rights and 40,000 irrigation rights. So that's 60,000. So we have to bridge that gap of about 10 to 12,000 to 60,000 acre feet. And that's where the planning needs to revolve around. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Cates and everything. I appreciate it, commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Sheridan. Any other further comments or questions? Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ritchie, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman. Doug Ritchie with the District Attorney's Office. Just to clarify, uh, the Senate bill was enacted into NRS 278.0228. 1B requires an analysis of existing demand for water in the community and expected demand for water in the community caused by projected growth, as well as analysis of water quality. Um, it appears there is some disagreement about both the quantity and quality of the water. Therefore, there, there doesn't appear to be, um, Mr. Sheridan appears to be incorrect that the, there is existing data and that we don't need this study. Because, um, as he pointed out, um, there's issues regarding arsenic levels. Uh, he disagrees with the study. He appears to disagree with GRID's manager and its previous board, as well as perhaps some of the conclusions of the USGS and Ed James. Um, the, the law requires that an analysis be done regarding existing demand and quality. It appears there's a disagreement as to on both of those issues. Therefore, NRS does require that some sort of study, some sort of analysis be conducted to develop a water resource plan. Now, how, who does that and how that's up to the board? Well, Mr. Ritchie, in, in conjunction with what you're talking about, uh, there was some disagreement between Mr. Slade and projections for population uh, that were pretty far apart. And so we have a lot of conflicting information and I've, I've heard this before. Um, when does this study have to be done? By 2029? Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gates, yes. For the record, Patrick Gates. The, the, the final plan has, the deadline is 2029. Uh, which is why I think this is important to move forward. This is approximately a four-year scope of work. Um, Mr. Sheridan's comments that we have all the information we need currently, I don't think is accurate. The study that this would update was done in 2012, nine years ago. And, and as was pointed out in the presentation, it has inaccurate assumptions about just what has happened in the last nine years. Um, if we were to base... Um, our analysis on that 2012 study, by the time we did the report, it would be on 17 year old data. Um, that's not, um, I, I disagree with Mr. Sheridan. He's got a lot of good ideas on water. He's a very smart man, but we really do need this study. And as far as the collaboration with the uh, GIDs and the other water purveyors, we've done exactly that with this study. We went through the scope of work and revised it with input from staff. And then we went to all of the uh, GIDs and sought their input, and they all took it to their board. We had a big meeting with all the managers and made sure everybody was comfortable with the scope of work, and that made sense to them. 
And I see this as the start of that collabor collaboration as part of doing the study, not, not the end. Uh, we start with this study, we're going to collaborate with them on the scenarios that are built into the study, um, and, uh, and we're going to work with them in order to prepare this plan. And uh, we're very committed to that. And all of those uh, boards, all of the water purveyors voted to support this plan as drafted. Okay, I appreciate your comments, Mr. Cates, but also, uh, yes, Commissioner Rice. Yes, sir. I think that the uh, comments from Mr. Sheridan and Mr. Slade demonstrate the need for this, uh, for this evaluation. Um, they are people on both sides of the argument. Uh, we have too much. We don't have too much. We're going to do too much of this. We're not going to do enough of that. And I think that uh, this survey... Uh, through the USGS will answer those questions and maybe put this issue to rest. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, um, it looks like Commissioner Noasat has come. Um, Commissioner Noasat? Yeah. No. Uh, yes. Um, let me see if I get this straight. We're going to run a study for three, four years collect all that data, and then we're going to make projections into the future based on those studies. Is that correct? Anybody? Uh, sorry, I, I'm unmuted now. Um, this, this study isn't to collect the data. It's to use the data that exists to inform the Carson Valley model, which is the tool that represents the system that you can use to forecast to projections, but you want to make sure that the model is performing okay, and that's what the, we use to we simulate the conditions and compare to the data that uh, exists. And the closer you get to representing the way the conditions exist, the more confidence you have in the model. And once you have the confidence, you can use the model to project in the future based on your management scenarios which wells you're gonna pump, how much you're gonna pump them, et cetera. So, so that's, uh, that's really the, the, the basis of this proposal. And a caution, a caution used in the market comes to mind. Past performance is no guarantee of future gain. So if you're gonna go, you're gonna use the data, let's say the data that we have now is gathered in uh, 2018. So you're gonna work on a scenario to predict the future based on that data. What I'm saying is, you know, weather forecasters do the very same thing. So this looks like it's, to me, it's kind of risky. It's a lot of money spent for, you know, if you're going to be, put management decisions based on old data, I, you're in trouble. And that's all I have to say. I appreciate that comment, sir. And I, I appreciate your understanding because it's not incorrect. It's true that there is risk associated with making projections using these models. It isn't unlike weather forecasting uh, that you're, you're making projections based on what you know th that you've developed these tools with, but there is some sort of uncertainty associated with those projections. Part of what we do and what I don't talk about, but part of what we do in our evaluations is also project what the uncertainty is. If we project out a couple days, like we do in weather, we have good confidence. And then we pro project out a little bit further, we have a little bit reduced confidence. And then there's some period in time in the future where we start to have decreased confidence. And, okay. it, and it works a lot like weather models do, and that applies to uh, groundwater forecasting. But what, uh, you know, and, and I appreciate that. I think, you know, your, your comment that, well, we can collect more data and then update the model in the future based on that data and it'll make it better. And I'd say that's probably true too. The more data you have, the better your models, the better your projections. But it, it's always a trade-off. At what point are you over collecting the data? Uh, and at what point do you stop and then you make your projections? And so that is, those are really valid concerns and considerations uh, for, for the county to make. Okay. Uh, one other thing. Uh, one of the things that I did in my past was uh, software quality assurance. Uh, the words might, could, maybe, but don't work there. You have to have finite things. Now, the, the, the use through which we're gonna put this model is gonna be determined on how many houses we're gonna allow to be built. What can, and, and water 
So there's nothing, there is nothing more important than water. You go two weeks without food and die, or you can go three days without water and die. So that's how important it is. And if we're getting contaminated with the blooms and we're getting um, arsenic because we go deeper, we have some very important decisions to be made on future growth. Any further comments? I've got I have a couple. Uh, Mr. One of the things Mr. That, Chair. Uh, yeah, Mr. Gardner, Commissioner Gardner, go ahead. Well, I think uh, I think Commissioner Tarkanian had his hand up before oh, me. I'm sorry. Uh, did it did that come down, Danny, or or are you still interested in commenting? Oh, I can comment, but I could do it after you. I mean, it's really just gonna be a question. <laughs> Maybe you enlighten me. Um, um Okay, so uh, the, the question I have, we, th this, uh, um, our, my concern is uh, the, we've been in a drought for a number of years now and, and there's no projections of us coming out of a drought. Um, and so my chief concern here is our annual recharge rate. And are we, are we approaching the level that we're going to start uh, approaching our annual recharge rate or even possibly uh, exceed our annual recharge rate, which is which is extremely important, and uh, to me that has a significant impact on how much growth that we can allow to uh, to al allow in this county. We already have around 6,600 homes, uh, around in round numbers that are already on the books, and uh, thank God we have the growth management ordinance in place, it's gonna control that growth. But I'm very interested in knowing exactly uh, the time frame on how fast that we can allow that to happen without exceeding our annual recharge rate, which is extremely important to me. That I, I think is one of the hugest issues of this, of this uh, concept. So uh, now you, you indicated Mr. Alander that uh, uh, we are going to take into impact on this study the also the rate of growth and how that's going to impact our water supply. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. That's the overall goal is to understand the rate of growth or a range in growth rates, what those impacts would be on the water supply and what, you know, what, how much that decreases the water levels and how much that increases the losses from the river. And I think one of the things I wanna do is address the conception about the annual recharge. And, and there's a misconception that annual recharge is some fixed quantity. That's how the state manages groundwater systems, but that's not how they work. Their annual recharge is a very variable, it's a variable process. It changes from year to year. And it, especially in valleys that have, are connected with river systems because much of the recharge actually comes from the river. And so the management of the actual water systems affects the recharge and the recharge rate. The, the more you pump, the closer to the river, the greater the, the loss from the river, that's recharged to the aquifer system. And so that's why the, these, we have these tools, the numerical models to represent the systems is to be able to handle those really complex interactions and to be able to understand how, how, that, how, those, um, how management is gonna affect the recharge. But, um, but, but speaking to your also the, that there is some um, quantity that's um, seen as a fixed annual average. And, and that's also uh, part of the consideration too. I have three questions. <laughs> Can um, I get one in? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Allender, the Carson River flows from south to north because of gravity, is that correct? Correct. Okay. The water in the permeable in our aquifers is in permeable rock. It's not sloshing around in there like a big bathtub. Correct. Correct. Permeable sediments. Right. Awesome. Yep. That water in the permeable rock is being tugged at by gravity, just as the Carson River. Is that correct? That's correct. Hence, it would be tugged at and being pulled to the lowest point in the Carson Valley, which would be Minden area. 
uh, for the east and west forks, it would be the Minden area, but then beyond there, it would be down to the um, confluence and towards Carson City. Well, okay, but from the south end, it's being tugged at down to that direction. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the aquifer water. Mm -hmm. So any, any aquifer water in the Pine Nut region, Ruinthrop and Fish Springs out here in the ranchos, et cetera, is being tugged at and being pulled towards Minden. And I've always been of the persuasion that the water, uh, 1 million gallons a day that is being sent to Carson, what is replenishing that aquifer? And I'm of the persuasion it's being done at the expense of the aquifers in the valley on the periphery. What say you? It depends on where the wells are pumping uh, because the source of water to wells is from three sources. It's from, the, from, stream, from stream flow, from depleting the river. It's from the storage in the aquifer or lowering the water table as well as by intercepting uh, evapotranspiration, which is the natural discharge through uh, like grasses and, uh, and shrubs and stuff like that. And so it, uh, it all depends on where that water is being pumped at that's going to Carson City. If it's right along the river, I would say there's a big portion that would be coming from the depletion of the stream flow. Of okay, the river. so last, last season, I don't even think there was a million gallons a day flowing through the Carson River down there in that region. And so, albeit slowly, that water that's being pumped out of Minden has to be, that aquifer, it has to be recharged from somewhere. And it's an excessive amount. It has to be recharged from somewhere or the water levels will continue to decline. That, okay. That's true. Right. And if the water levels aren't declining, then it's, there's a good chance there's a lot of recharge coming from the river itself, depleting the flow of the river. Well, if there's not a, if there's not a million gallons a day flowing through that river, how can that be? Uh, it, it's stretched out over a long period of time. So it wouldn't be just from that season, it'd be from future seasons because there's a, there's a long lag between pumping and when the depletion takes place. And the longer you go, the longer that lag or the longer that impact will, will occur. Okay. So it's stretched over time. Well, that's just an item for discussion. Um, Mr. James in his presentation talked about balance. And basically what he said is you're going to have to make a decision about balance between domestic consumption or municipal consumption and open agriculture. You remember that? And environment, yes. Okay. And in conjunction with what Mr. Gardner said and asked about having a comprehensive study done to include water at the lake and the Walker River Basin, um, I'm of the persuasion we should do the whole thing all at one time rather than do this now and we do that later. We get a full comprehensive study on the entire basin and the county rather than do it piecemeal. So I'm of the persuasion at this juncture to say no or vote no and to have this item brought back and you, Mr. Uh, Allender, give us a quote on what the USGS would charge to do the entire county up at the lake and the Walker River Basin. Can you do that? Oh, we could do that for sure, but I will, um, would you, I do wanna make sure you're aware that when we do evaluations, hydrologic studies, we do it by hydrographic basins and areas. And so it would still be three different components. It would be three different studies because we have to look at a system, at things system-wide because that's where the complex interactions occur. Uh, so in the C Carson Valley, anything you do anywhere in the Carson Valley affects the water system throughout the Carson Valley, but it doesn't affect the water system necessarily in Tahoe or over in the Walker River Basin. And so we'd want to look at those each individually, but we could have it all bound up as three yeah, separate studies I in one. That. one by, but by law, Mr. Ritchie, 
we have to have a comprehensive study done. Is that correct? Yes, Doug Ritchie with the district attorney's office. That's correct. We have to have a comprehensive, well, you have to have a comprehensive analysis of the word the statute uses. Okay. So no matter what we do from the state, from the county standpoint, we're gonna to have to have this information and to provide it by the study by law. So can you come back and if you have to do it in three sections or whatever, uh, Commissioner Gardner? Commissioner Ingalls, I, I would be comfortable with delaying the, the, uh, the uh, study for the uh, Walker River and for the Tahoe Basin uh, to come because those are going to be separate studies. I would, I would be comfortable with waiting. Uh, we have six years here or longer, actually, uh, to put together the whole study. So uh, I think that we need to give this tool to our planning commission to use to understand exactly what we can do in regards to or what our limitations are in, in growth in this in the Carson Valley where all of our growth is actually occurring. All 6,600 homes that are currently on the books are being proposed in that area. And so we need to know what available water resources we have for those, for those developments. Uh, and that's our primary concern, I think right now. And I think we need to give this tool to our planning commission to, to have available at, in very short order as possible so that they can, they can have that information going forward. Uh, I know that, uh, uh, so that's what I'll say, uh, but I did uh, see Danny, uh, Mr. Tarkanian's hand up a couple of times. So <laughs> I, I don't want to uh, not have him uh, comment as well. So, so Mr. Mr. Tar Commissioner Tarkanian. Mine's have? very short, short and simple. I was trying to figure out what the alternative you guys were suggesting. We've been going on this for almost an hour and it's, we need to have the water study done. So I think you expressed uh, your, your positions, Mr. Chairman, of what the alternative is. I think um, the votes are probably there and I think we probably should, uh, I, so I don't have anything else to say. You answered my question. All right, thank you. Is anybody prepared to bring a motion forward? Commissioner Gardner. I, I will. I will move that we approve the, a conceptual proposal to evaluate effects of groundwater management options on the water resources in the Carson Valley submitted by the US Geological Survey, USGS, Nevada Water Science Center and authorize the county manager to enter into an agreement for services with USGS in a format acceptable to legal counsel for an amount not to exceed $359,500 for Douglas County's contribution the same through the fiscal year 2023 as broken down in the financial impact of uh, by year as illustrated in our package. I'll second. All right, we have a motion uh, and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is carried. Thank you. Now we'll move on to item number three for possible action. Discussion to, appro to approve a proposed proposal to evaluate the status of water level arsenic and nitrates in the Douglas County alluvial aquifer and to develop an interactive web-based tool for visualization of hydrological data submitted by the USGS Nevada Water Science Center at the request of the county manager and authorize the county manager to enter into an agreement in the format acceptable to legal counsel for services with the USGS for an amount not to exceed $113,425 for Douglas County's contribution to the same through fiscal 2023-2024. Mr. Narano, you have the floor. Thank you. I'm going to uh, go ahead and share my screen. Uh, chime in, I cannot see your faces because I'm gonna minimize the 
the window here, if you guys can hear me okay. Yes. For the record, my name is Ramon Ranjo. I'm a research hydrolo hydrologist with the uh, Nevada Water Science Center, the USGS. And the, the topic that I'll be discussing today is with regards to a uh, proposed investigation uh, that has come about over the last, uh, I would say three, four years, there's been an, an, a renewed interest in <clears throat> water levels um, in nitrates and arsenics in, in the Douglas County area. And the impetus of, for this uh, development of the web-based tool is to actually provide a portal uh, that is online, that provides information on uh, water levels, on nitrate and arsenic as it's being collected in, in a format that people can use and, and further bringing in uh, other agency data so that all the information can be uh, provided in, in one location. So the overall objectives of this study is to analyze the seasonal and annual trends of water level, much of which comes from the USGS as uh, was, was documented earlier. We do um, have a number of wells that are monitored for water level and for, for uh, nitrates and arsenic. Very few level uh, concept wells for arsenic, but we have other agency data that we will be including in this analysis. Um, in addition to water levels that are being collected by the state uh, division of water resources and that that data is provided in their own portal but we were working to try to bring that information into one site so that it's available in one location for everybody to use um, so the purpose of that web application is, will be to allow managers and the public to get access to near real-time information on the status and trends of water levels and, and nitrate and stream flows as well uh, for the entire basin, which I'll be showing a couple of examples where we've done similar web-based tools for the uh, Tahoe Basin, as well as the, the, the Walker Basin. Um, so the, the, the work is divided into a number of tasks. The first one is just looking at what we have in terms of water levels on record have been approved by the USGS in terms of um, their QAQC process, as well as looking at other agency data gather up all that information and, and look at it in terms of is, you know what are the status of the existing concentrations in water levels and what are their, what, how they've been changing over time. The nitrate data has been evaluated. Um, I published a study through the USGS in 2013 where we evaluated nitrates throughout the basin and I'll be discussing the details of that study here and, and why we're at the you know, at this point in this juncture, that why we actually need it to, to revise our our, uh, our understanding of what is happening. Um, the second thing is to look at the existing well network, and this involves looking at the data from what the USGS collects, as well as the uh, Division of Water Resources for water levels, and look at whether there's information gaps, whether there's not enough data being collected on a regular basis in areas that are either sensitive to stream flows or areas that are further away that are still of interest that are in decline. Um, and then the third task is to develop this tool which is going to integrate all this information into a website so that again, people can look at what is the status of certain areas. And I think with having all the information available to all the agencies and the public and the purveyors, will help them further understand processes like how um, stream flows are being impacted by, um, by pumping or how water levels are being impacted by stream flow conditions as well. Like we have uh, significant water years like 2017 or, or even 2019. And third, the documentation, which will involve uh, a report by the USGS of the, of, the, of the existing trends of the data up to, to this point. The purpose for the hydro mapper is basically to kind of eliminate the need or the, the necessary um, reevaluation of data that happens every five years or every 10 years as necessary because the information will always, always be updated and available for people to evaluate. Whether you need interpretation from folks to look at what the overall trends are related to you know, processes such as pumping 
Um, that can be determined at a later date, but at least having all the information available in terms of the status and trends on the mapper will, will be an important aspect of this work. So as background, we know that the Carson Valley receives most of its water from the, head, the upper land um, through snow accumulation, snow melt and runoff through the Carson River. Um, water quality in the basin in the, in the Carson Valley is impacted by naturally occurring arsenic and nitrates that are derived from primarily septic tanks. And we, we, we did this study again, like I mentioned in 2013, where we looked at different sources, uh, potential sources of nitrate to the aquifer. And that study concluded that the majority of the nitrates were derived from septic tanks. Some of the uh, secondary impacts to the water quality is that excessive amounts of nutrients derived from septic tanks uh, and from fertilizers from irrigated fields does have an impact on water quality of the Carson River. And there was a follow-up study that was looking at what are the contributions of excess nutrients on algal blooms that happened in the Carson. And then um, there was another study that was recent on arsenic that Angie Paul and myself and Toby completed a data release where we looked at all the available arsenic data in the valley to try to get a better understanding for what are the information gaps are and what the concentrations are. And again, the, the, the important aspect of this thing is, is this, of this work is that arsenic and nitrate concentrations are up at or above um, the EPA drinking water level of 10 milligrams uh, per liter or 10 parts per billion uh, of, of arsenic. And again, there is a human risk component to this work. And I'm gonna be demonstrating some of the, what we're finding in terms of the impacts of water level declines caused by the pumping of the aquifer and what kind of implement, implications that has on water quality. So what do we know about nitrate in the valley was the last uh, comprehensive study that was taking place was again reported in 2013, but the data for that study uh, was completed in 2010. So it's, it's been quite a long time since data uh, has been gathered in a number of wells throughout the basin. And this map here shows the observations from that study and in color showing the concentrations less less than one is highlighted in blue, um, five to 10 is highlighted in yellow. Uh, concentrations greater or at the MCL is shown there in, in red. And so there are a number of wells that are um, in, within the development areas at Johnson Lane and Ruinstroth that are above that 10 milligrams per liter, but there are other wells close, near, close by that you know, do not have uh, concentrations that exceed the, the MCL. And that has to do with the fact, as mentioned earlier, that um, the transport through a, a leach field, a septic tank system, it takes a while for that water or the, the leach, the, the effluent water to reach the water table. And the, the areas that have the most density, the number of houses per unit area of land have, were found to have the highest significant concentrations in the aquifer. And the other um, component of that was um, whether or not there was domestic or agricultural wells nearby that was actually pumping the high uh, nitrate concentrations out of the aquifer. And uh, we found that, you know, in terms of what the contributions of agriculture was of nitrates to the aquifer is that where you had a greater area of agricultural land, your concentrations were much lower where you had more septic systems, the concentrations were much higher and that's because of that density function. The higher number of uh, septic systems in place, the more loading happens to the aquifer. So in this study that we completed in 2013, we took the previous model that was discussed earlier, the Jaeger model, the last model that was used for planning purposes and we used it for transport, how much water uh, is flowing through the system was simulated by that model. And all we're doing here is looking at scenarios by which uh, the system is being impacted by nitrates. And so the idea here is that we wanted to look at what the current status of the simulated 
um, nitrate conditions are for these two um, populated areas, Johnson Lane and Ruinstraub. And we wanted to look at what would happen under different scenarios. And that this would be like what Kip was mentioning earlier that you have conditions that you're gonna predict out into the future. And then you wanna look at conditions for which you make a decision and the decisions that were made were what happens if you remove septics? What happens if you, if you take everyone off septics and leave everyone pumping their domestic wells? Or if you take them off septics and domestic wells? And the idea is that you may not be 100% accurate on your predictions as to what might happen, but you're looking at the relative differences between those scenarios, which are important for making those kinds of decisions you're, you're gonna be making into the future. So the two areas that we're looking at were Johnson Lane and Ruinstroff. Johnson Lane was a bigger area, 62 square miles. The septic density was much lower than the Ruinstroff area. You can see the 23 septics per square mile, whereas smaller area Ruinstroff, 14 square miles, had roughly 500 septic tanks, about 36 septics per square mile, and about 500 wells. Johnson Lane has a much higher number of wells, but it also included some areas that were agriculture. So much larger area and, and much more wells as well. So here's an example of what was documented in the report. And this scenario is for Johnson Lane at the a simulated prediction of at 2059. And so the baseline condition shows what the concentrations would do under, under flow conditions that were predicted to, to occur for 2059. And you can see where the concentrations in nitrate accumulate there to the north, just to the right of this um, fault that was included in the model. And so as water is being impacted, groundwater is being impacted in the urban areas, its transport is limited by the shallow water table conditions here and the, and the river flows along this boundary here. The shallow conditions here as well as this fault, which acts as an impediment to nitrate conditions. So this area, um, the model was simulating that it was accumulated in this, in this area, but many of the resi residential homes were uh, still receiving high concentrations and concentrations in that five to 10 range, meaning that even after some time, you're, you're gonna have some, some impacts, but they may not be as high as the, the, the um, concentrations exceeding 10. Those homes that are of older have been primarily loading the aquifer longer. So in this study, we looked at what happens under baseline conditions. How does that compare to removing septics? And you can continue to pump the aquifer. And again, um, the domestic homes being lar in large responsible for the reductions in the concentrations, meaning that the, the domestic users are actually um, removing the nitrate through, through, use, through use. The third scenario there on the right is what happens when you remove septics and uh, we septics are removed and you have no domestic pumping. And the idea here is that you're no longer sourcing the aquifer of, of nitrates and what is being transported uh, solely is what is naturally moving the, the material out of the system under, under less pumping gradient. So you're not, you're not actually pumping it out from domestic homes. So you still receive uh, an area that is elevated in concentration to the north, but they're you know the concentrations that are um, that remain are those that are that are not being pumped out through domestic pumping. It just re remains in the aquifer. So an important aspect of this work, again, we may, we may not know um, into the future, but we're using these tools with the understanding that they're you know they're they're not perfect. We're looking at changes uh, to the system as a response to management decisions that we're making. And here are the, the future of what we're, we're talking about. 2010 shown here is where we um, ended our projected in terms of what was current conditions. And we're, we were predicting at that time what those conditions would look like into the future. And so in, in uh, under the base case with just the predictive models, we see that the concentrations continue to go up above the MCL in this location in, in Ruinstraw and in Douglas County, in, I'm sorry, in Johnson Lane. Uh, under the condition for which you remove the septics, you can see the concentrations are decline 
um, much faster than they do if you leave the, the septics and no wells, uh, primarily because you still are using domestic users to, to pump the, the nitrate out of the system. But the, again, the way the models are, were intended to look at is just how, um, what was the simulated projection for, for no action and what would happen under these different scenarios. Um, what the models are suggesting though, from 2010 into 2059 was that the concentrations were gonna continue to increase. Okay, so let's just think about that. we look at the concentrations that we have observed since 2010. And you can see that for, some, for the areas around Johnson Lane, we have concentrations that are continuing to increase since our study ended in 2010. And there's a few wells there that are uh, approaching either exceeded the MCL um, in Johnson Lane and this other well that is uh, creeping up closer to the MCL. There were a number of wells um, that have, were, that were data was being collected that were deepened by the homeowner. And I'll get into this issue on well deepening a little later in this presentation, but in general, um, the USGS collects 11 wells for work monitoring nitrates. And of those 11 wells, this is just an example of, of four. Of those 11 wells, there's eight that are increasing. So what do we know about arsenic? Arsenic, um, as was mentioned earlier by Ed James, um, persists in the aquifer to the east of the Carson River at higher concentrations than you have around the river. And that is because there's a, um, the aquifer um, arsenic concentrations depends on the, the sedimentary material that it's in. And in many cases, arsenic is associated with um, clay material, fi fine clays. And, and uh, so in, this, in, the, in the data that we have, this is a depiction of the data that we have since 1970 to now. It shows up as a lot of data, but really, what's being collected for the Carson Valley in terms of arsenic is very limited. Um, there has been a couple of studies that, as I mentioned earlier, that, that were um, looking at more recent data, but we've only been collecting five or six wells uh, in this area. So we have very limited recent data, but what the data is suggesting that we have currently is that the concentrations are higher up to the east and lower near the river. Um, one other thing that we found by looking at this information is that the concentrations are higher the deeper you go into the aquifer. And, and shown here in yellow are some of the more recent data along with the data that, that was collected um, or gathered from, from different agencies. So deeper you get in, in terms of the aquifer, the higher the concentrations. What is known about water levels in the basin or at least in Carson Valley is that we, we've seen some as mentioned earlier, we have some pretty substantial declines to the east from near the pine nuts uh, of about 25 to 28 feet, um, a steady decline of about a foot per year in water levels. But closer to the river, you can see that the river fluctuates about a foot to two foot variation. It's declined about two feet, but the river acts as a source of water to the wells closer to the river. So going back to how this integrates with the purpose for needing this kind of integrated model to assess how, how deepening, uh, I'm sorry, how water quality is affected by changes in pumping. And, and uh, in this case, we looked at a number of different factors. One, one being um, where in the aquifer is nitrate associated with. And this plot on the left shows that nitrate concentrations are higher near the surface, near, near the water table surface. And again, I just illustrated that uh, arsenic is higher concentrations at depth. If you uh, in, evaluate the state engineer's database, there's 288 wells in this area that have been deepened um, since 1982. And this gra the, 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 the graphic here on the right in, in pink shows where those locations are. So homeowners, and it, it looks like there's a cluster of where the homeowners are actually deepening their wells. Um, it looks pretty closely related to where the impacts of nitrates are associated with. We don't know the, 
the real reason why they're deepening their wells, aside from it could be water quality or it could be water level declines that are causing them to deepen their wells. But one thing is for sure is that the folks that are actually deepening their wells as illustrated by these two figures down, down here is that uh, the well, the depth of the screen of those wells that are being deepened are in that 200 to 300 foot um, below the land surface range. And when you look at where that is situated from where, where primarily um, people are actually getting their source water from, they may be uh, avoiding the, the higher concentrations of nitrate, but when you start deepening into the aquifer system, based on the data that we do know, you're getting further into this arsenic laden water, which may be problematic. So what is needed? We, we kind of need to know what information we have uh, in terms of water level data. And we, we're going to compile information that we have from, from a variety of sources. But we also need to look at what information is actually needed for water managers to, to better understand the impacts of pumping or the impacts of drought or the impacts of, of more urbanization or septic tanks. And so the idea is here is that we want to look at it from from all those different standpoints is that where is the information gaps that we have for the system? And then make uh, recommendations for where, what information, what, where if, if information is needed, where more information is needed. And what the things that we need to look at is like well depth and well location, because it's important to understand the implications of where nitrates and arsenic may be showing up at, that, at those observations. Moving on to the intent of bringing all this information into an online tool is that um, the Water Science Center, uh, the USGS Water Science Center uh, here in Carson has done a spectacular job of putting two examples up already that water managers are using to track water resources within their basin. The one shown here on the left is the water, um, the Walker Basin Hydromapper which shows all the inputs, which are stream flows highlighted here and the reservoir storage in, in terms of the capacity or of, of percentage of storage. And uh, so each one of these items here is clickable. You can click on the observations and look at it from a time series perspective or get more information from the reservoir storage in terms of time, where all the information is integrated into one location. In terms of the hydro mapper for Lake Tahoe, this one was intended to a different purpose. This is primarily to look at water quality of streams that the USGS collects data for and, and on its impacts to Lake Clarity. But the, 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 the purpose is similar in that they, we're pulling from the similar sources of information, the Nath National Weather Service, which tracks snow water equivalent and precipitation in the basin. And all these uh, different data sets are integrated into one location so that you don't have to seek out information from like the National Weather Service or the NRCS to look at snow accumulation or, or even going out reaching out to uh, Nevada Division of Water Resources to look at where they're collecting data because the, none of these are integrated data sets. You have to know where, they're, where, where to look and then it's time consuming for public and for water purveyors and, and, and scientists to even get access to this information. Many people don't even know where to get access to the information. So having it all in one location will be of benefit to people because it'll all be there and they can investigate it further and look at um, and further uh, get understanding of the processes and knowledge of the, of the conditions of the basin. So what we intend to do is integrate all the information that we can get from National Weather Service, the NRCS, Snowtel uh, sites. That what's great about the, the National the National Weather Service and NRCS is that they've been collecting data since the 80s for many sites up in the mountains for snow water equivalent, and they also put together real time snow cover area and snow water equivalent maps that you can use uh, to to kind of inform where is the existing uh, snow line, for example, within the Carson Basin that will be handy for, for kind of getting an understanding of how much water is being stored up in the mountains. Um, the USGS collects stream flow data 
had a number of observations on the Carson. Many of those locations stem back or oldest records in Nevada um, on the Carson. In addition to, we have some data that's been recently collected from the Nevada Division of Water Resources. And so if we can bring all that information, which are shown there in purple, those are the wells from the Nevada Division of Water Resources in, in addition to the water quality wells that we collect nitrate and arsenic uh, concentrations. We need to integrate those all into one portal so that everyone can get access to that information. So what we intend to do in terms of documentation is that we need to provide something that the public can understand where, what the current status of nitrate and arsenic levels are in the, in the Douglas County area. We're gonna publish that in a USGS scientific investigations report. The near real time data on the climate, the stream flow, the water levels will all be made available to, on the mapper, on the hydro mapper. It doesn't require an actual report to, 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 to put that out there, but we would like to put out a press release or a fact sheet as a means to just inform the public and the purveyors that this information is available and to show people on how to, how to get access to the information because there's, there's a lot of information out there and, uh, and we wanna make sure that people understand um, how to navigate the site. So the, the study is uh, over a three year period. Um, this is the breakdown of what it's gonna cost for each one of the tasks and what the documentation, uh, so, so fees associated with reporting the results. Um, we are requesting 113,000 from Douglas County. We are gonna be contributing 35%, 61,000 for a project total of 175,000 roughly. And uh, we wish to get started uh, March to, to June, uh, 2023. And with that, I can take any of your questions. Are there any questions from the comments from the commissioners? I'm not gonna open this to public comment. Uh, we've, it's going to take too much time, and this isn't that. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Yes. Chair, I think you announced at the beginning of the meeting we were going to allow public comment on this. Right. I don't know that there is any, but uh, I'm concerned that we alerted the public that we were going to, and if we don't, then you're correct. I beg. To <laughs> I'm sorry to <laughs> give you bad news. <laughs> Natalie, you're up. Uh, Natalie Wood, for the record, I do have two um, that have noted they would like to provide public comments. I will start with Jim Slade. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. I promise this will take well under three minutes of your <laughs> valuable time. <laughs> Jim Slade. I think that more information is almost always better than less information, especially when it comes to our most valuable resource, water, and how it might be affected by future growth. Um, as an aside, I just finished reading a book called The Fifth Risk, which is about uh, uh, the federal bureaucracy, which sounds incredibly boring, but it's really a, a celebration of the work of a lot of our federal employees who are often berated and, 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 and ridiculed, but it praises their intellectual curiosity, dedication, foresight, and sense of mission that he finds among American federal workers. So um, I appreciate the scientists and the work that they do. The data used in the current reports uh, on both agenda items two and three address is quite old. Uh, research technology and the knowledge about both of these items have increased substantially since the last studies. I agree with the board's decision to approve the proposal in item number two in the Carson River Basin, where about 80% of the county's population lives and where nearly all of the future growth uh, is expected. And I would urge you to approve item number three as well. Thank you. Natalie, any further comments? I have one more. I have Virginia Starrett. 
Virginia, are you there? Okay. Uh, um, Natalie, let's oh, there it is. There it is. Oh, there it is it. Finally. Yeah, okay. Did you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> I want to apologize. I have been trying to connect to the meeting because I am on the. Uh, you're muted. You're muted. Okay, so I anyway, I, I see now I'm working with two different devices and I'm coordinating how to get to the meeting and actually participate. So I have nothing to say on this item. I'm just waiting for my turn on the next agenda and, and, and I apologize. So it's a first. Now we'll open it up for the commissioners. You have any questions, comments, Commissioner Gardner? Your hands up. No. Yeah, uh, I see Mr. Noah Sat's hand up after mine. Uh, to me, uh, this is more important even than the first issue, uh, item number two. Uh, public safety is at direct risk uh, without a water quality study. Uh, we can have all the water in the world uh, as, as shown in the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean, but if you can't drink it, you can't use it. It doesn't do you much good for your quality of life. And so uh, we need to know uh, how this is going to impact the, the future uh, water supply uh, uh, because uh, if we can't mitigate these issues, uh, our, our citizens are in direct uh, trouble. Now, as I understand it, the whole one of the main purposes of the water transfer station in Menden to Carson City is because they were experiencing high concentrations of arsenic in their water and uh, they needed to blend the water and that's why they are willing to buy our water. So my, my concern is how much more, once again, how much more uh, development we're going to allow that will then uh, put our citizens at risk if we get into our arsenic levels that are well above what's necessary and are we going to have to start blending ourselves and so we may need to at some point in time down the road perhaps start restricting the amount of water we sell to Carson City uh, to, to ensure that our citizens have a sufficient amount of safe water for, for their uh, daily lives. So uh, I'm hoping this issue uh, and this uh, particular motion won't uh, take as long as the previous one. But uh, anyways, uh, I appreciate the presentation, Mr. Naranjo. And uh, once again, I think that this is a, a real priority for us. Thank you. Commissioner Noah said? Uh, yes, Mr. Naranjo. Uh, this, uh, the system is characterized as near real time. Uh, which would infer that you would be on a constant scan mode almost to keep up to date data. Mm -hmm. How up to how up to date data? Let's assume we did this today. How up to date data would that be? That's a that's a good point. Um, Streamflow data we like to call the real near well it's real time because it's collected every 15 minutes and most of that information is available on you know even on our own archaic web website. So it is made available to the public. In terms of water levels um, and, and uh, water quality parameters, we, you're exactly right. It's near real time in that the data has to be collected, it has to be processed, it has to be analyzed, and then, and then it gets approved if, the, if it meets certain criteria for, for QAQC. So that takes a little bit longer and I anticipate the data that will be available because many of these samples are collected on a quarterly basis or even monthly basis, or maybe only one time per year, um, that 
the information that will be gathered will be skimmed from various sources and put on there as, rec as recent as we have it. As new, more new information comes in, the, the website will go out and reach for that information if it's available and then post it. But the reality is um, that there, there aren't sufficient money to collect a lot of data that you need for real-time arsenic and nitrate information. Um, so what we can do is, what we need to do is decide on where, where is it that is most critical and most important. And if there's additional resources that are needed to get that kind of near real-time information, then it's, it's, it's possible that data can be provided at that near real time, you know, less than a month old data or two, two months old data. But um, in terms of water quality, it's much harder to provide that on a real time basis because the technology just doesn't exist for us to put that information out there very quickly. And it comes at a cost as well. So, um, yeah. Okay, so there is gonna be a lag time then. Right. In developing this uh, application, uh, who, I'll put it this way. Have you conferred with the people who use this as to what, how, how they would like to, what, what effect, what, let me back up. What would the, what would the application look like for the user? The user being us here at the county level. Right. The idea is that we, these are all tailor-made to agencies' needs, to the purveyors' needs. Um, what I, my hope is that I need to get input input by the water purveyors and to, by the county. Um, and we can get input by the public as well into creating these, these pages so that they, they kind of are, are, are um, easy to use, easy to access information, but they also serve a purpose. It's one thing to have a page that just has a bunch of pretty images of information, but if it doesn't put <clears> it in the context <throat> of what, you, what you're interested in, then it doesn't serve its intended purpose. So I'm hoping that I can get input from, from Ed James and, and others as to what, what better way of showing this information so that it gives you a more comprehensive look of, of the hydrology of the system. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Any further questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I have an additional comment. Commissioner Gardner. Uh, uh, I didn't want to supersede uh, Mr. Tarkanian or Mr. Rice from chiming in here. But uh, anyways, uh, it seems to me like we have three hot spots within our county, uh, the Johnson Lane area, the Ruins Roth area, and the Gardnerville Ranchos area. Uh, would that be a correct assessment, Mr. Naranjo? Well, un unfortunately, when we did the study in 2013, there was a decision that even predates that to look at Ruinstroth and Johnson Lane specifically. And so the much of the work that I was showing the model results were of those two areas, but there, there are other areas in the Valley that, that do have nitrate concerns. Um, the hope was that when, as Kip provided to you earlier, is that once this um, water budget tool is available to us that which is going to be used to make those kinds of decisions on pumping that we can use that tool to look at what those impacts will be on water quality. Okay, so what I'm, but what I'm hearing is that the Garden of Ranchos, which is the highest concentration of population area in our county, uh, they're having to go deeper into their wells. Uh, and in that process, they're picking up greater levels of arsenic. So I would hope that we specifically work with a uh, Gardnerville Ranchos uh, GID board on uh, really a, uh, taking a look at the water quality that is, that is uh, down in that area. It also possesses one of our largest receiving areas within our county where, where quote, quote, potential new growth is, is uh, uh, indicated or possibly Possible. So, anyways, once again, I I, I certainly don't want to uh, discount the Gardnerville Ranchos GID 
and their board and uh, in this study, because I think that's extremely important for them. Uh, and, and also the area over in Ruinsroth as well. Uh, so anyways, Commissioner I Gardner, we did a, that. Commissioner Gardner, we had a, a plan a development come through for Indian Hills and there is a nitrate plume moving out there so that's another area of yeah, concern. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any other questions or comments? Commissioner Tarkanian, Commissioner Rice? No, sir. I, I think that the uh, presentation was very um, comprehensive. And uh, I, uh, I think that the questions by uh, Commissioner Gardner answered any question I might have had. So thank you. Uh, Senor Norano. Eu hablo portuguesa muy parecido con español, mas tal vez es mejor nos hablamos en inglés, because we'll get everybody all confused. <laughs> what I said to him is I said I speak Portuguese, but it's yeah. like Spanish. But if we if we go there and don't talk in English, it's going to be a disaster. Anyway, I, I appreciate your the fun. Eso casado como mexicana. And bueno uh, mujer. Anyway, uh, I've got a couple questions. Uh, in regard to a septic up, a tank, if people monitor it and pump it properly and don't neglect it, uh, does that help a lot? That would alleviate most of it, wouldn't it? Yeah, I, I you know, there is. I, for some bizarre reason, I've been studying septic tanks for <laughs> many years, whether I like it or not. Uh, and and uh, I would say that for many people, they don't even know they have one. Um, and then there's there's the the maintenance of it, making sure that they're not putting chemicals down the drain that that might have an impact on on its effectiveness. Um, yeah, there's there is a little bit, you know the. The UNR uh, co-op extension used to put out um, fact sheets on septic tanks that, that was supposed to be uh, a means to educate the public as to what, what to do with their septic, how, how, how long do they need to wait before they pump it out and, and, and do regular maintenance on it. Um, I think they still have that information on their website, but I think a lot of people just don't know they, how to maintain it. Um, the other issue is that putting too many, because oftentimes um, one, one person mentioned dilution is the solution, right? Um, if you have one <laughs> septic tank in a 10 acre farm, right? That person, even if he didn't maintain his, his septic tank, isn't gonna have a broad impact on, on that 10 acres of property. But in many cases, development happens in such a way that you may have a one acre piece of property, but your home is less than a stone's throw away from your neighbor's home. And you're each on a one acre property, but your septic tanks are you know, 50 feet apart from each other. And so the, the cumulative impact of those higher number of septic tanks closer together does have an impact on the water quality. So it, it involves both understanding how to maintain it and then having the right distance between the septic tanks to ensure that you're not uh, um, having a significant influx of, of, of septic waste to your aquifer. And nitrate is just one of the chemicals, of course, that, that people are aware of that, that contaminates aquifers. But you can, as you know, there are a lot of things that end up in our waste uh, that we don't yet know what those impacts are to our, to our health. Correct, statin drugs and so forth. We're on an aquifer here at the ranch and uh, I've spent a good deal of time uh, looking at information on YouTube and so forth. And our uh, aquifer purveyor here that we use has a very uh, well done website with uh, information about maintaining an aquifer. Mm -hmm. And so from what you're saying, in conjunction with monitoring these things, it would be on. It would, it, it, it would be the in the benefit of the county to be a little more aggressive in uh, putting information out and getting people to uh, get their septic tanks pumped. 
not every 10 years, but every five years or four years, you know, and then, you know, it depends on the size of the family mm -hmm. and those things. And uh, that would help to, it won't alleviate the problem, but it would help um, reduce the problem if everybody was more conscientious about maintaining their septics. Mm -hmm. So a good presentation. It was interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to ask the obvious question. Commissioner Rice. If we require more people to be on sewers, would that help alleviate the problem with the pollution? We, okay, so um, that was part of the, one of the scenarios that we, we ran. Uh, I think I had a figure in my presentation that showed um, what those impacts would be. And, and yes, um, because the impacts of what have, has been happening over the last several decades, um, you will have nitrates that'll leave the system through groundwater flow towards the river or to pumping wells, agricultural or domestic. Um, over time, you will have fresh water, recharge water, possibly diluting what is there. But for many areas where groundwater movement is slow. And, and another aspect of our work that we did was to look at a naturally occurring process, which is called denitrification. And that is a process for which microbes will consume uh, the available nitrate. And that has to happen under certain conditions where there's no available oxygen in the aquifer. And the results of our study determined that denitrification, this natural process does not exist in this alluvial aquifer because of the lack of um, these might either the lack of the microbes or the oxygen levels in the aquifer are too high, likely as a consequence of agriculture, which is reintroducing water at the land surface. And that water is kind of fresh water, so to speak, is entering the aquifer and it's changing the oxygen levels of the aquifer. The other aspect is that the river produces a lot of oxygen, that oxygenation enters the aquifer and that changes the oxygen levels at closer areas around the aquifer as well in proximity to the river. So under denitrification, um, sometimes you can, you can get um, reductions in nitrate levels to below the MCL, but unfortunately at the time that we uh, did this investigation, we didn't find any evidence for denitrification uh, that was occurring in the aquifer. Well, my question was if we uh, required more development to uh, mandate the sewer systems instead of... Uh, the, ex the existing nitrate in the aquifer would, would remain until it would get flushed out for some time. Thank you. Any further questions or comments from the commissioners? Seeing none, would uh, anybody care to bring a motion forward? Commissioner Gardner. I don't see a whole lot of hands going up, so I'll make the motion. All right, thank uh, you. I, I move that we approve a proposal to evaluate the status of water levels, arsenic and nitrates in the Carson or in the Douglas County alluvial aquifer and to develop an interactive web-based tool for visualization of hydrologic data submitted by the US Geological Study uh, Survey, USGS, Nevada Water Science Center and authorize the county manager to enter into an agreement in a format acceptable to legal counsel for services with USGS for an amount not to exceed 113, $113,425 for Douglas County's contributions to the same through fiscal year 2023-2024. Second. I'll second. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a second? Commissioner Rice? Yes, it was, sir. All right, thank you. <laughs> we, well, 
all those in I favor. Thought I, was gonna, I thought I was going to die for a lack of a second. <laughs> yeah. Trying to get off on mute can be a pain. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Signify by saying nay. The motion is carried. Mr. Norano, thank you very much. It was a good presentation. Thank you. And it's good that you know stuff about this because it is important. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Okay. Chair? Yeah. We've been at it for almost two full hours right now. Well, uh, it's I was going to call you that. Um, okay. screen, but that's okay. If, if, uh, I was going to suggest we take, a, we, we take a break after item four because we've got people waiting. Uh, oh, okay. Is okay. and then after that we'll take a break. Is that or do you want to take a break now? I'll just. Well, if we take a break until four o'clock, then that would give us time to uh, use the facilities and and come well, back at four o'clock. No, we don't want to do that. We've got item <laughs> number, item number four, and we have folks waiting. Uh, okay. And then after that, we'll take a break. Very All good. right. You're the item, num item number four for possible action. Discussion on appointments to the Douglas County Airport Advisory Committee for the <coughs> remainder of the two-year term that ends December 2021 due to the resignation of a member. The vacancy is for one representative from the business community in compliance with Douglas County Code 2.58. Mr. Cates, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I don't have much to add to that. We had uh, seven applicants um, for the position. Um, most of them are on the call. Hopefully they're all still there um, and their information is included in the packet. Um, are any of the applicants available? Natalie, do you have anybody online? We do, I'm promoting them to panelists right now so that um, they're starting to show their video. So we have Virginia and we have Michael. Who else do we have? Mr. Summers? Yes. Okay, you're there. Ms. Starrett, you're there. We got anybody else on there, Natalie, that's available? I don't see anybody. We have Steve Temple oh. and Mark okay. Stapleton. Okay. Are they, oh, the, are they, uh, Oh, okay. There you are, Steve. Yep. I'll tell you what, while the others are working on getting on, uh, we'll start with Mr. Temple. Would you like to give some comments in regard to uh, the position on the airport committee? Sure. Uh, Steve Temple, uh, recent Douglas County resident, last three years, uh, been up in Washoe County uh, for 17 prior to that, been a user of the airport for the last 15 uh, own three airplanes out there and um, in the process of buying a hangar uh, also. So very interested in, in the happenings at the airport and I've been uh, flying for my entire life. So I'm pretty spun up on any aviation event that you guys would want to discuss. I'm a professional pilot by trade and a retired Lieutenant Colonel from the Air Force. Uh, and I flew the entire 28 years I was in the Air Force. You didn't serve in Vietnam, did you? I'm not that old. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Oh. I am. <laughs> so, oh. Really, oh. Golf war, all the golf wars, Afghanistan, Iraq. I, I flew in all of those. I flew okay. medevacs for two and a half years in Iraq. Well, that's, that's fun out there doing that. You know, when you're 20-something. Yeah, not now. <laughs> no. All right. Who do we have next? <clears throat> Chairman? Uh, Chairman? Yes. Uh, Doug Ritchie with the Douglas County District Attorney's Office. Because this uh, appointment must be from the business community pursuant to Douglas County Code 2.50.010, uh, 
it might be helpful if each of the members uh, shared what business they run or operate here in the county or how they, how they fit uh, that qualification for being a representative from the business community. Understood. Uh, yeah, that was brought up uh, earlier. And, uh, you know, I, I'm in the process of forming an LLC to incorporate uh, the airplane resale business which I'd like to pursue uh, as I go into retirement. That's not formed uh, formally. I, in fact, I was just on the phone with an attorney and part of the, uh, that process is in the formation phases with the attorney. Um, so th that business is going to be uh, in play. And I'm also uh, hopeful that uh, when the uh, condominium complex on the airport is formalized, that I'll be on the board in, in a business, you know, setting there, uh, run, helping run that association. Uh, and I'm also in the condo association out at Genoa Lakes Golf Course. So, you know, some business acumen there. I've been associated and worked for uh, several businesses out at the airport in a repair and uh, test pilot functioning uh, arena. All right, thank you, sir. And, okay, Mr. Stapleton. Would you care to make some comments? Uh, certainly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, great. Thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to talk with you. Um, again, this is uh, Mark Stapleton. <clears throat> My wife and I actually moved up here to uh, uh, Gardnerville in 2002. And the primary reason we moved here uh, was to relocate our business from Southern California to, uh, to uh, this part of Nevada. We absolutely love and adore living here in Carson Valley. Uh, it's been a place that we vacationed at for many years, and it was a uh, really a uh, fulfillment of a of a uh, uh, a dream to be able to to live and work up here. So in 2002, we moved our uh, our business up here. Um, I've been in the uh, the uh, the chemical engineering business, uh, and when we moved our our company up here, uh, we we built a uh, continued to build our company. Uh, and, and as we did, we employed about 25 people uh, here under the name of uh, Power Chem Technology in the uh, uh, off of Johnson Lane, is where we were located for so many years. Um, and uh, subsequently, our company uh, was acquired by another company. And in 2019, I retired from that company and then started a, another LLC, which does business in the geothermal industry uh, internationally. Uh, so I've been quite involved in, in the business community for, for some time, uh, obviously having run our own company and now running another company, uh, have a great deal of, of experience that way. Additionally, uh, I also am a, I'm a pilot, I've been a pilot for not quite as long as the previous uh, guest, but I've uh, uh, been a pilot, a private pilot for uh, uh, since the early 90s with about 1500 hours of uh, flying time in. And I uh, also uh, own a hangar out there at, uh, at the airport. So I've uh, been involved in the, uh, uh, in the um, aviation industry for, for some time. Um, so very interested in, in working with the advisory board, understand the role of the advisory board is really to be, uh, to make recommendations uh, on airport policy to the uh, county commissioners. And so I understand this would include various, various areas, uh, including general, general aviation use, uh, firefighting, emergency use, uh, uh, medical use, uh, noise abatement, of course, is going to be a critical part. But uh, there's also a uh, compliance with the AMP. That's the um, Air Air airport uh, master plan that I know is part of the uh, 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 responsibilities of the board in making recommendations to the, uh, to the commissioners. Um, so I can be happy to give you any other uh, background uh, or experience if uh, there's any questions. So you never retired. You just kept right on going. I did, yes. Thank you, I'm sir. having second thoughts about that because the new business venture has uh, been- you don't want to retire. Done, done a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, we'll always be busy working at something, that's for sure, but- uh, now, If you rest, you rust. You just keep at it. That's good. Okay. Um, what else do we have? Mr. Somers, do you care to make some comments? Uh, <clears throat> surely, thank you. While I'm not a pilot, as a resident of uh, Douglas County, our uh, I have, I'm involved in real estate development, but also I have been the financial officer for an aviation company for the last 20 years, where we operate in 32 airports, uh, providing uh, a maintenance service at the gates for the commercial airlines. 
We have a division that uh, we uh, in the financial side oversee is in repair and overhauls, where we have a hangar in Florida. We have a hangar in uh, Birmingham, uh, England, where we do major repair and overhaul for all airlines. We have a um, modification division that we do both interior and exterior mods. I, and I have worked with airports over, like as I indicated, probably over 40 airports in um, uh, working with different airport authorities. Uh, while a lot of all of my experiences with commercial airlines, not too much with general aviation, I just want to be able to uh, support and help the community and the uh, county. Thank you very much, sir. It's an interesting background. And Ms. Sterrett, you're up to bat. So the floor is yours, ma'am. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think my education and business experience have provided me with a unique combination of skills that I believe would be of great benefit to the Airport Advisory Committee. The duties of a commissioner, as described on the county website, include familiarity with the airport, the promotion of community compatibility issues through public relations and reviewing and assisting in the development and execution of important documentation concerning the role of the airport in the community. Having been a university English instructor and document editor, both in California and here in Nevada, and also having been an administrative assistant in a law office that my husband owned at which complex documentation was a daily assignment, I'm well versed in getting the right words on the page to accomplish set goals. More recently and for the past six years, I have been intensely engaged in a partnership that pursues public race relation activities in our Douglas community. And I understand the parameters and can reduce the scope of work required for successful branding and messaging, which is also a part of the job of the Airport Advisory Committee. My pilot husband and I have had an airplane hangered at the Minden Airport almost since the day we arrived in Nevada 18 years ago. And so I'm also quite familiar with our exceptional airport. If I am selected, I look forward to working on a committee that concerns such a vital contributor to our county. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Derrick. Um, is, is there somebody else trying to get on? You, you see that yellow, uh, red screen? Yes, we have Deborah on. Oh, okay. Are you prepared to give a few comments? I can't. I can't hear her. Is she on mute? What is it? Yeah, Deborah, we don't have any audio from you. You'll have to go to the bottom left of your screen and change your, um, check your audio settings, your microphone. It's not working. It looks like you might be on a tablet or an iPhone. Do you have headphones plugged in? Sometimes that, no. It's my understanding we have seven applicants for this position. Is that everybody else's understanding? I think so. Mr. Casey, yeah, I think it was seven. Yeah, I think I misspoke. There's six applicants. Oh, okay. six. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, I don't know what to do here. And she's still trying. Why don't we, why don't we? Uh... I think we may have her back on. Okay. Deborah? Can you hear me? Oh, we still can't hear you. Um, you're gonna need to go to your um, the options next to your mute button. There should be like a little arrow 
to select and then you're gonna to go to your microphone and try and change your microphone. Chairman, perhaps you might want to take that five minute break or so and maybe. Yeah, I'm trying to go, try to get back. Um, I'd, I'd like to change this position to divide it into six units that equals one person. But we can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> we, got, we got some great folks. I mean, good candidates. Well, I'll tell you what, I think Mr. Case has an idea and uh, this will give Deborah a chance to perhaps get in. We'll take a 10 minute break to deliberate and give Deborah a chance to get back in. And then we'll, uh, we'll go for the vote. So is that okay with everybody? So yes, we'll sir. come back. What time is it here? We've got uh, 4.06. 4.06. About come back at 4 four fifteen. Four. Okay. Well, four fifteen. Okay, we can do that. Okay, with everybody, okay. we'll take it. Four fifteen. Break and come back at four fifteen. Okay. And.
join the conversation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all five commissioners and all the candidates have are available. And Deborah, where, are you still there? I saw you and then I unsaw you. Where'd you oh, there you are. Okay. Do you got? Huh. Do you have me now? Yeah, we we copy you. What? Along. Okay, good. <laughs> good <point. laughs> like, oh no, not now. <laughs> Deborah, you have All the right. floor. You can go ahead and tell us a few things about yourself. Okay. My name's uh, Deborah McDermott Rothschild. I've um, been a resident of Douglas County for 15 years. I came down um, from Alaska about 15 years ago. Um, both my parents were bush pilots, so grew up in aviation. I worked at the Sierra Front uh, Interagency Dispatch Center for three years um, as a fire and aviation dispatcher and firefighter. Um, I'm a, now a, a, I'm a chamber member and a business owner. I own the Floral Apothecary Flower Shop off of Airport Road. In addition to that, um, I'm also a flight instructor for both fixed wing and rotorcraft. And um, I, uh, I work at the airport as well. Um, and I've been the Young Eagles coordinator for four years for um, the uh, EAA chapter out of um, out of Santa Teresa when my husband was in the in the military. So we traveled around a bit. So I've gotten some time to spend at a lot of different airports, everything from North Las Vegas um, to El Paso to locally here and. Um, up in Reno. So I'm pretty familiar with uh, aviation, fire, the needs of airport, and also the community around. I lived in Johnson Lane for a while as well. So kind of a, I, what I have to offer is a pretty well-rounded um, perspective for, I guess, everything from the business-owned community to a pilot's perspective to a resident um, around the airport. Thank you. Very impressive. Where's your, is your, what branch of the service is your son in? Oh, my uh, husband, uh, military, army. Yeah. Yeah. Good for him. I was army artillery. Yeah, I recognize the, uh, the captain's bars and the sabers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably a little bit older than he is, though. Um. <laughs> well, my grandfather was actually, he was a, um, the first um, duty station he had. He flew 19 missions in World War II, and it was Biggs Army Airfield, and he was actually Army Air Corps before they turned it into the Air Force. That's right. That's a lot of history. That's very impressive. <laughs> a lot of history. This is a dilemma, gentlemen. Um, we've got to decide on one. And I, I wish we could use all of you guys. So uh, this is not uh, this is not easy for us. And this this happens with all of the committees that we appoint people to. We have extraordinary um, experience and professionals uh, who are willing to work in different uh, uh, committees and bring a wealth of knowledge. Uh, and it's just real commendable that all of you guys are, are stepping up. So do the commissioners have anything to say in regard to what direction we should go? Commissioner Gardner? Yeah, I appreciate the dilemma that you have indicated we're in. It seems like the last time we made these appointments to this particular board, we had an excessive amount of candidates as well for uh, the multiple positions we had available. Uh, we probably would have gone ahead if we had had this resignation uh, prior to January 7th. We probably would have gone ahead and made this appointment then. So it's unfortunate that we didn't have it then. I do know that uh, uh, in talking to, uh, I got a call from Ms. Starrett, and I know that uh, 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 Virginia Starrett had uh, originally submitted an application for the Regional Transportation Commission, and she would have, if she had known at that time, uh, 
uh, that she was not eligible for the Regional Transportation Commission because she doesn't live in the largest township of the county, which is required by Nevada revised statutes, then she would have chosen to apply for this particular uh, commission uh, at that time and been under consideration at that time. So um, anyways, uh, we, we, this is, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Cates, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is for a one-year appointment. Is that right? For fulfilling the one-year remaining term of uh, Ms. Ms. Kinsfit or whatever it is to, to, to December of 30, uh, 2031? Uh, uh, 21? It, uh, I believe that's correct. It finishes their term. Was it one year left? Yes, yes, December 2021. One year left. Okay, well, it, we have to make a decision. So at this time, uh, uh, I will move that we appoint Virginia Starrett to the Airport Commission and Advisory Board for the remaining portion of the term uh, of uh, the resignation of Alexandra Kimzitz. Any other comments? I was kind of uh, taken by uh, Ms. Uh, Rothschild. Uh, uh, she had extensive background in aviation and uh, extensive uh, experience, especially uh, locally. And uh, I was, uh, I was, I am leaning towards her. Okay. Commissioner Tarkanian, do you have any thoughts? You're going to have to make a decision here too. You're muted. Danny, you're muted. Yeah, shoot. Yeah, I, every one of us has screwed up one time, huh? <laughs> just, no, just what you had said. There's a lot of really good candidates out there. Um, uh, there were in the last one too. And it's tough to pick from so many good quality people. Um, the only person that I know personally is Virginia Starrett, and I, you know, I, I like her, and I, I don't know the other candidates. They all sound really great. Uh, I figured you guys probably have a better idea of the, uh, may know them more personally, may have better input into it. So I was listening to you guys' recommendations and suggestions. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Nawasad, you have any comments? Yes, um, I'm going to fall in line with uh, Commissioner Gardner and Commissioner Tarkanian in supporting Virginia Starrett for the position. All right. I, I like Mr. Stapleton's business experience and the fact that he's a pilot, but I think we have a consensus of three uh, who are in favor of Ms. Starrett. So it would appear that Ms. Starrett, you are the new uh, representative on the airport commission. So I, I, I think we need a nomination in a second. Yeah, I, I, so yeah. I, I will renew my nomination. Uh, I will renew my nomination for Virginia Stara for the airport board. And I'll second that nomination. Okay, we have a motion in favor and second. Um, Let's kick it to a vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Well, uh, yeah, Commissioner Gardner. Mr. Inc., I, I have an additional comment. Uh, Ms. Starrett, I don't know if you realize in your background, but you have five cowboys on horses with their rear ends toward us. <laughs> I didn't. I would hope. That. I would hope that you don't. That's not an indication of how you feel about this board of commissioners. <laughs> okay, of the five cowboys and the rear horses. <laughs> Maybe you could find a better background. <laughs> Rodeo. Just an observation. <laughs> my my horses are at least facing us. <laughs> that's pretty funny. <laughs> Thank you all very yeah, much. Yeah. And, no. And, no inference intended by the background. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Moving on. Item number five. For possible action, discussion to adopt resolution 2021R-004, augmenting the China Springs fiscal year 2020-21 budget by $430,000 
and approve the utilization of $424,000 in salary savings to fund an anticipated shortfall of the $850,000 in Medicaid revenue. Uh, Ms. Willoughby and Ms. Garrison, uh, who wants to take it first? And Terry Willoughby for the record, I will take start and then Wendy can chime in with some of the background information. Okay, thank you. Garrison came to me earlier this year um, and notified me that Medicaid revenues were not coming in as projected basically due to COVID and a reduction in the number of camp youths. So her camp population is down, which leads again to lower Medicaid revenues. So we had originally budgeted based on past history from the last fiscal year. And this was originally not anticipated to be affected by COVID, but we come here today and we've developed a plan to manage that. And we hope that it will be a short-term issue and that it will be resolved quickly. And this will, so we're recommending a one-time use of fund balance to correct her, her budget and she will be holding some positions vacant to create the rest of the savings to fund the shortfall. Thank you very much, Ms. Willoughby. Is, is Wendy here? Is she on? Yes, she's here, Wendy. Oh, okay. There you are. I see you. You're, you're muted on my thing here. There she is. There she is. Okay, Wendy. Give us a combo check. Wendy, we can't hear you. Natalie, can you see what's going on from your location? Yeah, Natalie, but for the record, I don't have a response from her. I haven't been able to get anything from her. I see her name out here. And and didn't we get a a brief sound from that? Because she was she was muted. Now she's unmuted. If there's particular questions, Terry will be for the record. If there's particular questions, I'd be happy to try and assist on behalf of Ms. Garrison. If well, so. we we had a meeting the other day in regard to this yesterday and with Judge Young, and it's just an unmitigated travesty what's being done to China Springs. Um, this is the last hope these kids have. And if they have to be resubmitted and taken out of the China Spring program and put into the general population, it will just absolutely destroy these kids. Correct. And, and I believe... Terry will be for the record. I believe there's that's a separate legislative issue, but this is in regards to Medicaid funding, funding specifically, which is separate than the state funding. Correct. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, maybe I can add a little background on, on behalf of uh, China Springs. Uh, so the state um, put China Springs on a Medicaid billing model last fiscal year. Um, it was seen as a way to diversify their revenue um, and perhaps uh, decrease some state support in the future. Um, it went pretty well the first year. I really commend uh, Wendy Garrison uh, for the work that she did to set that up and she did do successful billing uh, based on my prior work experience working for Nevada Medicaid for about seven years. I know how tough that, that is and um, she got some consultants to help her and they did a really good job. It was going along really well and they budgeted, uh, what was it, uh, over a million dollars in revenue uh, for the current fiscal year. But it's my understanding that primarily due to COVID that her census has dropped quite a bit and judges are not referring kids to the camp uh, the, way they have, the way they anticipated. Um, and therefore that billing has really dried up. Um, she's only billed, I think about $200,000 for the year uh, so far um, uh, when she's supposed to bill 1.2. That is a completely different issue about the state's Medicaid funding 
uh, as uh, Ms. Willoughby indicated. And uh, so that, that's, a, that's another fiscal challenge that, that the camp could be facing next fiscal year. And I'll be talking a little, more, a little bit more about that during the legislative update. In, in conjunction with that, just to enlighten some of the uh, commissioners, the uh, Northern Nevada counties, what is it, 17 counties, Mr. Case? Uh, 16 of the 17. 16. Um, all are contributors to the China Spring uh, budget because typically they are the ones who will end up sending any kids there rather than to prison. And uh, in that discussion yesterday, you know, all of them are tapped out. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's just, and, and the thing is, it, it's hard to imagine to let that program go and then just have to revitalize it. I mean, there's such an incredible staff out there and I don't know what the solution is. I mean, this is a, this is a stopgap. And so Wendy, are you, are you alive now? Can you hear us? Yeah. Well, so Terry, anyway. Terry will, will it be, will it be yeah. for the record. And that's one reason we would recommend this is we do expect that the Medicaid funding is a one-time issue when the camp census returns to normal that she will have sufficient revenues next fiscal year from Medicaid. And that's separate again from the state funding. And we are having regular meetings to discuss the finances and um, providing assistance in billing non-Medicaid. Okay, well advised. Commissioner Gardner? Well, yeah, I'm disappointed that uh, Ms. Garrison's not on the line, or maybe she is coming online. She just does a tremendous job out there. And uh, I just wanted to clarify, I think one point, maybe Ms. Willoughby can help me with this. Uh, this $424,000 in salary savings, that's, that's actually direct salary savings from China Spring itself, right? That's not countywide yeah. uh, salary savings. So this also speaks to the job that she's been under uh, over the last year in, in uh, wrestling with that budget and what she's been able to do under the COVID aspect. So anyways, I, I just wanted to make sure that we understood that uh, and, these funds are coming directly out of their facility, actually, in their savings. So, yeah, yeah. Terry, for the record, China Spring is a separate fund. And these, just to clarify, these are not positions that have people in them. These are vacant positions that she's holding the recruitments open. So it's... Okay. Ms. Garrison? Good afternoon. Can you, Can you hear me now? Yeah, you have the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. I had to leave my computer and join by my phone. So quality might not be as good. I appreciate all your comments. And um, as Patrick and, and Commissioner Ingalls indicated, we have met this week. And there there is um, some conversations regarding uh, this year's budget at the legislature, as well as the next biennium, uh, with very little ability for the counties to absorb the cut that the governor has recommended. So we are um, anticipating that we'll ha have to hold these positions vacant because I'd never want to be a burden to Douglas County or any of the other counties that I serve. So um, unfortunately, it means using all my reserves or most of my reserves this year rather than trying to save for you know, future building needs or damage that happens at the camp. So I'm glad I have it. I'm just sorry it's being used um, in this manner at this time. Thank you very much, Ms. Garrison. And, you know, to the taxpayers out there, you, you may wonder why Douglas County is paying this and why the other counties. Um, the unfortunate thing is, is it's not a facility you can go out and visit. It's it's somewhat secured, and but it is you're getting your money's worth, and that's uh, you can feel comfort in that. And Judge Young is a strong supporter of the program, and so he endorses this. 
and that's about all we can say and just hope that you know the governor doesn't pick on China Spring to balance his budget. So if there's no other comments, would someone care to make a motion? Mr. Chairman, I worked uh, with the uh, youth for many years on the Pasadena Police Department, and I, am, I appreciate this program and what it does. Therefore, I would like to uh, move that we adopt resolution 2021R-004, augmenting the China Spring fiscal year 2020-21 budget from greater than anticipated fund balance from the prior year and approve the financial plan as presented. I have a second? I'll second it. Okay. We have a motion and a second from Commissioner Tarkanian. All those in favor, signify by voting aye. 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 All those opposed, signify by voting nay. The motion carries 5-0. Well, we got some breathing room. So I think... Uh, Ms. Garrison, it's not fair to you to have to keep going through this every year. And, uh, I don't know what to say. And Ms. Willoughby, thank you very much. It's uh, it's good to know that you know that these things are available and the numbers are correct. So thank you both very much. Thank you. Item number six, for possible action, discussion on the adoption of resolution 2021R, dash 008, which increases the Douglas County fiscal year 2020-21 budget in the general fund by $2,087,261 from greater than anticipated fund balances as noted. Ms. Willoughby, you have the floor. Thank you, Terry Willoughby, for the record. As we discussed previously, we can um, augment or increase the budget if the beginning fund balance, the audited fund balance is greater than we projected at the time we um, adopted the budget. And so this item is uh, particularly concerned with the county's general fund, which is the least restrictive of all the funds that we will be bringing forward to you. This basically contains everything that's not restricted. Um, the augments that are before you for the general fund total $2 million. The majority of them are for purchase orders or contracts that were already committed. I will go through some of the items. Um, there is a data center relocation. That's a one-time project and use of funds. This has been a recurring audit finding. So it was necessary to deal with that. Um, a permit efficiency project, this is $300,000 that was approved by the board in fiscal year 2019-20. Um, in the Sheriff's Department, there is a one-time use of fund balance for jail security improvements. Again, they've had um, the grand jury report recommended that as well as one of their um, jail audits. So this is almost $500,000 one-time project, appropriate use of fund balance. Uh, again, um, alternative sentencing is asking for money for a one-time use of fund balance for a new case management system. And also the augments include funding for the new code enforcement officers that were approved by the board and their assorted equipment and vehicles. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Commissioners, do you have any questions of Ms. Willoughby? You don't question Miss Willoughby very often. <laughs> she knows where the decimal point goes. <laughs> so, we have faith. Yeah. Well, in that case, would somebody care to make a motion? I'll make a motion that uh, we adopt the resolution 2021R-008, which increases the Douglas County fiscal year 2020 through 2021 budgets in the general fund by $2,087,261 from greater than anticipated fund balance as noted. 
Do we have a second to the motion? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any comments and final? Okay, then let's have a vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any nays? The motion is carried. All right, item number seven. Discussion on the adoption of resolution 2021R-009, which increases the Douglas County fiscal year 2020-21 budgets in the special revenue funds by $5,839,006 from greater than anticipated opening fund balances as noted. Ms. Willoughby, you have the floor. Thank you, Terry. Will it be for the record? Um, again, special revenue funds are restricted. There's a each fund has a specific use and revenue source, so it has to be used within those confines. I will walk you through the augments. Primarily, these are for existing contracts and purchase orders that are just being rolled over into the new year. Um, the first fund is solid waste management. This is funded by franchise fees that can only be used for uh, improvements to this program. There is a $300,000 new capital project for a solid waste decant facility. And the reason it's being brought forward at this time is that Public Works is working with NDOT and NDOT is working on a similar project with another agency in this very area. And so it's more efficient to do it at this time and work together. Um, the social services fund, again, this is primarily property taxes funded, and those are just purchase order rollovers. Road operating fund, um, sources of funding are gas tax, transfers in from the general fund. Um, there are a couple new projects. One is a paving project and $100,000 uh, project at Wild Horse for curb and gutter and sidewalk repair. Any questions yeah. or comments? Oh, do you have more? I'm not done yet. Almost. Okay, I'm sorry. The tax <laughs> is strictly, again, the, the transient occupancy tax and nothing new there. Tahoe Douglas Transportation District, again, taxes, um, only rollovers and an existing capital project that's continuing on. Just as, uh, the Fund 240 is the Justice Court Administration Assessment that's funded through fines that are restricted. Stormwater management is funded by a transfer from the general fund and that's restricted to stormwater activities per prior board resolution. And uh, the last one is the flood litigation settlement fund. As you know, there was a, five, a legal settlement with the Johnson Lane area and we keep those monies in a separate fund to segregate them. And there's no additional projects on that. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions. I'll let Ms. Willoughby take care of this agenda item. <laughs> Anybody have any questions or comments? Ms. Willoughby, do you want to ask for a motion? No, I don't think that's... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Would somebody care to make a motion? Mr. Gardner? Wait. Mr. Gardner? Okay. Mr. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know if you're raising uh, hand or what would you? Well, I was I was waiting for one of the my fellow commissioners, but uh, okay. it looked like uh, Mr. Mr. Noah Sad was leading into the microphone, but I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I will move that we adopt resolution 2021R-009 to augment fiscal year 2020-2021 budgets by five million eight hundred thirty-nine thousand and six dollars as presented. A second. We have a, a motion and a second. All those in, fi in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any, any opposed? The motion is carried. Thank you, Ms. Willoughby. Thank you. Well done. Okay, we're going to public works, item number eight. For presentation only. Presentation on the water resources maintenance by 
Douglas County Water Utilities in the Carson Valley, including an overview of the type of water quality tests, water level monitoring, and county staff con the county staff conducts. The presentation may include examples of data collected from the trends observed over the time for certain county wells. Phil Ritiker, you have the floor. Commissioners, uh, Phil Ritker for the record, uh, Director of Public Works, I should say, for the record. Can you see my uh, the screen in the presentation? That's what I want yes. to share. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, is it in? Uh, okay. It's not in presentation mode. We can see all your slides off to the side. Okay. Let me get into presentation mode then. I apologize for that. Is it now? Yep. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, so uh, starting again, Phil Ritker, Director of Public Works for the record. Uh, I was asked today to put to get to just present to the uh, the board, um, and this is uh, sort of follow up to your presentations by the USGS and by Ed James, um, and this is specific to the the water resources that the county maintains as a public water utility. Um, as, and, and specifically here down in the valley, I won't deal with the issues at the, or the, the systems at the lake today, but in terms of the, the resources in the, in the Carson Valley. Um, and, and just try to give you an over, this is just really intended to be an overview of, of, of what we maintain. Um, so what I'll do is uh, I was going to uh, go through and, uh, and show you the, the scope of our um, the utility in terms of production wells and where we are, where we operate, uh, and then talk about water quality analysis um, and and something called the consumer confidence reports. Uh, these are regulatory requirements uh, from the safe uh, Bureau of Safe Drinking Water. Um, and then finally, I'll I'll show some data in terms of well sounding, uh, which is the monitoring well depths, well depths, and 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 uh, water levels. Uh, from the 2007 to present. Um, in terms of the water utilities and the wells we operate, we operate uh, actually in five, five regions down here in the valley. Um, we have the North County, uh, representative of the North County is, is wells on the e in East Topsy and the Walmart area. Uh, the East Valley, which is the Hayborn, uh, we've got a well at Hayborn and, and at airport. Those are a couple of historic wells there. Um, and then in the West Valley, um, again, representative of that area would be the Genoa Lakes area and then the Wallies area um, that we maintain wells. On this graph or on this chart, you'll see um, sort of the, the eastern side of the valley where you've got the E, F, G, H, I, J, uh, the, those, those mapped out there uh, and, the, and the airport and sort of north of the airport, then up into the North County area. And then on the Genoa, on the uh, on the west side of the valley, um, you see the wells listed as L, K, and M. Um, in the southern part of the county, um, our reach is actually down into the, into the, not quite into Ruinstroth. We don't, we don't operate anything in the Ruinstroth area, but we are in the fairgrounds and Sunrise Estates area. Um, and then we also operate wells in the, uh, along the foothill area. Uh, with Sierra Country Estate, Sheridan Acres, and Jones Peak, uh, those being representative. There's there's multiple wells in some of those locations, but that's the generically the areas that we operate our systems in. The rest of the county is operated by other water purveyors. In terms of water quality analysis, um, we are actually main, we're, we're monitoring and maintaining our, our testing based on what's required by the Nevada, Nevada Department of Environmental Protection or NDEP and their division of the Bureau of Safe Drinking Water. Um, each, each well and each site has its own monitoring assessment plan that's based on the, on the uh, uh, type of water or groundwater that is and the, and the um, geology of the area. Um, so, in each area and each region, the testing itself um, is, uh, there are certain attributes like microbial testing for coliform, 
the, the lead and copper rule testing. Um, that is sort of mandatory across the board. Doesn't matter where you're where you're located. But then we get into some of these other regulated contaminants like arsenic, barium fluoride, nitrates. Um, those are really a function of where the well is located and whether it's required a requirement uh, uh, from a routine monitoring assessment plan. Um, uh, most of the contaminants that we're dealing with are, uh, with the exception of nitrates, are really um, from natural deposits or erosions of natural deposits. Um, and they vary widely depending on where we are. Uh, for example, uh, fluoride is an issue in the Wallies, uh, in the Wallies uh, area where uh, on, the, on that side of, Gen of Genoa or the, on the south, south side of Genoa. Um, but it's not an issue when you get up to the, the Genoa Lakes or, or further to the north along, the, along that area. Um, we also see sulfur. Uh, sulfur is a contaminant that was found in the, in the Hayborn area here by the airport. Um, it's also uh, found, um, oh, it's not found anywhere else, but, but then when we get down into the Sierra Country Estates area, um, we typically have an issue with, uh, with carbon dioxide and, and pH. Uh, we also have an issue with iron in those locations. Um, Joe's Peak is another one where we get some uniqueness with, uh, with pH, uh, pH and, and CO2. Uh, included in that is also radio, radionuclide testing. So we test for radium, uranium, and then what's called gross alpha and gross beta. Again, those are just natural deposits that, are, that decay in areas. It's just part of a, a general assessment plan. And then we're also looking for secondary contaminants. Um, and not all of these are tested in all locations, but they can range anywhere from aluminum and chlorides to irons, magnesiums. Uh, and then your typical things like total hardness, color, pH, and then total dissolved solids. Those are all covered in there. The, the results of this on an annualized basis is published in what's called the Consumer Confidence Report. Um, we maintain, as the, as the county, we maintain nine separate public water systems, three of them at the lake, um, six of them down here in the valley. Um, and we have to, we publish a consumer conference report for each one of those nine public water systems. It's an annual quality report. It's required of all public water systems. And it's, um, and it's a detailed report that provides the information to the consumer on the, on the source of their water, whether it came from groundwater or surface water, um, in, and, and which well specifically feeds their system. Um, it also contains uh, information about the regulated contaminants and any health, health risks that, uh, that are, are, uh, need to be reported based on EPA and state standards. Um, all of these reports are, uh, are available on the county website. Uh, if you go to Public Works to our website, the, CS, the conference, consumer conference reports are published there. Um, but uh, by state law, they are also uh, issued uh, notices issued to every customer on the public water system on each of these public water systems at the date that they are published. They're published every uh, every June of, uh, of each year. A uh, typical type of information that's found on a consumer confidence report is shown on these two. So there's a couple of slides here. Uh, this will show you whether there's microbial contamination. Again, these are typical. Uh, what we're what we're required to show in the consumer conference report is the range of uh, the data range for for what's found in the in, 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 during testing, as well as the uh, the limits or the or the high. Um, so in this case, this is this is the consumer conference report information for East Valley. Where we're, check, where we're checking for uh, microbial contamination. We're also checking for what's called TDHM, which is the byproduct from disinfection. So again, this is a byproduct from chlorination. Um, we're also doing lead and copper that under the new rules for lead and copper that's been in place for quite some time ever since the Flint, Michigan issue. Um, the, so that's across the board. Uh, again, on the East Valley side, arsenic uh, is a contaminant that we monitor for. Uh, that's predominantly the result of the fact that the East Valley water system now is, provide, is supplied predominantly from Minden as the water source um, from the Minden wells along that uh, uh, line that Jed James was talking about. And so we continue to monitor for arsenic coming out of, those, out of that system. 
Um, again, we monitor for the radionuclides, and then in this case, the secondary contaminants. Um, uh, what, the, in, in addition to the ones I spoke about earlier, we're dealing with uh, bicarbonates, um, uh, calcium carbonates and stuff, borons, um, and then, as I said, magnesium pH, uh, which is pretty typical across the board. Um, in terms of the well sounding, again, something that is uh, that we monitor. Um, uh, now, remember, these are production wells, so we, we monitor both static level um, at, uh, as well as at times we'll do we'll do monitoring during while while the pump while the wells are in operation. There's a there's and that's just monitoring drawdown on the wells, but this is the static levels. So this is in the, in the north side of North County at the Walmart well from 2007 to 20, uh, 2020. Um, I, I, the, the well depth here, uh, and, and I'm referencing things back down to a base level of 4,000, a, a base elevation of 4,660 feet, um, which is sort of the low point along the Carson River in the, uh, in the valley. Um, the base elevation of this well is at 4829, so it's 169 feet above that. The depth of this well is 322 feet, so if you think about it, the first, the first 170 feet is just getting down to, to where you're going to hit some the, the, the aquifer if, if you're going to find it. Um, in this case, the water level, uh, the water level back in, the, in 2007, 2008 time frame was, was bouncing between you know, 60 to 70 feet below the surface of the well. And uh, today it's bouncing, uh, it's, it's sitting right around 60 feet below the surface. If I move over to the East Valley, the Hayborn Well, um, again, we're basically at the uh, uh, very close, we're only 18 feet, this well is only 18 feet above the base elevation of 4660. Um, the well depth here was 466 feet. Uh, but the static water level in this well is anywhere from 10 to 30 feet below the surface at any given time. Um, and, and, it's, and it's seasonal. It, very, it fluctuates with the seasons. But it's, uh, again, uh, in the 2007-8 time period, it was anywhere from 10 to 30 feet below the surface. And at, and at present, it's anywhere from <clears throat> 10 to 20 feet below the surface. If I move over to the West Valley, the Janelle Lakes well, um, same thing. It's about 62 feet above, ba above the base elevation at 40, 4660. Well depth here is 170 feet, and the water level is, is you know, averaging somewhere around 30 feet below that surface level. Um, in recent years, and I, can't, I, I don't know that I can explain this, but in recent years, since 2017, uh, we've seen a, a, an increase in the well in the uh, – or, or a reduction in the height of the or the distance to the well. It's only 20 feet below the surface, and kind of hanging out in the 20 to 30 range at this point. Fairgrounds, which is on the south end of the county, that's the furthest one, furthest one to the south. Ele base elevation there is 332 feet above the uh, above the the river. Um, the well depth there is 380 feet. And the static water level is around 160 feet below the surface. Um, as you can see on this graph, from 2007 to present, it's it's um, basically stayed the same. It, uh, there's very little movement or, or a decrease in in or change in the well up well depth level down in the South County since 2007. Sheridan Acres, which is in the foothill area, so that's on the uh, sort of to the south again, but on the western slope. Um, here again, we're about 138 feet above the uh, river or the, or the Carson River, uh, well depth of 225 feet and static water level is, uh, is sitting in the 30 to 40, it has historically been in the 30 to 40 feet below the surface of the uh, ground level surface. Um, again, in the last uh, three or four years, um, that's been more consistently up in the about 20 feet, 20 to 30 feet below the surface of the ground. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Any of the commissioners have any questions or comments for Mr. Ritiker?
Mr. Rierker, uh, good presentation. Uh, gives a good overview of the system that the county is using throughout the, uh, the Carson Valley. So apparently uh, there's no comments or questions and we duly appreciate the information provided. And thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you. All right. Item number nine for possible action. Discussion to approve $1,719,066 construction manager at risk contract with Sierra Nevada Construction for equipment procurement for the Cave Rock Water System Improvement Project. Ron Romain. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ron Roman, Engineering Manager with Public Works. Um, Philip Ricker is also here today. And I believe uh, Scott McCullough may be joining the meeting also. Scott's a project manager working on the project with us. So I'm going to share my screen here and uh, go through a short presentation, if that's okay. You have the floor, sir. Okay, let me know when my uh, screen pops up. It, look, it looks good. Got okay. it. Okay. Thanks to Melissa Wasser for this beautiful picture. So this is uh, the item before the board today is for um, to approve a contract to procure equipment that's part of the Cave Rock Water System Improvement Project. Um, so today I'd like to basically talk a little bit about the, the project. It's, it's kind of a, um, the project is based on a preliminary engineering report that we conducted over the last several years. And the, pro the intent of the project is to address the most critical and critical needs uh, within the Cave Rock water system. I'll uh, kind of summarize the proposed contracts for the project and the budget. This is it's one project, but it's a multi-year, multi-contract effort. So we'll just kind of lay that out for the board so you understand uh, all the different elements that are involved in the project. And then we'll summarize with the recommended action to approve um, the contract for procurement of the water treatment plant equipment today. Just to, uh, to provide some context for the board, uh, you know, since the county acquired the Cave Rock system back in 1989, there's been a number of capital improvement projects in the system. The most recent one was this past summer, uh, 2020, where we replaced about 3,000 feet of water line on uh, Cave Rock Drive and Winding Way. Uh, there were about 12 water service connections involved in this project. And, and just maybe keep in mind the 3,000 feet and the 12 uh, service connections. Uh, in a minute, we'll talk about uh, kind of the upcoming projects for pipeline replacements in Cave Rock. Uh, one of the main components of the, of the project is upgrades to the Cave Rock water treatment plant. Uh, the primary goal is to provide redundant treat, treatment capacity in the plant right now. Uh, the plant has one water treatment filtration skid, which is a photo in the lower left. Um, the project will be replacing that with multiple treatment skids so that we'll be able to take one or more units out of service and still be able to treat water and provide, provide service to our water customers. So the, pro the uh, item on the board's agenda today is for procurement or purchase of the filtration equipment within the treatment plant. Uh, that will allow our design team and, uh, to finalize the design around the selected equipment, make sure everything is coordinated and fits okay within the plant. And then there's a relatively long lead time on procurement of the equipment. So uh, by approving the, the contract today, it puts us um, on track to actually do the work during the winter season of 2021-2022 when we have lower demands in the system. The other, the other component of the treatment plan are some upgrades to the lake intake system, which are really focused on uh, uh, addressing low lake levels when we, when we have a low lake level due to uh, drought conditions. One of the big components of the project will be water line replacements. In 2021, we have a pretty aggressive project laid out in the uh, upper Cave Rock area. Um, in 2021, we're anticipating or, provide, or hoping to replace about 8,500 feet of water line, and along with that, 52 
uh, water service connections. So this is a pretty aggressive schedule and plan. Our, our construction manager at risk has kind of laid out a program and schedule to accomplish this. They're, they're anticipating having two construction crews working concurrently throughout the summer uh, on this work. So there's going to be a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of activity out in, in the upper cave rock area, uh, summer of 2021. In 2022, we'll move down to waterline replacements within the Lake Ridge and the Hidden Woods, Woods area, along with replacement of a section of pipeline along US Highway 50 from approximately the Lincoln Park area north to uh, the location of the Cave Rock boat ramp. So uh, as, I, as I mentioned, it's uh, kind of a, uh, it's a rather large project. We have multiple contracts um, that will be necessary to complete and implement the project. We have two contracts that are currently active. The first is with HDR engineering for engineering design of the project. That's been approved and is underway. Uh, the second contract is with Sierra Nevada Construction and CORE. Uh, they teamed up and they were selected as the construction manager at risk for pre-construction services on the project. So both of those contracts are approved and uh, in place. Uh, the item on the board's agenda today is for uh, procurement of the equipment for the water treatment plant. And then in the future, we'll have, have additional contracts that will come back to the board for uh, construction and installation of the equipment within the water treatment plant, uh, modifications to the lake intake system, and then the two projects, one in 2021 for waterline replacements and one in 2022 uh, for the balance of the waterline replacements. So with respect to, I guess, the um, contract, proposed contracts and budgets, this is kind of how things lay out based on uh, the design that's been completed to date and input from our, our construction manager at risk in terms of construction costs and budget. Uh, these are costs that are reflected through toward the end of January of this year. Uh, the item highlighted in green is the contract before the board today for award of uh, a contract approximately $1.7 million for the water treatment plant filtration equipment. And then the uh, projects below that will be future contracts that will be coming back to the board here over the next several months. Uh, for the balance of the uh, improvements within the Cave Rock water system uh, project. So uh, everybody wants to know how we're, how we're paying for this. And this is kind of a summary of the funding sources. We have a, a couple of different funding sources for the project. Uh, the first is a US Forest Service grant in the amount of $500,000. And that money is, is uh, targeted and dedicated for replacement of the water lines in the cave rock, uh, upper cave rock area. So it, it doesn't, it certainly doesn't fund all that work, but it provides, um, you know, provides a, a good grant source for, for work in that area. And then we have a $16.5 million uh, funding package from the state revolving fund loan program. When we applied for that, the, um, Board for Financing Water pot Projects determined that the project qualified for a component of principal forgiveness in the amount of $250,000. So the balance of the loan will be for the $16.25 million. And then we also have some capital reserves from the Douglas County Water Utility Fund 328 that are being used for uh, funding on the project. So all told, our estimated costs at this time are around 18.8 million, and we've identified funding uh, just under uh, 21 uh, million dollars for the project. So the uh, the item today is uh, we're asking for approval to award a um, 1.7 million dollar construction manager at risk contract with Sierra Nevada Construction Incorporated for the uh, equipment procurement for the Cave Rock water system improvement project. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any, any questions that the board might, may have. Thank you, Mr. Romain. Um, 
Do the commissioners have any questions in regard to this? This is one tough, expensive project. That's all there is to it. And we've, we've got to get it done. Uh, Cave Rock sued the county. The county had been kicking the can down the road for years. Didn't get it done after they took over the water systems. And we've got two more to do after this. I don't think, I don't know. I mean, Mr. Ruane or, or Phil, do you think those projects will be as difficult as this one? Uh, I guess I'll start, Phil, if that's okay. Uh, Ron Roman, engineering manager for the record. Um, I think the Cave Rock system certainly is the most pressing in terms of condition and uh, need for improvements with respect to public health and safety. Uh, the Zephyr Water Utility System um, has some needs. They, a lot of those pipelines were replaced in the early 1990s when the county acquired that system. Um, some of you may be aware that there was a special assessment district that was done at that point in time that funded uh, some of those improvements. Uh, Cave Rock, or um, I'm sorry, Skyland, um, again, those pipes are deficient with respect to some of the water, fire flow requirements, but we don't see the leak problems and leak history in the Skyland area that we, that we certainly see in the Cave Rock area. So Cave Rock is, I think, without, without doubt, the top priority for the improvements of the lake at this point. Thank you very much. The commissioners have any questions or comments? I have a comment, sir. Oh, Commissioner Rice? Having uh, just finished 15 years with the uh, Round Hill General Improvement District, I'm uh, familiar with the problems up there. And um, it's my understanding that uh, the bonding that has taken place with the uh, uh, SFR is, the, is being paid for by the uh, extra assessment that each ratepayer up there has, uh, $20 a month, and that uh, that will be covering uh, much of the cost of this project, which I was very glad to see the the users are going to be the, the payers instead of uh, shifting the, uh, the the load down down the hill. So uh, I'm very much in favor of this project. Uh, having done similar work with the, with the Round Hill General Improvement District uh, to keep us ahead of the curve, it seems like the, the federal government loves throwing curves at you and changing standards and staying, changing uh, uh, what's allowed, what's not allowed. But uh, uh, this uh, facility, when it's, when it's completed, will be state-of-the-art and will serve uh, these uh, areas for many years to come. Thank you, Commissioner Rice. Any other comments or questions? Okay, somebody wanna take this motion forward? Chairman, I'd be more than happy to seeing as how it's in uh, my, my district. I move that we approved, uh, approve $1,719,066 for construction manager at risk contract the Sierra Nevada Construction Incorporated for equipment procurement for the Cave Rock Water System Improvement Project as presented and authorize the county manager or public works director to sign any necessary documents. I second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Okay, well, <laughs> you're Thank welcome. You. Um, let's do this item 10, and then we'll talk about a break. It's 5 o'clock already. This is going to be a long night. <laughs> um, we weren't supposed to do this anymore. Okay, uh, item number 10, for possible action. Discussion to approve the purchase of four sell 14 feet by six foot by 76 foot for a total 304 linear feet precast concrete box culverts from the lowest qualified bidder to supply box culverts for SR 88, 
FEMA flood control project adopt resolution 2021R-020 augmenting the budget and the counter county construction fund in the amount of $350,000 and authorize public works director, county manager to approve the change orders uh, up to 10% of the total purchase price. The engineers estimate for the material of $400,000. Mr. Erb, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board. Um, so, so this project came about in uh, September 2016 when the board accepted uh, federal FEMA grant for flood mitigation uh, measures. Um, it's taken five years, but we finally got to the point where we can uh, uh, get this project on the ground. Uh, about a week and a half ago, I, I advertised two separate projects, uh, one for the fabrication and purchase of the box culverts, and then one uh, for the construction and placement of the culverts. Uh, today, I did open bids for the fabrication and purchase of the culverts. Uh, we had uh, one bid um, uh, for, from uh, Rinker uh, Concrete in the amount of $341,088. And that was well below our engineer's estimate uh, that we had come up with of $410,000 uh, 421 or $410,421 and 58 cents. Um, Ranker did fill out all the appropriate, uh, paperwork and met all the requirements of the bid. Uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Are there any questions from the board? See none. Um, any um, motion? So we have all the bids in, Mr. Herb. Uh, yes, we had three inter interested parties that uh, downloaded the the uh, bid material, but we only had one that uh, felt like they could meet the requirements of the bid, and um, so we had one bid today turned in. So. I did send out a supplemental that should have been sent to you with the recommended motion uh, and everything on it today. Um, I, I haven't seen it. Would you care to share with the commissioners what that amount of that bid was? Um, the amount of high, so the company is called Hydro Condo LLC and in Nevada, they're called Rinker Materials and their bid was for $341,088. Hmm. Okay. Our, engi our engineer's estimate was $410,421.58. All right, Mr. Uh, yeah, Commissioner Gardner. Mr. Herb, this, this is just the, uh, the purchase of the culverts themselves. This is not the cost of installation of those culverts. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Um, so I'll be opening bids for the placement on uh, March 1st, and I'll be presented to the board at the next meeting to accept that bid. Okay. <clears throat> Any further questions or comments? Uh, Phil Ritker, Director of Public Works for the record. Uh, yep. John, I have your recommended, uh, your award recommended, uh, your award letter and recommendation. Do you, do you want me to share that screen so the commissioners see the uh, the motion that's being recommended today? Um, I yeah, that'd be fine. Or I can share it as well. Yeah. Well, I just I just have one additional question for Mr. Erb, and that is, when do we anticipate? Should we approve this particular motion? When does uh, when does the work and anticipated to be started? And how long is it going to take? If, if everything pans out right with the next bid, um, I am um, looking to do a notice proceed by April, around April 1st. And we're hoping to have the project done by the end of uh, May. 
Uh, we want this thing to go as fast as possible because it is in St. Route 88. Uh, they will have, they're not, they're, they won't be allowed to close down the road, um, but it will be down to flagger control during construction. One, one lane uh, will be open with flaggers controlling traffic. Okay, so, so, so 88 is not going to be closed to the public in its entirety, just one lane at a time as we progress through this work? Uh, yes, yeah, so they'll build it half half roadway at a time. Uh, these are sectionals, so they'll just they'll build to the center of the road, uh, re rebuild the road over the top of the box, and then close the other side. Okay. Did, did we get a bid that's seventy thousand dollars less expensive? Um, yes, from the engineer's estimate, yes, we did. And has that been reviewed? Uh, I myself have reviewed the bid as well as uh, um, the uh, uh, legal um, from the DA's office. And that's not in here. We're going with this higher bid. No, this is the low bid. Okay. Any other questions from the commissioners? I mean, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Herb, are you, I take it you're finished? I am, yes, I am finished. And uh, uh, Mr. Richter has put up the uh, the recommended motion. Do, uh, do we require two separate motions then? As, as I see, as I saw your screen, it looked like there was a, a motion to approve the purchase and then also uh, approve the resolution. Am I mistaken on that, Mr. Richter? Uh, Phil Richter, Director of Public Rock, Works for the Record. Yes, uh, there are uh, two motions that are required in this uh, agenda item. Okay. Uh, in that regard, could you put those back up so that I could read them in, in the process of making that motion? <laughs> so I get it into the record correctly? I can do that for you, yes. Uh, Mr. Mr. Ritchie, are we going to have to uh, read this as an action item separately? Uh, Doug Ritchie with the District Attorney's Office. No, the title was read in correctly. Um, you now have additional information that you can uh, include in the motion or motions. Okay, so that <clears throat> this one action item will consolidate both of these items as they are presented, is that correct? This one agenda item, yes, will have two two parts to the motion. Okay. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll I'll make a motion at this time. Okay, Commissioner Gardner. Uh, I move for the approval of the purchase of twenty uh, fourteen by six foot by seventy six foot precast concrete box culverts as specified in the bid document from Hydro Conduit LLC. DBA Rinker materials for a total cost of $341,088 and authorize the public works director or the county manager to sign the contract and approve change orders up to 10% of the purchase price and adopt resolution 2021R-20 augmenting the budget in the county construction fund in the amount of $350,000 from NDOT grant funding. Period. We have a motion. Uh, Commissioner Noasad? Yep. Did you have your hand up? No, I didn't, but I'll raise my hand now. <laughs> yeah, I'll second, I'll second the motion. <laughs> All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is carried 5 0. Thank, Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, it's 5 o'clock. Um, quick Actually, it's 5.30 almost. <laughs> Jeez, it's 5.30. Time flies. <laughs> so much for happy hour. Um, okay, take a minute, 10 minute break. Will that work or you want to keep going? How about 10 minutes? Okay. I, <laughs> I would agree with Mr. Rice. 
All right, we'll be back at 5.35. You got 10 minutes.
And we're missing one commissioner. He's, he's still at Taco Bell ordering the fat, uh, drive yeah. getting dinner. Hmm. Well, let's go ahead. This is for discussion only. Number 11. Discussion to introduce ordinance 2021-1580, an ordinance to amend Title 20, Appendix B of the Douglas County Consolidated Development Code by adopting a revision to the 2018 International Fire Code by adding a new section 903.24.4 or 903.2.4, exempting manufactured homes from requirements to install automatic sprinkler systems if specific conditions are met. Mr. Ritchie, you're up. Thank you, Chairman. Doug Ritchie with the Douglas County District Attorney's Office. As you noted, in April of 2019, the Board of County Commissioners adopted Ordinance 2019-1545 that, along with other things, adopted the 2018 International Fire Code with certain county-specific revisions. Um, it has now been uh, almost two years since that was adopted. Um, there's some additional information on the impacts that has had on the building industry, particularly the manufactured housing industry. Um, we've been working with some of their public comments and there's uh, been a proposal that uh, the county code be revised to allow basically an appeal process so that a cost benefit analysis can occur before the board. As you indicated, this is for introduction only um, if introduced, uh, it will then be published in the newspaper and all the members of the public will know that uh, the board will be considering a possible amendment to the county code regarding uh, these automatic fire sprinklers. I'm happy to answer any questions, but again, this is not for action, it's for introduction. Natalie, are you there? Natalie, did somebody from Tahoe Douglas Fire just call in or? No, but we do have um, Amy Ray on the line. If there's questions, if you had questions, she might be able to help with that. But okay. um, they didn't call in specifically for this one. Okay. Okay. Um, I have some comments, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Gardner, you have the floor. Uh, I. Certainly, uh, living down in uh, the Topaz Ranch Estates, uh, this issue is uh, certainly uh, uh, could be a hot topic down here, so to speak. Um, no pun intended, uh, fire standards. But uh, anyways, uh, I've read this and uh, the section uh, 903.2 were required and some of these uh, exemptions for manufactured homes. Uh, the first one saying the manufactured home has less than 5,000 square feet of livable space. Um, quite honestly, I've never seen a, a manufactured home of 5,000 5, square feet to begin with. Um, that, that's, that's really a very, very large manufactured home uh, in today's standards. Uh, I don't believe uh, Clayton Homes or those folks that are involved in that even get into that type of, uh, of, of structure. Um, it also says that uh, A or two, the purchaser of the manufactured home declines in writing to the seller to have an automatic sprinkler system installed. And then of course, there's also the, the benefits uh, the, the, uh, or the cost analysis that's involved in this. Um, uh, this uh, this uh, uh, allows an appeal process, and and uh, we can address each of these issues as they come forward to us. Should somebody fall into this category, so um, uh, uh, this is discussion only. But uh, certainly, uh, I can see the benefits of, of this particular adjustment to uh, the ordinance. So, in Title Twenty, so. 
I know that we'll hopefully have uh, this come forward to the board uh, in an adoptable uh, manner. And at that time, hopefully we'll also have public comment so they can, uh, can uh, weigh in on this issue as well. So anyways, thank you. Any other comments? Mr. Ritchie, any further comments? I mean, these items to get the stuff made, so. No, sir, thank you. All right. Commissioner? Yes. Natalie, what's the record? I did um, misspeak. We do have Todd Stroop from Tahoe Douglas Fire. He does have comments. Um, okay. I, I don't know if he, I think he did provide public comment in the beginning, but he does have his hand raised if you would. All right, bring them in. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Todd Stroop, Tahoe Douglas Fire. Uh, just to let you know, myself and uh, Fire Marshal Ray from East Fork are available uh, if you do have questions for us regarding this agenda item. Uh, Commissioner Gardner, in regard to the 5,000 square feet, this was part of the fire code and, and it was instituted in regard to uh, greater to be spread. This is done, I don't know, time last year. Anyway, that's where that came from. So that's all I know about that in regard to this topic. Anybody have any further questions or comments? So if, if we, <clears throat> excuse me, if we pass this, it would only affect a manufactured home greater than 5,000 square feet. Is that correct? No. No, oh, they would be exempt. I'm sorry, Doug. I stepped okay. on you. <clears throat> Chairman, if, I may. if we don't pass this, then anything over 5,000 square feet manufactured would have to have sprinklers installed. Th that is correct. I if such a thing existed, I don't know if they do, but yes. <laughs> I've, I've never seen one, but <laughs> what do I know? Any further discussion? All right, moving on. This is gonna be a big one, folks. And item number 12, for possible action, discussion regarding a regulatory framework for the Vacation Home Rentals VHR program, including a presentation on the work of the VHR task force and the county manager's recommendations and to provide direction to the county manager on future VHR regulation which may include a temporary moratorium on the issuance of new VHR permits, a possible cap on the total number of VHR permits that may be issued and other recommendations. So this is open for public comment. Uh, I have, I have a, a list of additional items from the county manager and uh sir would you like me to give my presentation first yeah please go ahead i'm sorry okay let me get this going here just give me one second Second, sorry about that. Try this again. Share screen. Okay. Start slideshow. Okay, can everybody see that? Why 
Why is it not showing? Hang on a second. It's showing the next slides. Bear with me one moment. Sorry about this. I've done this a hundred times. I'm not sure why I'm <laughs> not doing this right. Hang on a second. Can you guys see the full presentation now? No. No. What is wrong here? She whiz. This is my first rodeo. What am I doing here? Well, call Natalie. <laughs> Come on. Slide. Oh, now he's been asked for a new computer, John. <laughs> Very agenda item. Mr. Um, County Manager, would it be helpful if I began by uh, providing the board with some background information on this topic while you try to pull up your presentation? Sure, sure. Good evening, um, Commissioners. Jennifer Davidson, Assistant County Manager for the record. Can everyone hear me okay? I'm uh, tuning in for my home office. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're good. Charlie, working good, Nick. Jennifer. Great. Thank you for your patience with me. I do have an audience member of one toddler. So if you hear a baby in the background, I do uh, beg your forgiveness. <laughs> Currently she's um, calling Dada. <laughs> uh, background information on vacation home rentals. Vacation home rentals has been um, a hot topic for Douglas County for a number of years. Um, we have had the Douglas County code, um, the vacation home rental ordinance in place. It looks like the perfect timing. Uh, the presentation has loaded. Patrick, do you want to take over or do you want me to continue? Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead. <coughs> okay. All right. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, I know we have a lot of ground here to cover. I will give a very brief background. Uh, at the last meeting, uh, Jennifer Davidson gave a, a really good overview of, of the current VHR program and some of the history on that. So I will jump to uh, 2019 when the board provided direction to create a VHR task force to make recommendations to me uh, to consider making recommendations to the board. Um, that may sound a little circuitous, but the purpose of that was so that the task force uh, was a body appointed by me and not a public body. Uh, therefore, it allowed them to meet without uh, complying with the open meeting law because they're not appointed by a public body. Uh, that was considered advantageous so that there could be frank and fair conversations uh, on the topic. It's a very contentious topic, as you know, and uh, we wanted to make sure there was really good input on this uh, for the process. Um, the task force was composed of 15 diverse stakeholders. Uh, there were 11 lake and valley residents uh, that served on the task force, and there were four reps, uh, one each from the two chambers and the two visitors authorities. Um, I, I think it represented a very good, diverse group of the community. Um, the, the task force work was co coordinated by Assistant County Manager Jennifer Davidson uh, with support staff from Community Development, the Sheriff's Office, uh, Taco Douglas, and East Fork Fire Districts. Um, the task force had numerous meetings for almost a year, um, multiple, multiple meetings, <clears throat> many hours. They considered <clears throat> a wide variety of aspects. They looked at other jurisdictions. They looked at best practices. I cannot overemphasize the amount of time this group put into studying this issue to try to bring forward the best recommendations that they could. Um, and, and I think it is um, 
impressive that a group that large and that diverse was able to coalesce around these recommendations uh, with near universal support. There was a little bit of uh, dissent, but by and large, they all uh, were in agreement with these recommendations. And I think that's important for the board to keep in mind um, uh, when you consider these, uh, just the amount of work that went into it um, and how diverse the group was. <clears throat> in addition to that, there was also a technical advisory group uh, that looked at the task force recommendations and provided some further input to me. Um, in October, uh, I brought forward the county manager's report, which is in your package, and hopefully you've all had the opportunity to look at. And then um, we didn't get any regulations in place uh, with the old board, but we did get approval for two code enforcement officers, uh, which we are uh, very grateful to have. That's a very critical piece to this program uh, to have proper enforcement. Uh, so I'm going to jump right into the 10 recommendations that are in the report. Uh, what I want to do is kind of give an overview of each of those 10 recommendations, and then I will come back to them and, uh, uh, and then we can have some discussion on them. Uh, so the uh, number one recommendation was to establish a cap on vac vacation home rentals in the Tahoe Township. Uh, the recommendation from the task force was to set the cap at 725 permits. Um, that amount, 725 permits, was determined after many task force meetings. They had several meetings to come around to this recommendation. It was set basically with an objective to have 13% of the housing units at the Tahoe Township potentially be VHRs, um, so it wouldn't dominate residential areas. Um, and, and also, uh, at the time they were looking at this, which is getting close to a year now um, since they did this work, there were more licensed VHRs in Douglas County than we have currently. So this also took into account the then currently licensed VHRs, as well as a little bit more to hopefully capture VHRs that were operating without permits. Um, so that was the intent and that was kind of the parameters that they, that they looked at. Um, I think this is a very important recommendation. I, I think it should be enacted as soon as possible. Um, I recommend that the uh, VHR, that the ban on VHRs outside of the Tahoe Township um, continue um, until such time as uh, um, new regulations are put in place. Um, the task force did recommend opening up VHRs in the East Fork Township, um, and they recommended a cap of 200. Uh, I think we need to get the program on an even keel in Tahoe. Uh, before it is expanded to the rest of the, the township. Um, the problem with uh, keeping the, the uh, ban in the Tahoe town, or excuse me, in the East Fork township uh, is that uh, we know there is some unpermitted activity going on out in, in, outside of the Tahoe township, and it would be good to bring them in a regulatory framework, but um, I, I don't think we're ready for that. I think we need to shore up this program where it currently is, exists before the board considers expanding it. Uh, recommendation number three is to adopt a tiered permit system. Currently, there is basically one type of permit for all VHRs, uh, regardless of how they operate. Um, the recommendations from the task, for task force broke, it, broke VHRs into three different tiers. Tier one is what they call a true host VHR. This is where the owner or a manager is on premise uh, at, the, at the vacation home rental and they have no more than two visitors. So that's basically somebody that owns their home that is renting out a room. Um, the recommendation from the task force is that uh, tier one VHRs be exempt from the cap. Um, they recognize that there's very little impact, if any, to communities of a homeowner renting out a single room with one or two people. Um, that, that seems like that has the least amount of impact on the community. Uh, tier two would be considered a standard permit. That would be a v VHR license to have up to 10 visitors. Uh, tier three would be a large occupancy VHR. That is for uh, visitors uh, over 10 visitors. Um, sometimes those are considered party houses where they tend to have uh, a lot of people there. Those tend to have the most um, disruption to communities and where we tend to get a, a lot of complaints. <clears throat> um, the numbers, 10 visitors, that threshold, that came from the technical advisory group. 
Um, the task force recommended a little bit larger limits, but we, uh, the, we skinnied that down uh, with my recommendations. Um, tier three permits would re also require uh, notice to neighborhoods before they were issued, um, and they'd be subject to additional requirements regarding noise monitoring and uh, being operated by a licensed property manager. <laughs> There also are disclosure requirements that are recommended uh, for the application process for vacation home uh, rentals regarding HOAs and general improvement districts. They may have a home located in an HOA, HOA a general improvement district. We want to know that and we want some assurance for them that it's allowed under the uh, provisions of those entities. Um, you might think that's pretty easy to figure out who the HOAs are, but there's not. There's a lot of HOAs. We contacted the state to try to get a list of all HOAs in Douglas County, and they don't have a current list. Some HOAs are very active, some are kind of defunct. Um, so that's a little bit of a challenge for us to coordinate that, but we do think it's important that in the regulatory framework, we're making sure they're at least attesting that they're compliant with their own HOA or GID uh, rules. Uh, recommendations four and five regard parking, noise, and health and safety issues. This is really the area where we get a lot of complaints from the public. Um, those recommendations include, uh, there are several of them, I'm just highlighting some of the more significant ones, uh, life safety inspections at application and at renewal. Uh, VHRs would also be subject to unscheduled life safety inspections. Um, and they could be subject to permit suspension if they failed any of those inspections. Uh, there's also a, a recommendation to impose insurance requirements, a minimum of $500,000 that would recover not only the VHR owner, but renters as well. Uh, and there would be a requirement for them to designate a 24 seven responsible party that would be required to respond to any complaints within 30 minutes. And there are also requirements for parking. They have to have on-site parking and that designated parking uh, is limited and it would be no more than uh, four visitors per space. So depending on the size of your VHR, how many visitors you're licensed for, that would control how many on-site parking spaces you'd have to provide. Parking is a huge issue for neighborhoods with VHRs. Uh, also, quiet hour enforcements, uh, basically from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. is the recommendation that those would be requirements that would be enforced as well. Um, and also uh, noise monitors. So if a VHR had repeat uh, complaints about noise, uh, they could be required to uh, have noise monitors installed to monitor the amount of noise. And if they're a tier three permit, we would require them all to have noise monitoring equipment. Um, again, I think these are very solid recommendations to get at some of the issues that uh, communities complain most about. Recommendation number six, trash. Uh, trash must be managed pursuant to appropriate authority. There's different authorities that handle trash. Basically, we want them to have mandatory trash. Um, trash, trash violations would count as a VHR permit violation. So if they didn't take care of the trash, that, that would also... Um, give them a ding on their permit and, um, and they'd be subject to forfeiture of their permit. Um, mandatory bear boxes in the Tahoe Township. That's my recommendation. The uh, task force recommend encouraging bear boxes, but not requiring them. Um, uh, I think they're very important, particularly in Lake Tahoe, uh, particularly for visitors who tend to be less knowledgeable about living in bear country. Uh, that's probably a little bit of my own bias from my Department of Wildlife days, but it's a huge issue in the basin. And I think if they're going to have these privileged uh, permits, uh, they ought to be responsible and make sure their visitors are as well. Recommendation number seven, formation of a, an advisory board. Uh, VHR appeals and advisory board. Uh, I think that's important to maintain a public voice in the process. Basically, the uh, they would do two things. Their primary purpose would be to hear appeals from VHR uh, operators. So if their permit was denied or they were fined or something like that, they would have this body to come to on appeal. I think that's important for this board because without this body, um, uh, they would be looking to come to the Board of County Commissioners to appeal that. And um, I'm not sure this body wants to take up their time with that, that kind of business. 
Um, the advisory board could also serve to provide input on future VHR regulations to the board. Um, it should be like the task force composed of diverse stakeholders and there should be representatives from both the lake and the valley and there should, it also should be staffed with some ex officio non-voting members um, from, from the county or the fire districts um, to help guide their work. Recommend num recommendation number eight regards education. Uh, we wanna create a VHR compliance education certification program that any VHR owner or their designated uh, responsible party uh, would be required to, uh, to take that course uh, for permitting. Um, uh, what this is modeled after a program in El Dorado County, we think this is very important to ensure that VHR owners understand all their rule, the rules and their responsibilities. Uh, the public information program as well, so that the public understands how VHRs work. Um, a good neighbor flyer, so people in the neighborhood are aware that there are VHRs there and how they can deal with that if they do have a problem or complaints, and frequency, frequently asked questions for them to reference, um, and also to provide that info to renters as well. I think it's very important that people that rent VHRs need to know and understand the rules. And we would recommend making that a requirement of VHR permitting that the owners provide that information to their renters. Recommendations nine and 10 uh, involve fees and staffing. Uh, the recommendations from the task force, which I wholeheartedly agree with, is that the VHR program should pay for itself. Permit fees should fund the program. Uh, we don't think that uh, room taxes should be used for administration of the VHR program. We want the permits to pay for that. Um, in terms of fines, fines are all well and good, but uh, I don't see fines as a revenue source. That's, uh, that's, that's a way to bring compliance, and uh, we shouldn't rely on those to fund the program. We want the permit fee schedule to fund the program. Uh, current enforcement efforts are widely recognized to be inadequate. Um, historically, we've had one and a half uh, positions um, allocated uh, to enforcement for VHRs. Um, the board approved two code enforcement officers in December, so that really ups uh, our enforcement capabilities compared to what we've had. Uh, those positions have been approved. We're very close to board bringing those two people online. They're at the final stages of uh, background checks, and hopefully they'll be working soon. Uh, the original proposal uh, that I made was to add three new positions, an admin assistant to take care of paperwork and the administrative functions. That allows the code enforcement officers to stay in the field more. Um, a code enforcement officer, which I already approved two, or the prior board approved two, uh, as well as a deputy sheriff. So the sheriff's office could have an additional resource to allocate time to deal with uh, parking and noise complaints after hours at these VHRs. It's really a proper role for the sheriff's office. The sheriff has uh, basically two officers dedicated to the Tahoe Basin currently, and, um, and they often get called away for uh, more high level calls, dealing in the casino corridor or whatever, and it's difficult for them to allocate the resources. Uh, so the kind of direction that I'm looking for, um, I'm hoping we can all, you can all discuss the, the 10 recommendations, um, obviously, as well as any other uh, ideas that you have. Um, I'm looking for you to direct me to bring back draft ordinances or resolutions for consideration of the board um, to enact these recommendations at a future meeting. Um, and that you would direct me to bring back budget items as part of the FY21-22 budget review where that's applicable. That mainly pertains to staffing and educational programs. Um, and uh, direct me to bring back draft ordinances or resolutions to enact any other provisions deemed appropriate. Um, I'm sure you uh, all have some ideas. The agenda is written to consider a moratorium. I know there are some uh, commissioners interested in a, having a temporary moratorium until we put some of these regulations in place. Um, I'm not recommending that. I don't think it's a bad idea, but I think if we move quickly to enact regulations, a moratorium is probably not necessary. Um, I think we can move fast enough to put these things in place. Um, 
And then I'll go to my final slide that kind of highlights all of the uh, recommendations. And, um, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to the board for discussion. Jennifer, was there anything uh, you wanted to add? Uh, thank you, sir. No, I think you covered everything. I am available to answer any questions and I just would add my comments um, and thanks to members of the task force. Um, I am noting that many of them are um, attending this meeting um, tonight and probably have some comments for your consideration under public comments as well. Natalie, do we have public comments? Yes, Natalie Wood for the record. I have six individuals that would like to provide public comment. Um, and then if anyone else would like to that hasn't raised their hand, please raise your hand and I will start going through the list. We'll start with Scott Willard. Scott, are you there? Let's go on to the next one and Scott may come in uh, subsequent to that. Okay, we'll go with Chris Larson. <clears throat> yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yep, go ahead and start and I'll start your five minutes. Thank you. Um, commissioners, my name is Chris Larson and um, just as Commissioner Rice, I'm a full-time resident and homeowner here in the Round Hill neighborhood here at the lake. Um, first, I wanna thank the county manager and assistant manager as well as, as the task force for the I think nearly two years they put into finding solutions um, to this issue. Um, now's the time to act though. Um, two years is too long Been kicking the can down the road. And I think it's time, time to um, put some stuff on paper. A um, little background on me. I have two young children, ages two and five. And fortunately we live at the end of a street here in Round Hill where our kids can play in the street just as I did. And you guys probably did when you were kids, if you had streets back then. Fortunately, we do not have any VHRs on our street, but we do have several behind us. And every so often they are up all night, consequently keeping us uncomfortable in our own home um, during mostly the summertime. Not all are bad apples. And I will say that there are some management companies that actually do a very good job of keeping these in check. Few and far between though. Um, the issues of VHRs is obviously a challenging one for all of us. Uh, with the implementation of Measure T on the California side of South Lake Tahoe, permits in the city are now currently being or not being renewed and the supply of VHRs is dwindling and that inevitably is pushing VHRs over to our side of town on the Nevada side. I personally believe in preserving individual property rights, but I also feel that zoning laws need to be enforced. The million dollar question in this whole thing is, is a VHR a business? And does it require such applicable permits? The answer to that question is essential. And if the answer is yes, then this conversation is easily ended as most, if not all, violate residential zoning laws. If the answer is no, then this conversation continues. As for immediate action that I think can be taken today, in fact, tonight, I feel that there needs to be a hard freeze immediately on any new VHR permits until the proposed task force can prove with results that they can, can successfully enforce the rules that are being proposed and that are already in place. This program, if enacted, needs to pay for itself as proposed by the, the uh, city man or the town manager and in no way be funded by the taxpayers. Fines need to be substantial and there needs to be a three strikes and you're out rule or something similar. Bear boxes should also be absolutely mandatory. I also think that if illegal VHRs are caught operating, that they should have absolutely no chance ever unless sold to another person to apply for a permit. They have had their fair warning to play by the rules and they should never have a second chance to get involved in the fair play. Um, thank you for your time. And I look forward to seeing some actionable steps taken tonight. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, I'll try Scott again. Scott, can you unmute yourself? Okay, 
Okay, I'll move on to um, Benjamin Harmon. Yes, hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. we can. Well, thank you, commissioners. This is Ben Harmon from State Line for the record. I have two comments on agenda item 12 for vacation home rentals. My first comment addresses is the uh, current issuing of permits. Many of the challenges in addressing BHR problems in Tahoe Township require adequate enforcement. Thanks to your board, progress is being made on this. It will take time to get enforcement related issues under control, but there's one area where you have complete control right now, the issuance of permits. Recommendation number two from the county manager in the agenda states, delay implementations of VHRs outside the Tahoe Township until all regulations have been put in place. The reasoning behind this is sound. It should also apply to the issuing of new permits in Tahoe Township. I urge the board to impose a moratorium on new permits in Tahoe Township until all regulations, boards, education mechanisms, and so forth have been put into place. And most critically, the ability to enforce the regulations has been proven effective. Let's not add more fuel until we've got the fire under control. My second comment addresses zoning and VHR density. The task force and the technical advisory group recognized that not all VHRs are created equal and recommended a three-tier permitting system to reflect this, but they stopped short of suggesting that this system be used to control the location of higher tier properties. I think it can and should. The problem with VHRs in the Tahoe Township isn't that they exist. The problem is where they are located, interspersed with single family homes and residential neighborhoods. In my view, high turnover, high occupancy, fully commercial enterprises should be prohibited in area zone residential. I appreciate the challenges with retroactively imposing zoning restrictions on a practice that has been in place for many years. So if that isn't possible at the current time, then at a minimum, restrictions should be placed on the number of permits issued in a given area for high tier VHRs and the proximity of those high tier VHRs to existing high tier VHRs. As the county manager stated during his presentation today, the intent of the cap on the number of VHRs was to ensure the VHRs don't overwhelm local neighborhoods, but it clearly does not accomplish that objective. In my immediate neighborhood, some 15% of properties are already tier two or three VHRs. Another 15% of the remaining properties are on the market. Today, there is nothing stopping all of those properties from becoming high tier VHRs. If that happens, fully 30% of our neighborhood becomes VHRs. This is a snowball in motion. The more VHRs in a neighborhood, the less desired, excuse me, the less desirable those neighborhoods become for the long-term residents that are your constituents. When they move out, the process of replacement accelerates. Please don't let this continue. If we can't use zoning for its intended purpose, then at a minimum, please consider using the permitting process to control density and proximity of VHRs. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Okay, next we have Stephen. Stephen, are you there? Not answer, let's go. Yeah, he was able to unmute himself. Stephen, are you trying to speak? Okay, we'll move on to the next one. We have David Stewart. Hello, can you uh, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Great. Um, well, thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you, uh, commissioners, and I appreciate the work that the task force has done over the past couple of years. I've also enjoyed listening to the last uh, few hours and learning a lot more about the inner workings of Douglas <laughs> County and the hard work that everyone does. Uh, and uh, I'll note, uh, for the record, I, I'm a speaker of Portuguese and, uh, and Spanish. So if you need any translation between those two, I'm happy to, uh, happy to raise my hand and help out with that. 
Um, Obrigado. <laughs> um, de nada. Um, so the uh, I'm I'm a full time resident with with my family um, in in the Tahoe uh, district, and uh, I just wanted to um, you know say that I think that that what was presented here is a is a step forward in terms of these proposals, um, but it it. I agree with the previous commenters. I think it's insufficient in some ways in my mind. And in particular, I think a lot of the pressure is coming from the changes just over the, and over the last year and what we're gonna be seeing over the next year from the impact of South Lake Tahoe, putting in a much more restrictive uh, banning of the vast majority of short-term rentals and not renewing those permits, which is as, as another commenter mentioned, is gonna put a lot more pressure on VHRs um, both permitted and not permitted in, in Douglas County. So first, having a cap, I think, is, is going to be really important and better enforcement very soon as this pressure rises. Um, but I also think that um, we need to realize what the, recognize the impact that it's having on the community. Um, you know, we've had declining school enrollments uh, in, in, in the schools up here at Zephyr Cove uh, uh, Elementary and at Whittle. And, um, and I think it's, it's because of this vicious cycle that we're in, where it's tough for families to, to live in, in a community if there are VHRs next door that uh, are really taking away from that sense of community and impacting the quality of life. And I personally think that 13% um, of, of the properties is too many, especially understanding that some areas and some HOAs are trying to camp, clamp down on it, which means that they'll be even more in other places unless it's restricted further. Um, I also wanted to put in a question about the um, advisory uh, board having representation from, from Valley folks. I mean, I guess I, I can understand how, you know, this is a county issue, but it's primarily an issue for Tahoe Township and the negative impacts of this are really felt more by Tahoe Township. Um, I think it's, you know, unfortunate that there's you know, so much conservatism in terms of allowing VHRs um, in, in the Valley and, and even the proposed cap when it would be allowed is so much lower despite there being more housing there. And so much of the impact is being borne by, uh, by the Tahoe community and the relatively uh, small number of, smaller number of homes that are there. So I just would, would ask that, uh, that the commissioners and, and everyone really takes it to consideration the impact of the quality of life. Try to imagine if one of your, if you have a family and one of your neighbors is, is instead of being an, an, an actual family and people who are vested in the community is a VHR with a constant revolving door where every time it's roulette, whether they're going to be uh, issues with the people who are, who are coming in, um, whether they'll be thoughtful or not. And um, I would ask that a moratorium be an absolute minimum at this point to see how the impacts of the South Lake Tahoe um, ban um, on, on short-term rentals in the vast majority of, of that city impacts uh, on the other side of the, of the state line. And, uh, and also I would ask that we consider um, a, small, a lower cap than 725. I think 13% is just too much for, for a community um, of our size. Thank you. Okay, thank you, David. Um, we'll try Stephen again. Yes, can you? Yeah, I think I picked it up. You got me? Go. Yeah. Gotcha, buddy. That's exciting. Hey, um, my name is Stephen Shiner. I live over at Tahoe Beach Club. And uh, we moved in there thinking that it was gonna be a private community and it has really uh, not turned out to be a private community and it looks like it's gonna to continue to uh, get worse. And, you know, right above me, there's a six bedroom uh, unit that actually has two kitchens, which violates another rule, but um, they've had up to 22 people. So you know, enforcing this, I, I did file a complaint with Tower Beach Club. I understand I need to unfortunately bother the sheriff in the next case that, you know, these things happen. But when you talk about four people per uh, car, the maximum that unit has is two cars. And the regulation says, I believe, two per bedroom plus one, there's six bedrooms. So I think it comes out to like 16. Uh, that would be four cars. So there's no place to park them. 
the HOA is controlled by the Tahoe Beach Club development, and they are allowing, you know, without restriction, people to continue to um, get BHR permits. Um, and I can see us way over 13%. I don't know if there's any restriction that would uh, enable us to be at 13% of course, if it's 725 across, which my understanding right now is that there's like 600 permits out and over 1,100 uh, BHRs being rented out, uh, you know, without um, permits. So I believe that the moratorium, we really need to lock down, load the mo moratorium in right now. And then uh, as you guys, which it sounds like you really have done a lot of work to get to where you're at, but it, um, things move slowly and you don't have the enforcement people yet, it would really help to um, get the moratorium locked down now and then work on the enforcement, getting the 1100 down to 600, 700, and then making sure that uh, clusters like the Tahoe Beach Club don't end up with 30% uh, permits over the people you know, right now there's 46 residents going to 143 and the majority of the 46 don't want anything to do with uh, VHRs. They want a private community, which is what everybody kind of bought into. So um, I would appeal to you to please uh, get the moratorium in place and then uh, get all the things going so that we can get our hands around this and appreciate all the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, next. Hello, uh, my name is Jochen Vandermeulen. I'm a homeowner at Tahoe Village for since uh, 2008. Um, I'm heavily affected by a neighbor who constantly Airbnbs his place. Um, Unfortunately, I'm not really well prepared tonight, but I uh, hope it's not too late to give written input at some point. Um, but again, I'm, I'm suffering for years and my quality of life has gone down the drain. Um, even just uh, doing uh, the meeting here while I was uh, listening in, um, I had to complain to my neighbor again because there's heavily marijuana, marijuana users in, in his unit and uh, my, my bedroom smells like that I can't sleep in there tonight. Um, but just really quick, um, I think uh, restriction of the numbers of VHRs and strict enforcement is vital. Um, what I was missing in the recommendations is uh, that there is no tight alignment with South Lake Tahoe. You know, it can't be that California side is under a stay at home order now under COVID and hosts were continuing short term rentals on the Nevada side, uh, even though there was a mandatory 14 day quarantine, it was said. Um, and then a second, uh, the other speaker's comments, uh, now that Measure T goes into effect, it will increase demand on the, in the Tao Township um, and on the Nevada side. And that is something that is really to take into consideration. Um, and then the, the last thing that I wanna say real quick, uh, that uh, it needs to be make sure that VHR operators do take complaints seriously. I don't know how many times I complained to Air, Airbnb and they don't take that seriously. <clears throat> and I can write a book about Airbnb renters, you know, from, from urinating off the deck to puke and, 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 uh, and, and uh, garbage on, on stairs uh, around the house, um, you know, and, and anything in between. It is really bad. So, um, yeah, I would like to give uh, some more and well thought out uh, input in, in written form if that's okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have Dennis. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, we can. Fantastic. Uh, thank you guys for your hard work during this. I know this is a very touchy subject here. Um, I just wanted to uh, state uh, Chairman Ingalls, members of the commission, I'm Dennis McDuffie. I'm a realtor with Intero Real Estate Services, a resident of Douglas County, and we have a a house up in Zephyr Cove. I'm here today on behalf of the Sierra Nevada Realtors. We've also submitted written comments for the record. Vacation rental regulations 
uh, are not specific realtor issues, but it's a private property right issue. And a homeowner should have the right to own, sell, or rent their property. And the Sierra Nevada realtors support the existing codes and the ordinances in place that address the misuse of the property, such as parking, noise, and trash. We do not support nor defend bad tenants or neighbors, regardless who owns or rents. We thank you and the county staff for including Sierra Nevada Realtors on the Vacation Home Task Force to provide viewpoints on private property rights. We'd like to point out some of our main concerns. Cap rates, I mean caps and limits on permits. Capping of short-term rentals affects the transfer of properties in many ways, as you know. Caps, are, caps will create commodities. Uh, they will affect lending. They can violate 1031 exchanges. Uh, caps were not supported by multiple members of the Vacation Home Task Force. So why go through the process of placing a cap when a permit numbers are decreasing? Creating a moratorium on permits was not the recommendation of the Vacation Home Task Force. Limits uh, will result in less revenue for the county. Establishing uh, a moratorium could lead to lawsuits for many, for, for limiting one, one's property rights. Sierra Nevada Realtors continue to support each property owner having the right to rent out their property if they choose, regardless of which party, part of the county they live in. With the enhanced new uh, enforcement, Sierra Nevada Realtors fully supports our efforts increasing the enforcement, enforcement officers to address the nuisance complaints. As previously mentioned, we do not support bad actors, whether they're tenants or homeowners. Sierra Nevada Realtors are opposed to any efforts to caps or to stop the issuance of short-term rental permits issued in or by the county. We urge you to consider waiting to see if fully staffed enforcement teams helps alleviate the community concerns before limiting one's private property rights. Thank you guys very much for your time today. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Um, we'll go to Natalie. Hello, thank you, Chairman and County Commissioners. My name is Natalie Ganish. I live at 425 Andrea Drive in State Line, Nevada. I'm giving a call to uh, speak in opposition to a cap or limitation on the number of short-term rental permits and on a moratorium on the issuance of new permits. I was a member of the Douglas County VHR Task Force Did we lose her? Oh, yeah. Let's see. Sorry about that, Natalie. Hi, I'm sorry. Where, where, where did I leave you? Just in a couple sentences or? Yeah, if you want to start over. Sorry. Yeah, so um, I'm... My name's Natalie Yanish. I'm speaking in opposition to a cap or limitation on the number of short-term rental permits and on a moratorium on the issuance of new permits. I was a member of the Douglas County VHR Task Force, and in deliberations in our meetings, there was consensus that a moratorium on the issuing of permits was not recommended for a number of reasons. The moratorium does not create effective policy. It is kicking the can because it does not address any actual nuisance issues. Um, Douglas County already has strict ordinances and fines in place for those who are breaking the rules. Similarly, a cap on permits does not solve any nuisance ordinances. The number of short-term rentals is not the issue. It's the small amount of bad actors and the lack of enforcement of the current rules. There's a natural attrition rate of about 15% permits uh, not being renewed each year. So tinkering or creating a finite resource or commodity by limiting the supply of available permits will result in unintended consequences, um, much like we saw over in the city of South Lake Tahoe when they first started talking about a moratoriums and a cap. Um, there was a run on permits for those who were trying to protect their private property rights, regardless of whether or not they intended to use them for the purpose of a short-term rental. At the Douglas County Commissioner's meeting in November, um, Chairman Engels pointed out that the issue is enforcement. Staff is just now being put into place per the last commissioner's direction to hire deputized or community officers with authority to effectively deal with nuisance complaints and more administrative staff. So why not let that solve the problem instead of trying to limit private property rights? 
Many owners who own short-term rentals do not have problem properties. It is inequitable to allow some owners to get a permit, but not others by choosing an arbitrary cap or number. I live on top of Kingsbury grade. You know, we have visitors in Lake Tahoe. We have always been a resort community and a recreation community. I live nearby VHRs. In my opinion, everyone, whether it be someone at a house for one day or for 20 years should follow the law. Um, and just to give you a little side story, my side street used to have a long-term primary resident and it was owner occupied. Um, that house was a huge nuisance with ordinance problems, trash and parking noise. Um, when that owner moved out and sold to a new owner, uh, he turned it into a vacation rental property and that seemed to solve a lot of problems on our street. Um, the new owners invested and fixed up the property. They remodeled it. Um, and, you know, we have visitors who come in and out of our community. They seem very happy. They're only there for a few days at a time. Um, I'm sure they spend a lot of money in town and they're generating TOT tax and sales tax into the county coffers. The owners who are, have VHRs are paying the same property taxes um, and, you know, they generally use less county resources. So I would hope that the commissioners would take that into consideration. Um, I noticed that many of the public comments that were submitted were from a few of the properties that are, or uh, properties located in HOA areas, uh, specifically at Tahoe Beach Club and also in Lake Ridge. Um, those are HOAs. So those properties uh, owners actually do have the right to, if they wanted to, um, you know, create more restrictive rules on VHRs within their CCNRs. Um, and those could be more restrictive than Douglas County ordinances. So they do have the um, authority if they wanted to uh, limit what was going on within those specific small areas to do so. So again, I ask that the commissioners not consider a moratorium or a cap, um, but rather continue to get some data on how the new enforcement is working and give the new staffing structure time to solve problems rather than making unnecessary rules and taking away owners' private property rights. Um, finally, a moratorium creates a taking. So um, it deprives property owners of use of their investment, which degrades the value of their property. Hey, Natalie, that's five minutes. And I will complete this by saying um, this type of policy could put Douglas County in a position of liability and subject to lawsuits by harmed property owners. I appreciate your time and consideration. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Um, next. We'll go to Jim Slade. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, Jim Slade. Um, I support the comments of the first five speakers, even though I don't know any of them, uh, but not so much the last two speakers, both realtors, who suggested that operating a business in a residential neighborhood is, is a right. I don't believe that to be true. My main comment is that I would hope that existing full-time res residents are given more consideration than the desire of part-term, part-time residents to profit from their, the business they operate on their property in residential neighborhoods. One key to that is strict enforcement of regulations, especially regarding noise and parking, and that substantial fines be levied on any violations with increasing fines for repeat offenders. Overall, I support the recommendations of the task force and the county managers, um, including a ban on uh, VHRs outside of the Tahoe Township, pending further review, a limit on the number of uh, VHRs, uh, perhaps even including a temporary moratorium, uh, mandatory bear-proof trash containers, and that the VHR program should be self-funding. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jim. Um, moving on to Chris. I actually commented earlier, but I didn't use all three minutes. I don't know if I have another minute to, to uh, just add to that. Um, typically you only get one period per section. Did you provide it during this section or was it opening public comment? 
I was I was one of the first opening commenters. The first on, one on this. First on this one. Yeah, I just uh, wanted Chris, to. Add we're, to we're, Chris, we're going to have to beg your indulgence. We've got to move on. Fair enough. Okay, and then I have Steve with his hand up again, but we already called on him. Um, Scott Willard, um, he has not been able to unmute himself or call back in. Um, let's see. Anyone else wanted wanting to provide public comment? Commissioner Angles? Yes. <coughs> Want to go discussion with the board? Yeah, Natalie, there's no more comments coming in. Um, Stephen keeps raising his hand, but he already gave public comment. Um, I could see if maybe he has a second person there that's trying to give public comment from him. If you guys are okay with checking that out. <laughs> yes, it's not Stephen. Okay, um, so state your name for the record. Tim Barabee. I live at Tahoe Beach Club, and I'd like to address Natalie's comments. Uh, and could you spell your name before you start? Sure. B-A-R-A-B-E. Okay. Thank you. Tahoe Beach Club has an HOA that's controlled by the developer. So the residents who want SDRs and VHRs eliminated can make no changes. We currently have roughly 10 STRs out of 46 units, so over 20%. No one discussed density. Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Cates did not discuss density. I would like the commissioners to consider density, number one. I'd also like to have a moratorium uh, on the lake in total because anybody who was up here this summer would realize what a problem we have up here. Uh, in terms of, of uh, VHRs affecting the, the quality of, of life up here, uh, we talked about water for three hours today. We've got massive water problems in Douglas County. VHRs don't make it easier, for sure not. But I think something that hasn't been brought up by anybody is the issue of our workforce. So we've got a bunch of people up here working who cannot find rental properties because of VHRs. VHRs have driven up the prices. They, they're destroying neighborhoods and they're actually displacing our workforce. We've got plenty of hotels for people to stay at. We don't need VHRs. I realize that individuals have property rights, but I have property rights too. And I shouldn't have to put up with 20% of my development being VHRs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I'm gonna try Scott Willard one more time. Okay, it doesn't look like he's able, able to unmute himself. Okay, we're gonna move on. We're gonna close public comment. I do have another person that raised their hand, someone new. Okay. Oh, and they logged off. All right, we're gonna close public comment and bring it to the, the board of commissioners. Do the commissioners have any comments? I got a lot of comments. If you would indulge with me, I've been pretty quiet today. <laughs> okay, okay. I want to make a few comments with respect to um, the um, report of the task force and the presentation that was made. And then I want to make a few comments on some of the suggestions I have received from the numerous emails we have from the different residents in uh, our, our county, which I'm sure all of you have had. And then I'll close with what I think would be the best, uh, the, a good motion. Uh, the task force is quoted as saying that there should be a balance between the economy, property rights, and the impacts to our communities. But that's not true. We're talking about residential neighborhoods. We're not talking about an economy or businesses. Why wouldn't the economy play any role in that? I've heard some people talk about the property rights of people have the right to rent out their, their premises. Well, if you're a hotel, your zone commercial. Hotels rent out on daily and weekly basis. If you are an apartment, you rent out on a monthly basis, you're considered residential. VHRs are daily, weekly, a weekend 
type of a basis. This is definitely a commercial use and not a residential use. And, and then you put in there in the impacts to our community. It isn't the impact to our communities. You have residents that have paid a lot of money uh, for a home in a beautiful area that are entitled to just like every other homeowner in the United States to the peaceful and quiet enjoyment of their home. That's, that's part of the legal standard that they have. Um, I don't believe enforcement is the only issue, although it is a big issue. Uh, there are other issues uh, that, are, that, are just, that are more important in my opinion, and that is to protect the quiet, peaceful enjoyment of the homeowners uh, if that is being violated. Okay, in the report, it's, uh, the task force or, or, or uh, uh, Mr. K stated that we should delay implementation of VHRs outside of the Tahoe Township until all regulations are put in place. Well, God, and, and he said, why? Because uh, we, we don't know how they're gonna be affected and so forth. Well, how does that make sense that then you would say that we should increase the VHRs in the Tahoe Township at the same time you're saying we shouldn't allow any uh, in the rest of the uh, Douglas County? Uh, it, they're completely contrary in those two decisions or those two statements. If you're not gonna have uh, uh, implement any VHRs in the count, rest of the county, then you should not be increasing the, uh, the, the, uh, the permits in Tahoe Township. Uh, you state that there should be an immediate uh, in, uh, in uh, cap of 725 in Tahoe County. There's 608 now. You're talking about increasing another 15%. Why would you increase the VHRs by 117 uh, if you're gonna delay the uh, implementation outside of Tahoe? Township. It makes absolutely no sense, uh, and they're completely contrary, contradictory. The task force says the VHRs <coughs> make up 12.5% of the housing units. However, there's 135 more of them that are not permitted. Well, that's 17.5% of the VHRs. That needs to stop immediately, and there needs to be really strong penalties, much more than the $5,000 penalty that is currently uh, proposed. There should be a a much higher substantial uh, penalty. And that person who has violated and, and, and uh, utilized his property as a VHR without being permitted should never have the right to apply for a permit again. Um, I, I, like, I like a lot of the stuff the, the, the task force recommended. I don't wanna go through all of them. I'm gonna try to go a little bit to just the ones I had a, um, a, a difference of opinion on. Uh, the task force was quoted as saying that in the November, November 2018, Cease and desist letters are mailed to owners whose properties have been identified by the host compliance as operating unpermitted VHRs. Well, why in the world would you issue a cease and desist letter after the violation has occurred? Why would you issue maximum fine? That's the problem. If you don't find the people for violating these rules, are going to continue to violate them, and the fines have to be substantial. They can't be five hundred. They can't be five hundred dollars a day after you told them about it. Uh, financial impact from the task force. Uh, you state that there's between two to four and, uh, million to 2.5 million in revenue generated. I guess my first question, maybe uh, Mr. Cates can answer this. What is a vacancy rate right now in the hotels and, and motels in uh, the Tahoe Township? Are we short of hotel rooms? Uh, for the record, Patrick Cates, I don't have specific information about that, I know during the high season, the hotels and motels tend to be pretty booked up. Yeah, well, the point is, I don't think we should be making recommendations and suggestions and, and make comments that we're gonna, uh, at this, and this is a quote from the task force of VHRs and an integral part of our tourism economy, if we don't know what the alternative is for those people looking for a place to stay in, in their Tahoe Township. If the, there are hotels available, rooms available, why wouldn't we want them staying in the hotels where they're spending more of their money in the hotels as opposed to the residential community causing the problems that they're causing there? I think that's one of the issues that should be determined right away before we look into it. And furthermore, as anybody who understands the capitalist economy knows that if they were short of hotel rooms and there is a high demand for more people to stay there, then they're gonna build more hotel rooms. You don't have to turn your homes into a hotel to be an integral part of a tourism economy. I disagree completely with that statement. Um, I talked about the $500 per day uh, uh, fine uh, the, the day after uh, they learn about it and don't abate it. Well, the fine should be imposed the date, uh, as soon as it happens and then it should double every day after it's not changed. I also don't understand why there's a maximum fine of $10,000.
if they continue to not abate the violation, why wouldn't you continue to fine them worse? And in fact, at some point, take away their VHRs. I'm just taking off statements that were said in the uh, task force uh, uh, memo. Uh, Mr. Cates, can you tell me what was the total fines collected last year for violations of VHRs? Don't have that information readily available. I don't know if Jennifer has that. I can spend a few minutes and try to look it up. Okay, could you please? I was told that there wasn't any fines cl uh, collected last year. And in fact, not for many years in a row now. I like to know if that's true or not. Some of these things I get from residents up there, maybe they're accurate, maybe they're not, but it is something you guys should know. Uh, there's obviously a lot of violations that are occurring up there. I got, I had a picture from a lady named Mo. Uh, she sent me an email and I, she probably did the other county commissioners uh, showing all the cars that are parked in one spot next to her duplex, uh, clearly a violation. Uh, there's all these violations. If there's no fines being implemented, then how would anybody think it would change? Okay, so task force recommendations. What does it mean? What, what does it mean when you say you limit the number of VHR permits per parcel to allowable uses per zoning designation and building code requirements? Wouldn't there only be one VHR per building? I mean, per uh, residence. I'm sorry. What was the question? Well, it says in the in the task force recommendation we should limit the number of VHR permits per parcel to allowable, allowable uses per zoning designation and building code requirements. I don't know what that means. Can, can you can what that means? In here for a second? Uh, uh, I, I had a meeting with some folks uh, just uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact. And one of what that means, some of these people have duplexes and they have turned them into fourplexes by adding outside stairs in the port, uh, portioning off the inside yeah. and where there's no, uh, where there's no um, kitchen, they're putting in hot plates in uh, microwaves. And so uh, they, they sell, they uh, rent four units out when in truth, they only have two units. Yeah. I believe that that's what this uh, uh, refers to. And that's one of the things I was gonna ask them to add. And that's on packet uh, page number 442 for those that are reading. Thank you, Wes, I appreciate that. That clarifies that. Okay, the task force says it's um, failure to respond uh, to a violation within a reasonable time frame may result in, failure to respond within a reasonable time frame may result in a violation. Well, what do you mean may result? It should be an absolute violation. And what is a reasonable time frame? We should have a set time. I, I like the 30 minutes that you call up the person on uh, that, you, that the task force had recommended someone be uh, available and be there within 30 minutes and stop the violation. Again, the primary focus should be taking care of the residents who are uh, having their quiet enjoyment violated. Uh, it, that should be a mandatory fine, not a, a discretionary fine. Um, here, here's, you, you made a statement, applicants must disclose if they are part of a homeowners association or a general improvement district and provide current contact information for both if applicable on the application. Well, to me, that is about as vague as you can get. If there is a HOA or a GID that prohibits VHRs, is a county issuing permits to those homes? Do you know that, Mr. Cates? I'm sorry, can you say that again? I'm trying to look up information while you're talking, I apologize. <laughs> If a HOA or a GID prohibits VHRs, right. does a county issue permits to those homes currently? Um, currently, we have a weak mechanism to determine if they are prohibited by an HOA or a GID yeah. covenant. Okay, well, you know, first of all, there shouldn't be a weak alternative uh, mechanism. That's a simple thing. When somebody applies for a permit, you can ask them, are you part of a GID or or a uh, um, HOA and do they allow permits, I mean VHRs. And if they lie on their application, they should be permanently banned from being able to have VHRs. I, Listen, I agree, this, that, that's part of the recommendations, I totally agree. But it's really, it's really well, that's what we talked about earlier. I don't, I don't think it's clear enough and I, would, I think it needs to be clearly expressed that there will be no permits issued to homeowners association GIDs that, uh, that prohibit and, and that's gonna be part of my motion later, but, um, 
Occupancy must limit must be limited strictly enforced during quiet hours, 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. Well, I think we should err on the side of the homeowners. If we're going to have a quiet time, it should be 9 p.m. to 8 a.m. Some people are going to go to bed earlier. Hell, I don't stay up to 10 o'clock. I don't know about you guys. Um, uh, <laughs> Maybe <but> tonight. <laughs> you will tonight. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, so that that so so I think that should be changed at 9 p.m. to 8 a.m. Okay, Washington. <laughs> County staff advised that the research related to the STRs has made it very clear that fines and penalties must be significant enough to deter violations. And it must be, be considered, and not just to be considered the cost of doing business. I can't agree more completely with anything than that statement. If you allow someone just to pay nominal fines, they're gonna to continue to violate it because it's a cost of doing business. That's a great statement. Uh, 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 that was in the task force's deal talking from the Washoe County. Limit caps on VHRs. Now I understand that, there, that, that, that uh, there's a certain amount that you want to limit the Tahoe Township, but does anyone believe it's fair that one area should have substantially more uh, VHRs that disrupt their community than other areas that are not around the resorts corridor? I think it's completely different. There should be there should be a different air, uh, um, um, number of VHRs in areas where uh, you buy a home and you know that there are tourists that are going to be staying in hotels, motels, and, and other commercial areas. But if you're in a residential community in Zephyr Cove or, or Glenbrook, you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't have uh, as many uh, VHRs there. And for the Tahoe uh, Beach Club, I, I, I received a bunch of emails. They said at least 20% of their place is already filled with VHRs. So if we're going to have a percentage, the percent shouldn't be the only factor. You should be looking at the impact of the neighborhood, meaning what's the environment around it, is it near the tourism district? And two, there shouldn't, they should be a percentage based upon the different neighborhoods and not one neighborhood being overflowed, over flooded with all of them. The task force did discuss alternatives to flat caps. I'm reading what the task force said. The task force did discuss alternatives to flat caps such as limiting permits based on proximity to other permits or land use and zoning designations. God, I think that's a great suggestion. Why did the task force reject that suggestion? Mr. Cates or where else? Uh, Jennifer, do you wanna take a stab at that one? Uh, I'm really sorry, Mr. Turkanian. I had a technical difficulty when you were asking that question. I promise you, I was listening. No, it's it's okay. You know, I talk too fast sometimes. Most of my most of the time, so I apologize, particularly when I get excited. Mr. Tarkanian, if I may yeah. indulge you, yeah. I mean, we've got your point. And no, no, no. I, 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 I mean, I'm almost can... I'm almost done. I mean, I'm just going right through the. <laughs> I know this has been a long day, but I've waited to go through all this stuff. I try to make the rest of the stuff. Quicker. You've got one hour. I'll be done in five to ten minutes. I'll, I'll be I'll, I'll be done less time than that slave guy <laughs> takes to do another uh, um, public comment. How about that? Okay, I can um, hardly wait for your uh, motion. Okay, the task force <laughs> did discuss alternative. Okay, this is my question. The task force did discuss alternatives to flat caps, such as limiting permits based on proximity to other permits or land use and zoning designations. Is there a re what was the reason why the task force rejected that? Sure. So uh, that perspective, the um, came from the residents at the lake um, who wanted to make sure um, that individual property owners were inundated, weren't surrounded by task force um, or excuse me, by VHR renters. And ultimately, the property rights conversation um, carried the day. I can tell you that the task force was reluctant to not bring that recommendation forward. What they that should happen is they thought a, an additional role for the advisory board that is referenced in the recommendations is that this program should continue to evolve. That if these initial recommendations were not sufficient, additional restrictions could be put in place, including proximity um, and other things that you had referenced. And they do think that those should be on the table for consideration at future dates if this is not sufficient. I think this should be on the board and the new and when you guys come up with your final solutions. I think that's a great suggestion. Okay, I, I agree with the VHR appeals and advisory board is very necessary, but I think that uh, the majority or at least half of them should be made up of the residents of the area of the Ta Tahoe Township, if that's where it's at now. And if it's expanded to the valley, uh, people in the valley, there should be at least 50% of them. 
I agree with the tier one and tier two, but I think tier two should, I mean, it should be limited to 10 people. There's no reason we should allow more than 10 people to stay in any of these VHRs. I think if you talk about these uh, large occupancies, in fact, Mr. Kate stated that they referred to as poverty houses. But how could anybody say it's okay to have a party house in a residential neighborhood? It's a, if you call it a party house, it's a party house. It's not a, it's not a residence. I, I, I don't think there should be a tier three at all. And I think it should be eliminated. And I think it sh we should be, we should limit uh, the numbers no more than 10 and two to a bedroom. And if there's a smaller bedroom, and I don't know what the number would be where they're just cramming people in, we should limit those bedrooms to just one person. Maybe you can come up with a number that the smaller, the size of smaller bedroom would be. Uh, okay. I'm getting down to the end. Uh, uh, we, we need to have a dedicated 800 complaint line back. I, I was told by one of the residents that we had that and that was not there anymore. I think that's very important so they can call and, and have people sure. hear that. Um, I, like the, I really like the part where you have to have a responsible person on, on site within 30 minutes. I think that's part of the VHR's recommendations. Okay, this is a good one that I got from a resident and I think this should be added too. I think there, be, she, there should be a minimum of age to anybody who rents a VHR. These are not supposed to be party homes. These are not supposed to be spring break homes. The, this is a residential neighborhood. I think we should have an age limit. The person who emailed me said 25 years old. I think it should be 30 years old uh, before anybody could rent a v, uh, VHR. Uh, I, I already talked about the mandatory caps should be a percentage of neighborhoods, not the tall township. Okay, and this is a question, Mr. Cates. Uh, are, are the property taxes calculated for VHRs using an 8% cap for commercial properties or a 3% cap for residential properties? It, it's assessed as residential property. Okay, but if they're operating as a, as a renting and making money as a business, uh, it should be, it, it, they should be charged an 8% increase, not the 3%. The county's losing out 5% increase on that. I like the fact that all VHR properties should be listed on a public website managed by Douglas County with the homeowner's name, address, and contact number and address of the VHR property. Each VHR owner has a responsibility to update this website with the number of people who will be occupying the property with a specific date and at least three days prior to the rental. I think right. that's very good. Uh, Commissioner Tarkanian, I think yes. uh, Ms. Davidson has a correction of my statement. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, Jennifer Davidson, for the record, um, uh, residences up at the lake that are not occupied for a majority of the year are assessed at an 8% property tax. Um, okay. and occupied by the homeowners, right? Not correct. by the renters. We are coordinating with the assessor's office and we provide them a monthly list of all of the VHR permitted properties at the lake, in addition to those that we suspect that are operating as VHRs. Okay. I got one more comment. I'll make a motion and any other county commissioners want to speak, you can... Follow up. After. Wait, wait. We haven't followed the motion yet. We'll overlook my. Well, I'm going to throw my motion out there, and you guys can decide whether you like it after you hear. The well, I, uh, Mr. Tarkanian, could we wait until I know uh, Walt has, uh, Mr. Com Commissioner Noah said has had his hand up for some time, and I know he wants to weigh in on this issue before we make a motion. <laughs> and I and I believe I would also. Well, I wasn't saying we're going to vote for it, okay? But listen, I'll, okay. I'll do what you say because <laughs> okay. I don't want to argue with you and spend here longer than I had to. I said very clearly that we would vote on it. Okay, my last comment before I make a motion is that we that it is vital as county commissioners, as legislators for the state, as the Congress and the Senate in, in Washington, D.C., that we treat all residents the same. Nothing makes people more mad when you pass regulations that apply to one group of people and not apply to the other. If the commission is going to allow VHRs in the Tahoe Township, and this excludes the resort corridor because that was what it was built for, but if they're going to have them in Zephyr Cove and Glenbrook and other residential neighborhoods, they have an obligation to do so in the Carson Valley. And I will guarantee you that there's gonna be a flood of people in the Carson Valley. They're gonna contact all of us and say how they don't want it down here. So they, the people who just because they live in Lake Tahoe shouldn't be treated differently than the people that live down here unless they're in the resort corridor. With that being said, I will yield my remaining 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> all right, any other comments? Commissioner Gardner. Well, I think uh, I think Commissioner Noah Sad's hand was up before mine, so I will yield to him and come in after him. Commissioner Noah Sad, you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you, Commissioner Gardner. Uh, here's the here's the here's the cause of the up, uproar. The VHRs are misbehaving. 
we don't have code enforcement officers going up there to do what they could do. So the solution to that is partly done already by getting on, how we got five in the, in the queue right now? Mr. P Mr. Case, two in the queue. Okay, now well, yeah, I would suggest, and some people may not like this, put a moratorium on any additional VHRs until you get the code squared away and you got the enforcement to go up there and take care of them. You can't make a motion. What else? I'm not making a motion. I was just, I was just joking with you. <laughs> and additionally, 725, I think, is too high. That's why I suggested a moratorium. Zero. I Mr. yield Gardner. to Mr. Gardner. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'll take my hand down now. Uh, I didn't think there was anybody that was more passionate about this item than, uh, than I was, but I found out tonight that uh, Commissioner Tarkanian is even more passionate than I am. And I share a, a lot of his, his uh, feelings in this regard. I have reviewed this package and uh, uh, I, would, I would certainly be in support of, and I agree that until we can get our arms wrapped around this entire program, that we need to place a moratorium going forward and, uh, and, I would, and I would hope that maybe either Mr. Tarkanian or Noah said would bring forward a motion and if they don't, I will to uh, impose a moratorium on VHR, <clears throat> uh, the issuance of additional VHR permits for a minimum of six months until we can get our arms wrapped around this, this, uh, this whole issue. Uh, our citizens, uh, and, and I'm sure that my fellow commissioners uh, probably got the same emails I did, are asking for action tonight. They are asking for action tonight. And by the imposing of a moratorium would give them that action that I think they, first of all, want to see us take action on. Uh, regarding the other issues that have been uh, displayed by uh, uh, County Manager uh, Cates, uh, I, I wholeheartedly support the creation of a VHR appeals and advisory board. And I would recommend that that be a seven member board and be dominated by six, perhaps six members selected from the Tahoe Township and perhaps one from the East Fork uh, or the Valley floor. Uh, the other issue that is huge on the people's minds up there are the requirement for trash uh, pickup and bear boxes. And I don't know if we can uh, make that requirement tonight through a motion or not, but I certainly think that that is absolutely critical to us as well. Now I did the numbers uh, and I agree that this program must pay for itself, but I remember back in December, we were looking at a number the Board of Commissioners at that time was looking at a number somewhere in the half a million dollar range to bring this uh, program under control. And when I uh, uh, do the mathematics on 725 VHRs at $400 permitting process, and that's if they were all brand new, that would only generate uh, a little over a quarter of a million dollars, which is not sufficient enough to get us there. So, uh, uh, we, we need to take a look at, uh, these people are making anywhere from, and I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna lowball it probably, $2,500 a weekend up to $5,000 a weekend. To charge them a $400 fee is peanuts, is peanuts to what they're bringing in on a, on a, on a basis. And so if, if, based on that peanuts, you would think that everybody that uh, wants to run a VHR would, would go ahead and pony up the $400 instead of having 135 illegal uh, VHRs up there. You'd think that they would have gotten into the system by now, but maybe they have other issues with their property that they don't want inspected, and that's why they're doing this. I, you know, I don't know. Um, but I, I think that uh, I agree with Commissioner Noah Sad and Tarkanian that 13% uh, seems to be too high of a number for me. And I would look closer to the 10% uh, area also. But this whole thing is going to take uh, a lot more time than we have tonight to do. And uh, I think when we finally get together 
uh, these recommendations. And Jennifer, I appreciate what you've done. I really do. I don't want to dismiss that. Uh, and I don't want to dismiss the efforts of the task force and, and what Mr. Cates has brought forward. But uh, the, the citizens of this county are demanding an answer. And I believe they're demanding an answer tonight. But I would think when we finally get this program ready to, uh, to roll out, uh, we may need to schedule a special meeting of this board just to address that particular issue because it's going to be a long, drawn out meeting to come to the conclusions. So, uh, Mr. Tarkanian, I would, uh, if, if uh, I, I don't know if other commissioners, it seems like Wes Rice, uh, Commissioner Rice has something to say as well. So, Commissioner Rice, um, maybe we should let him. And then I guess the chairman might have something to say. <laughs> so. Mr. Chairman, if I may. You have the floor, sir. Uh, I want to thank Danny. Uh, I didn't have to read all these uh, notes that I had uh, written <laughs> out. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs> you do save me a lot of spit. Anyway, uh, you've been talking to the same people I have. Uh, I uh, have been going over this, and I thoroughly agree that we should uh, enact, uh, have, uh, have uh, Mr. Cates come back with the ordinance that includes everything from one to 10 in his recommendations. Also on uh, page uh, 442 of the packet uh, in uh, the permitting, where it says limit the number of VHR permits per parcel to allowable uses per zoning. Uh, some people are, are taking, as I said uh, earlier, they're taking uh, duplexes and making them fourplexes by putting uh, uh, stairs on the outside of the building and then putting in a hot plate instead of having a kitchen. And I, I don't think that should be allowed. So I would uh, uh, like to see that as number 11 on this. And then if we could get uh, that taken care of, uh, one through 10 plus this for 11, that'll at least give us a start. And uh, we can see where we go from there. And I agree with um, uh, limiting the number of VHRs. Uh, uh, the people I've talked to, some are okay with the uh, 725 number, some are not. And uh, granted, we need at some point to look at restricting the number of VHRs in a neighborhood, because we have some neighborhoods where the uh, VHRs are moving in, and the, half half the neighborhood is a VHR. In the uh, trust me, I live right around the corner from a party house, so I understand the problem. So I would like to see uh, some limit placed on that uh, 725. I can live with it; should probably be lower than that. But let's go with what we have for the moment and uh, go go one through 10 and then add uh, a number 11. And uh, Dan is shaking his head. Any commissioners have any other comments? Well, there's there one guy left and that's me. My brother-in-law. Oh, huh? Excuse me. Never mind. Excuse me, Mr. Ingalls. My, my brother-in-law is the chief code enforcement officer for the city of Santa Monica. They allow no, zero, no VHRs, and the adjacent communities do not allow them. This originally started out as an agenda item to put a moratorium on all VHRs within Douglas County. It has turned into the epistles of Paul, and it's way too convoluted to solve tonight. Hence, I think we should focus on establishing a moratorium as of tonight on all VHRs in Douglas County. And then we go from there. Mr. Chairman, can I make my motion now? Yes, you may. Okay, for, I would like to make a motion that we have a moratorium starting today on all uh, new um, issued um, VHRs. But there's more to the motion than that. So. First, I want, to, I want to emphasize that we are talking about an activity that is a commercial activity in a residential area. When you rent your home a day, a weekend, that's a hotel. A hotel is zoned commercial. When you rent your hotel 30 days or more, it's, a, it's an apartment, it's, resi it's residential, residential. In fact, just this past 
year, a few months ago, and the Elk Point Country Club case, Judge Todd Young from the Ninth Judicial Court here in Gardnerville ruled that the VHR in the Elk Point Country Club was a commercial activity and that the CCNRs that prohibited commercial activities prohibited VHRs in that area. That being said, my motion would be this. We have a moratorium on all new lease issue permits until the task or board comes up with the full list of, of, of regulations that is approved by the board. I don't think we should limit to just the 10 that they suggested there. Obviously I put in there a lot more. Maybe the other commissioners aren't gonna agree with the rest of them, that's fine. But I think that we should have a moratorium until uh, uh, the board approves what the new regulations are gonna be. Number two, we need to put in very clearly that there will be no uh, uh, VHR permits uh, issued in areas where the homeowners association, the GIDs or the CC prohibit uh, VHRs or the CCNRs prohibit commercial activity. And that is my motion. Well, uh, I think a lot of that is redundant, Commissioner Tarkanian. If we institute a moratorium on all VHRs as of tonight, in the county of Douglas, that's pretty inclusive. That includes HOAs, Joe Schmidlap and everybody else. And 40, over 40% 40 of these HOAs are owned by people who are not residents of the state of Nevada and they do not reside up at the lake. So, uh, Commissioner Gardner. I, so I, I understand where you're going, Mr. Uh, Commissioner uh, Ingalls, uh, Chairman. Uh, I have, I, I would second that motion and offer an amendment to that motion that we put a time limit of six months on that. Uh, in addition to that, I would like to amend it to include the immediate requirement of trash requirements and the uh, uh, and all current uh, uh, VHR permittees uh, be required to we're install we're their boxes. Getting into, we're getting into code items. And that can come next meeting. But right why, now, Mr. Right, Chairman, this, why? This, this, huh? Why well, would we want to put them off to the next meeting if it's something that needs to be done now? I mean, if the trash issue is a major issue well, there. They should, they should be separate items because they're going to have to be separate code items. And I agree with you. Uh, Mr. Ritchie, well, how can we approach this? That, thank you, Chairman Doug Ritchie with the Douglas County District Attorney's Office. Um, by resolution, you can direct staff not to issue any more uh, VHR permits based on public health and safety to allow you to implement um, whatever rules you're going to implement. But when you talk about actually implementing new rules to the VHR ordinance, that has to be done by amendment to the ordinance, which okay. requires an introduction and an adoption. So yeah. which ones are so, you referring to? Are you referring to the fact of the uh, trash um, issue, or are you talking about the fact that I don't believe you should be issuing VHRs, whether there's a moratorium or not, to homeowners association or um, GIDs that prohibit them, and in commercial uh, and in and in um, um, uh, home, air residential areas where the CCNRs prohibit commercial activity? I like to have that added into my motion or included in my motion. Well, I don't think you can. I don't think you can amend your own amendment. Well, that was an amendment. That was part of my motion. I didn't amend it. Well, okay. That was part I, of my initial I, motion. Okay. Commissioner Gardner. Thank you. Uh, I was, I was, I will keep my amendment down to a minimum of just uh, imposing that what Mr. Turkanian is proposing uh, and put a time limit on it of six months. I second it. You accept kind of agree. I want, a, I want a permanent. Is it time for discussion? Yes. Fine. I think this. What we're what we're trying to do here is to say we have to start at ground zero and walk forward. The first step would be to turn off the VHRs, period, and then change the rules as we need right in future meetings. Not necessarily separated by a month. We could do special meetings from here till next week and come up with the right things. So your time limit, Mr. Mr. Gardner, is well taken. However, when you start making a motion to 
how to address number 12. And it's been offered that we cut off the VHRs, period. That's, your, that's the beginning. The rest of it is, yes, Mr. Gardner, we'll give you six months. Yes, Mr. Tarkanian, we'll give you your, your second choice. It's, you're, you're, we're, we're spinning our wheels doing this. Let's it's start, very, start at the beginning and go forward. It's a very simple motion that I made. Moratorium, which I think every one of the county commissioners has indicated that they want, and to make sure that the county does not in the future violate the law, the regulations of the HOA and the VHRs or get into another lawsuit uh, that Yelts Point Country Club had. That's it's simple. That's law. You've, you've law. already introduced three, three more subjects. The lawsuit. Now, well, this, I'm sorry if you, can't, if you can't follow okay. that, but that's my motion. I I'm, think well, second, second I, I take umbrage at your comment. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, let me say it again. Okay. Turn off the VHRs. That's the beginning. No, you can't do any more. That's going to prevent us from being able to have people come in, not getting the VHR, getting a VHR and stepping in our way. End of story. Let's, let's change the code as required. And has anybody looked at the code? So, Commissioner Gardner. Well, I, I would like some direction out of uh, Dep uh, Deputy District Attorney uh, Doug Ritchie on whether or not um, we can impose a moratorium uh, uh, without a time frame, or indefinitely, or or should we have a time frame? That's that's all I'm trying to get at. Uh, if 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 a time frame is not required, then I don't have any reason to to. Uh, propose a, an amendment to the motion, and I'll go back to uh, Commissioner Kirkanian's original motion. So uh, I, I would like some di direction out of Mr. Ritchie. Okay, Mr. Ritchie, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman. Doug Ritchie with the Douglas County District Attorney's Office. Just to clarify, it might be better, to, instead of using the term moratorium, use the term suspension. It's a temp, as I understand the motion, it's a temporary suspension on the issuance of new VHRs with a proposed amendment for a time specific to allow staff to implement and draft an ordinance to incorporate the directives of the board. As to Commissioner Tarkinian's desire to amend um, basically the code to require staff to obtain the approval from GIDs and HOAs, that is a that would be a change in the co county code. Okay, moreover, Mr. Mr. Moreover, G general improvement districts do not have planning and zoning police powers. They have zero. They don't control growth. As far as um, HOA or CCNRs, they also do not have police powers. What they have is a private contractual relationship between individual parties. The county does not typically enforce private contractual obligations. That's what the court is for. If you promise that you will paint your house white instead of pink, that's fine. You have the right to do that, but the county doesn't enforce that, nor do we enforce any other CCNRs. Now, if the board wants to change um, the code to require a uh, sign off from, the, from an HOA, the board is free to do that. I will point out, and Tom Dallaire and Community Development can confirm that currently, when there's an application, they have to conf the applicant has to con confirm that they're not in violation of any restrictions like CCNRs or HOA regulations. Okay, now I want to address what you just stated there. First of all, if you're going to say that the county should not enforce what the CCNRs and homeowners associations in our county are doing. I think that's turned a blind eye and that's wrong. Now you can say we don't have to file the lawsuit on it, but we certainly can state that we're not gonna issue permits in, in, in violation of the HOAs and the CCNRs. And I will tell you, I am aware, no, no, I'm a, I am aware that the county has issued numerous VHRs to areas that have homeowners associations that prohibit it and in areas that the CCNRs prohibit commercial activity. So it's going on right now. And I don't believe we should wait 60 days or 90 days to allow that to continue. When you see a violation of what uh, is going on up there, it should be stopped immediately. And that's what my motion is. Thank you. Mr. Well, Chairman, as well call taken. the question, if, please. Uh, just a moment. If, if we, 
suspend the issuance of all permits for VHRs. That's all inclusive throughout the county. And it includes HOAs, GIDs, Joe Schmidlap, everybody else. But after the suspension is over, they can go back and issue them again. But my motion, they can't go back and issue them. They can't go back and violate HOAs and CCR, CCRs. Well, then bring a motion for a permanent moratorium on permits <laughs> for the HR. Okay. I mean, we're going round and round in a mulberry bush here. Okay. All right. Does anybody want to make a motion on this? I made a motion, and I believe yeah. Mr. Gardner. Uh, I understand you made a I motion, did. but let's simplify it. I, I would like to have a moratorium until the the county board, um, uh, the county uh, management staff, pr pr provides the board uh, the changes in regulations, and the regulations are approved by the, uh, the, the the county commission. And I would like to direct the county uh, not to issue. Uh, VHR per, uh, permits at it, uh, permanently in violation of an HOA or CCNR um, regulations. Okay. Commissioner Gardner. I will second that and amend it to- No, you can't do that. I can amend it. I can amend it to use the word suspend versus moratorium. I'm sorry. If you're, yes, if you're the proper procedure that, is you can make an motion. amendment to the motion. Period. That's what I'm doing. Okay. Make now we have to, to we motion. have to have a discussion on your motion. your motion. All I'm trying to do is amend it to change the wording from moratorium to suspension, as our deputy district attorney has suggested. And, and I may, okay. I misspoke. I should have said that. I agreed with what he said. Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner Nosad, uh, do you have a motion on a? Do you have an amendment on the floor? Can you hear a second? Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Tarkanian, you do you want to revise your motion? Sure, I'll revise my motion. I'd like to have a suspension of issuing new VHR permits until the county commission approves new regulations as recommended by. Uh, the task force and whatever new ones that we add on. And I, I will like second to, that one. And I would like to uh, permanently ban VHRs in areas where homeowners associations prevent VHRs and where CCNRs prohibit commercial activity. Counting on you, Mr. Gardner. Commissioner um, Gardner. I, I, think, uh, I think Commissioner Noah had said he'd no, I, I, I commented, I gave me, I'm expecting him to come up with one motion, not a series of motions. Two parts to my motion. I'm sorry if you don't like it. Well, what oh, part of the suspension to a vote. doesn't include HOAs? Oh. Okay, Mr. Tartanian, I will continue to support that and second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. What, what, read the motion again, please. Okay, the motion on the floor is to suspend the issuance of any VHR permits and to restrict any issuance of permits for VHRs in any HOA, GID, or homeowner association. Is that or basically C it? CCNRs that prohibit commercial activity. CCNRs that prohibit. Does that work, Mr. Ritchie? Doug. Is there a duration? I said until the county commission approves uh, the, the revisions to the um, VHR's regulations. Um, Chairman, if I may, yes, just to clarify, ahead. the suspension can go into effect immediately. The, the, what it sounds like is a permanent requirement regarding GIDs and CCRs will have to be by amendment to the code and won't become effective until the code is amended. Just so you know. Okay, so we, we have to back up and punt here. Can we pass that and amend the code at a future time? Absolutely. Okay, Fair well, that's what that's we'll do. Correct. That's my motion. You still have two pieces to your motion or just one? 
emotions the same as I just as I stated before. I, I, to you, there's two to be pieces. clear. To be clear, you want to ban, you want to uh, put what's the word was suspend VHRs, and then you want to address something that deals with code in the same motion. I want to make a motion to amend the code to limit to make sure the county does not issue permit VHR permits to homeowners associations that prohibit it and CCNR homes that outlaw commercial activity. Did anybody write this down? No, but Mr. Cates has his hand up. Mr. Cates? Uh, I don't want to muddy the waters, but I need a point of clarification <laughs> on the suspension of new VHR permits. I believe that has to come back as a resolution. And the DA can correct me on that. So you're giving us direction to bring back things to enact these. Is that correct, Mr. Ritchie? Chairman, if I may, uh, Doug Ritchie with the district attorney's office, that's correct. Uh, a resolution can be, a, it's a change in policy and that can be enacted as soon as you meet again. The ordinance will have to re require an introduction and an adoption. It, the resolution will outline the reasons why the board is taking this action to suspend the issuance of new uh, VHR permits and an effective date. Can you give me the verbiage or give us the verbiage on, <laughs> on the action, uh, Commissioner Gardner? What do you, yes, Commissioner uh, Gardner. I, 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 ju I just need clarification, Mr. Ritchie. Uh, the the uh, item, uh, action item number uh, 12 uh, specifically says that we can, uh, which may include a temporary moratorium on the issuance. Moratorium, you asked, you suggest we change that wording to suspension. So you're telling us now that, that that motion is not available to us this evening and it has to come back before us in a form of a resolution at a future meeting? Doug Ritchie with the district attorney's office. It's agendized for the board to take action now, but as I indicated just a minute ago, Changes to the code require an amendment, amendment by ordinance. A change in policy can be, it's preferable by resolution. That way you have a date where it starts. It outlines all of the issues that are um, the basis for the board's action. Well, that's what we're doing. We're, 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 we want a resolution to, to have a moratorium. Just what, you, what, just what was part of the agenda. I'm with Mr. Gardner, I'm confused. It, part of the agenda discussed put in a moratorium. So now we voted to put, we want to vote to put one on and we said, uh, why can't we do it right now? Okay. Typically these types of actions are done by resolution and we get a resolution number. We have the, 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 the findings that are listed out. The board can see it easily. As you know, right now it's, it's kind of convoluted as to just the motion itself. Um, beyond the, the, the legal basis for it. Okay, you know, look, I'm going to make it simple. So you, in, in the agenda item, you said that uh, part of uh, open discussion was a moratorium on on um, on VHRs. I just want to make a motion that we put a vote. I'll, I'll get rid of all the other ones. This will satisfy Mr. Ang Chairman Angles and Chairman Noah Sat. I'll bring that up at the next meeting. But I, I, I will, I'll make a motion that we have a moratorium on the VHRs until we have new regulations in place. That's what was agendized. And I would think this would be simple. I, I will second that motion. Okay. <laughs> the, board, the board can vote on that. It's a, it's a, again, it's a temporary suspension or moratorium in your words on the issuance of new VHR permits until um, the board adopts um, an amendment to the VHR uh, ordinance. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Do I have a vote? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposition <laughs> say nay. The motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. Wow. Thank wow. you, Just gentlemen. Wow. <laughs> it's a start. It's a very good discussion. Thank you.
I lied. This is <laughs> way over. Well, at least nobody went to sleep during that. That's for damn sure. Oh, that was a pretty good one. <laughs> yeah, we only got um, three to go. Yeah. Is, do you want to go ahead on through? Or you want to take a quick break? I could use a quick break. Okay, Me let's too. take 10. It is, what time? It is uh, 730. 7.30 exactly. Okay, let's all be back at 7.40. Thank you.
the record for a commissioner meeting was 930 at night. Um, we'll forge on ahead and try not to break that record. What about the one at CBIC last year? Uh, it didn't break the record. Uh -uh. 930. It, it was got out of there at 1130. It was in the but oh, I think I it started at 9 a.m., Mr. Well. Ingalls. <laughs> 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 All right, never mind. <laughs> I just remember the one at the uh, courthouse, and it was 9.30 at night when we finally adjourned. Yeah. Anyway. Um, all right, so we're at item 13. Oh, boy. And for possible action, discussion and direction to staff regarding legislation or legislative issues proposed by legislators or the other entities permitted by Nevada State Legislature to submit bills, draft requests, or such legislative issues that might impact Douglas County as may be deemed appropriate by the Board of County Commissioners. Patrick Cates. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you see my presentation? Yep. Okay, so hopefully this won't take too long. I only have a few things I want to cover uh, with you tonight. Uh, so first off, I... I'm forwarding. There we go. Uh, first off, I just included the, the deadlines that I've shared with you before. Um, we're getting more and more bills. We probably have had somewhere on the order of about 250 bills. Um, that we're in the process of analyzing. I did provide a report uh, to you of some of the higher priority bills that we're looking at. Uh, but just so you know where we're at in the process, um, April 9th is a big date when the, all bills have to be passed out of the first house. We should see a lot of these bills die in that process. Uh, and I just repeated some of the procedures and process for the session. Now, uh, what I want to talk about first is an update on China Springs. Uh, we started to talk a little bit about this early in the agenda. So just uh, a reminder, $1.2 million per year cut proposed in the governor's budget for China Springs. This is the direct payments that come from child and family services to support China Springs. Uh, the Joint Senate Finance and Assembly uh, Ways and Means Committee uh, a Subcommittee for Human Resources uh, had a budget here, the initial budget hearing on February 10th last week. Uh, I provided some written testimony. Uh, Judge Young um, and Wendy Garrison provided uh, verbal testimony at that meeting. Uh, the current state funding for China Springs is approximately $1.7 million. Uh, the state also provides Spring Mountain and Clark County uh, a little less than $500,000. The proposed cut to China Springs makes uh, states, would make the state support equal for both camps. Um, the state solution uh, was for the counties to pick up the increase in payments. Uh, Douglas County currently provides about $100,000 to China Springs. That would increase uh, county assessments by about 50%, or for us, about uh, $50,000. Uh, yesterday, uh, the China Springs Youth, Advi Youth Camp Advisory Board had a meeting. Commissioner Angles and I both attended that meeting. Uh, to have a discussion with the stakeholders of the 16 counties uh, about the budget cuts. I think there was consensus that uh, uh, a position of opposition without, excuse me, without um, any kind of compromise would likely be unsuccessful and would likely mean the passage of the full cuts. Uh, the discussion that Judge Young suggested was proposing a 12% cut to China Springs funding, which would be consistent with the governor's direction to his departments, and then agree to form a, a working group in the interim of the biennium uh, to consider um, changes to China Springs, reforms to programs, and a gradual reduction in state support to be uh, replaced by county funding. Uh, the counties in the next biennium wouldn't, wouldn't contribute any additional funding. Um, remains to be seen whether that will be accepted. It remains to be seen whether the 16 participating counties are even amenable to that. The advisory group is diverse. It in includes um, uh, uh, not the county managers. Uh, there are some commissioners on it, but mostly it's the um, uh, youth services folks that participate in that. 
There is also a NACO working group, which I'm participating in, which will meet on February 19th. So the chairman of the committee is aware that we are working on this. They're going to give us time to try to reach some sort of compromise, and we'll continue to work on that and report back. Uh, any questions on China Springs before I move on? Okay. Okay. Next time I want to talk about is a bill draft re request for innovation zones. I don't have a bill number or a bill draft request number. It has not been published by the Legislative Council Bureau yet, but it has been widely circulated. Um, I sent you uh, the, the latest draft of that. There have been newspaper articles uh, about it, so um, uh, widely known what the terms of that uh, potential bill are. Um, the, the governor referred to it in his state of the state speech briefly. Um, my understanding is that Blockchain LLC is the proponent of this bill. They are a major landholder in Story County. Uh, basically, it allows an innovation, innovative technology company, and it defines what innovative technology companies are, that includes blockchain, uh, to form an independent local government within a county with approval from the governor's office of economic development. So the county would have no say over this. The state office of economic development would have authority to allow them to create this sort of alternative private government within a county. Um, uh, it requires that the, uh, that the company have at least 50,000 contiguous uh, acres uh, that they control and that they make an investment of $250 million minimum. Uh, counties would have no jurisdiction, but the counties would be required to provide, provide services at the discretion of the private company. The company could decide at their leisure to take over county services and would have taxation power and all county services. It even lists things like our elected offices like the sheriff and the assessor and the treasurer and so on. Um, in discussions with the legislative uh, coalition, the four counties, as well as at the NACO legislative meetings, there seems to be universal opposition among the 17 counties uh, for this legislation. It would usurp the authority of the counties. <clears throat> and the premise of this bill, as I understand it, is that counties don't move fast enough or aren't innovative enough to <clears throat> attract these kind of investments from uh, technology companies. And uh, it, I can say in the case of Story County, where Blockchain LLC is, uh, they probably have the fastest, easiest permitting process in the country, which is the whole basis of how the uh, Tahoe Reno Industrial Park has developed. Um, so I'm recommending that the board uh, vote to oppose this bill draft. Uh, Mr. Cage, real quick. Yes, sir. Although there's uh, opposition to this by the counties, uh, how about the parties? I the mean, does this, does this require uh, uh, a super majority or a simple majority? Where are we at? Do you know? Uh, I have to double check. I believe it's a sim simple majority because it does not enact new taxes. Do you have any take on uh, party affiliation and what they feel about it? Because that's going to be the deciding vote. Well, I tell you, the, the 17 counties um, uh, represent all different parties, and, and they're universally opposed. I've heard anecdotally it is getting a poor reception at the legislature. Um, okay. I, I'm not aware of anybody that's openly in support of it at this point. Thank you. Uh, would the uh, uh, board like to uh, take a vote on this one? If you want to vote, uh, Commissioner uh, Ingalls. Um, do we have a motion to support or <laughs> not support? Uh, let's put a motion forward that says <laughs> the Douglas County Board of County Commissioners is in not of support for innovation zones. Is there a second? I second that. Right. We have a, uh, a motion on the floor, a second. All those in favor of not supporting innovation zones signify by voting aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, the motion is carried. Okay, thank you.
Uh, I will move on to the uh, next bill. Um, I originally wasn't going to present this, but I had a request from, from NACO and our lobbyists to uh, ask for support for this bill. This is uh, Assembly Bill 1. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward bill. It's uh, sponsored by the Nevada Association of Counties, so it has the support of, of the 17 county representatives of NACO. <clears throat> it requires uh, new state legislators to... Um, uh, to have training on local governments, on their structure and authority, their financial administration, and the services that they provide. Historically, uh, uh, most state legislators, uh, well, I don't know most, but they often came from local government. Um, it was very common for people to come from a county commission or be city, city councilman and then get elected to the state legislator. So a lot of legislators used to come to the legislature with that experience and knowledge. Today, that's no longer the case. A lot of people that get elected to the legislature have no government experience. Um, it, it, this is vital uh, for county interests uh, so that new legislators understand our role in Nevada and um, how their legislation can affect us. So I'd recommend a vote to support AB1. I make a motion that we uh, support AB1. You're a second. Commissioner Gardner. Second. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to support AB1 and a second. All those in favor signify by voting aye. 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 All those opposed, the motion carries to support AB1. Very good, thank you. Moving on to the next bill, AB90. The sponsor of this bill is Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson. Uh, she's a legislator <laughs> Uh, it requires counties to pay impact fees to other local governments for projects of inter-county significance is the language that is used in the bill. Uh, my understanding of the origin of this bill is uh, concerns over Washoe County and Story County, specifically potential impacts to Washoe County uh, from development in Story County from the industrial park. Uh, that's kind of an ongoing area of concern. Um, Basically, a county would have to determine uh, an impact on another county before approving any kind of development, construction, or expansion of a project and would have to provide notice and ask for impact statements from other local governments. Um, and then the county would have to compensate the other jurisdictions for those uh, impacts. Um, and it also includes a retroactive provision where for one project, a, a county or a local government uh, could seek compensation for impacts uh, on a development in a bordering county. Uh, this is very, um, uh, I, I think would have a lot of negative consequences on, on a county. Uh, it would impact our autonomy and making decisions for development it would definitely have a negative impact on economic development. Some of the companies that have come to Nevada, it's hard to see how they would come if they had all this red tape of multiple jurisdictions and impact fees that would uh, could be imposed. Um, my understanding, this has not had a really good reception. It may not go anywhere. Um, I, I would recommend you consider opposing AB 90. That makes it sound like uh, perhaps Douglas County could get uh, uh, an impact notice before sending so many cars into Carson City. Yep. Yeah, Commissioner Gardner. Well, I, I see this as a, a, a loss of our local autonomy also. And so uh, I would oppose this strongly. And so I'll move that we oppose AB 90. That may have a second. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to oppose AB 90. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Say nay. The motion is carried. <coughs> okay. Um, that was all I wanted to highlight. Um, uh, I did send you the full report. If you have any questions on any other bills, happy to talk about them. But um, that, that's all I wanted to cover this evening. Uh, Commissioner Gardner? I, I know we have uh, Patrick uh, uh, serving on the four county. A legislative coalition. Uh, there was, uh, I know that we have a couple of uh, property tax bills that are also. Uh, yep. So uh, 
have we gotten a report out of uh, our county assessor on how that might affect Douglas County? Um, uh, I haven't engaged with the county assessor fully on these those two bills yet. So one is sponsored by NACO and the other is sponsored by the League of Cities. And um, what I'm waiting for that I want our assessor to look at is the analysis that is supposed to be done by their consultant to show the fiscal impact on these two bills. As I understand the NACO bill, it is not intended to have any uh, immediate impact on, on county uh, revenue. Uh, it, it's meant to prevent uh, loss of revenue in the event of an economic downturn in a very modest way. Um, so I was waiting until we got that report um, and have Trent look at that and then bring that back to you guys for discussion. Um, to be honest, both of these bills, NACO has been knocking on this door since the Great Recession. Uh, they are considered uh, tax bills and they require a two thirds majority. Um, I personally don't think either one of these bills is going to get very far in the legislative session, but I was holding back the conversation until we got that data from NACO, which was supposed to come this week, but I haven't seen it yet. Thank you. Okay. Any more comments or questions from the commissioners? Moving on to item 14. For possible action, discussion to adopt a resolution 2021R-018 approving the transfer of $1.1 million from the county's regional transportation fund to the county's general fund to reverse pro provisions, board action and resolution 2020R-126 uh, to fund Mueller Lane design. And this is a little bit of a misdirection uh, in regard to this agenda item. This has nothing to do with the overall design of roads, developments, and nothing. It's a question of the $1.1 million that just, just all of a sudden appeared. It's not a budget item, and it, we want to know how it's being allocated and what we're getting for our money before we start dispersing funds. That's it, nothing else. Now, Can I ask a point of clarification? Yes. Okay, I understand that you had a question of where the money came from with regards to not being in the budget. And I see that's part of the agenda. And then you, the, the second part, I didn't quite understand. Um, you, you wanna know what it's, what it's being allocated for? What are the services? I, I didn't quite understand. Well, it, 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 it gives the impression that it's going to uh, not fund Miller Parkway. That's not the intent. The intent is to just, before it's dispersed, to establish and find out where and how it arrived at being available. It didn't exist. It wasn't a budget item. Where did it come from? The, the money was diverted from the CARES Act fund and it's all of a sudden showing up in here and we just want a further verification where it's coming from and what's going on because the CARES Act fund, that's a federal fund. And I think it was in Sparks of Reno, some of those supervisors up there, they took the money and did something with it and the feds are suing them now. So okay, so that, that clarifies it. You're just asking about where the funds originated from, not what they're being spent for, is that correct? Exactly. Okay. Now we'll open this for public comment, but be warned on public comment. If you have a position in regard to roads or development or anything, that's fine, but we'll cut you off. This is just in regard to this money and where it came from. So we now open for public comment. Natalie Wood, for the record, um, I have a handful that have their hands raised. Okay. So we'll start going through the list. Um, we'll start with Aaron. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, yes I can. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Chair Ingalls, Aaron West, for the record. Um, so, I guess I'm a little confused then uh, based on how you describe this item and how it's agendized because 
uh, it says for possible action to withdraw $1.1 million from RTC. Um, I just said that that was not the intent and it wasn't, it wasn't right in the agenda. The okay. agenda is to find out where the money came from before it's dispersed. Okay, so can we clarify then that th th this isn't an action item? It is for no, it is an action only. It, it is an action item. And okay, okay we're done. Thank you for your well, comments. I, I don't I get two minutes? No, because At you're least? going off in another direction. You're not Sir. focusing on what the intent well, is. Okay, well then tell you what, let me explain my, my position. The county entered into an agreement for the design of Muller Parkway to go back and re <laughs> look, sir, we are not reneging on any of that. And these funds do not have to be dispersed all at once. So we're not reneging on contracts. We're not doing any of that. You're going in the wrong direction. Thank you for your comments. Next person. Okay. Okay, we have Jim Slade next. I assume you can hear me. Yes, sir. Uh, Jim Slade. To many people here, I, I think that the problem has been one of optics, but the optics were terrible and could have easily been avoided and explained much better. Um, a couple of months ago, item eight was to transfer $1.1 million from CARES funding to the general fund. And the very next item, item number one, nine, was to transfer 1.1 million, the exact same amount from the general fund to be used for Muller Parkway. So the obvious appearance there was that that $1.1 million in CARES funding was going to Muller Parkway, which would have been a violation of the CARES Act funding. And it's something about which I uh, contacted the state finance committee to inquire about. Um, the county manager made an after the fact explanation regarding the situation that wasn't adequate to allay public concerns about the propriety of the transfers. Um, I know he tried to explain it. I know a lot of people weren't convinced. It, it may have been legitimate, but I think that's where the problem has come for a lot of people. <clears throat> and that's probably the gist of the problem. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jim. Um, Steve? Good evening. Steve to share for the record on behalf of Tahoe Chamber. Um, I, I guess Mr. Chairman and, and commissioners, I just want to register an objection to how the chair started this item by changing the language that is actually on the agenda. So we support Muller Parkway. We support the money from the county going in. Okay, I'm going to cut you off. You're I going would, in the direction you don't you want would. to go, Mr. Teixeira. I'm sorry. I told everybody beforehand that wasn't the way we're going. It's got nothing to do with parkways and you're supporting anything. That's you want the way to find the we have a fiduciary, Excuse me, sir. We have a fiduciary responsibility as commissioners to know where unbudgeted items that just come up out of nowhere are coming from and what's going on. That's Steve, all it is. And the reads. Thank you. Okay, next. We have Carlo. Um, thank you. And I am going to start off by saying I find it offensive, Chairman Engels, the way you've treated the two people who have called in who disagree with your position. Okay. And so, off, stop it. Stop it. Okay, I am going off, to speak and I'm going to have off, my time speak. Cut him off. He started this the other day at the NNDA meeting, and it was a, a very despicable action on his part. Okay, next person. Okay, we have Charles Holt.
Now I can be heard. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to be extraordinarily careful with what I say here. Um, the action itself and its uh, proposal is troubling to me and it's very perplexing. And I really would like to know better what the true purpose of this proposal is. And I ask that because um, Mr. Cates has already explained to the Board of Commissioners before. So evidently, um, Mr. Angles, you don't understand where the money's coming from because you've stated that in social media. So I would appreciate Mr. Cates re-explaining to everyone exactly where the money came from. And I would also like the second thing that Mr. Engels put on social media, media saying that it was illegal. I would like that talked to by the deputy uh, assistant uh, attorney. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Okay, that is all we have for public comment at this point. All right, uh, anybody on the commission have anything, any comments, questions? Can I, can I just try to throw out my understanding? I think this is what Mr. Cates has had his hand up for. Maybe you can tell me if I have this right. Is that okay, Mr. Cates? Tarkanian and then Mr. Cates. I, what I'm, I think we, this was, this was a discussed with us and explained to us about the CARES money. And so let me try to make it as simple as I can. The CARES money was specified for certain purposes. Some of those purposes were for items that the county had already budgeted. So when the CARES Act paid for some of those items that were already budgeted, those budgeted items would go to the general fund. Is that correct, Mr. Cates, or am I missing something? No, that's correct. Okay. So that's where the money came from. That's the answer. Mr. Case? Uh, maybe I can explain again where the money came from. <clears throat> so the, um, the source of the 1.1 million has been discussed on the record at multiple Board of County Commissioner meetings, including in December. It's also been discussed in multiple private meetings with commissioners. There is no misappropriation of County CARES Act funds. The $1.1 million transfer from RTC to RTC was legal and duly authorized by the Board of County Commissioners in December. Douglas County had all CARES Act expenditures reviewed by our auditors before they were claimed. The Governor's Office of Finance has reviewed claimed expenditures on monthly reports since the grant was awarded earlier this fiscal year. Douglas County has further contracted with our internal auditors, Moss Adams, to do post review on sub grants of CARES Act funds to other entities. CTO Terry Willoughby provided, I'm sorry, CFO Terry Willoughby provided the board a complete transaction level detail of all CARES Act funds to the board at the last meeting. The board referred the review to the audit committee, which is scheduled to review this documentation later this month. As has been explained repeatedly on the record, the $1.1 million transfer to RTC was derived as follows. Douglas County incurred CARES Act eligible expenses last fixed fiscal year between March 2020 and June 30, 2020, when the fiscal year ended. Approximately $1.8 million of those expenses were made from the general fund. That was on the reports that Terry provided at the last meeting. Those expenditures can be reimbursed by the CARES Act fund. The county received the CARES Act grant award in this fiscal year that began July 1, 2020. The county did not receive our full allocation of CARES Act funds until September 2020 with the, required, with the requirement to expend them by December 2020. The CARES Act funds were placed in a special fund to ensure proper tracking. In December, the board authorized moving 1.1 million from the CARES Act fund to partially reimburse the general fund for those eligible expenses from the prior year. At that point, those funds became general fund dollars eligible for appropriation for any purpose appropriate for the general fund. The board lawfully allocated 1.1 million in general fund dollars, not CARES Act dollars, to the RTC to contribute funding for the design of Muller Parkway 
the number one priority for the RTC CIP new construction and infrastructure program. Again, this has been explained mul multiple times, both on and off the record going back to December. Suggestions that CARES Act funds have been misappropriated, which is the conclusion that a lot of the public had come to uh, due to this agenda item, have no merit and cast an unfair and unwarranted cloud over county staff, specifically myself and CFO Terry Willoughby, who have worked tirelessly to ensure CARES Act funds are handled appropriately in conformance with the terms of the state grant. She has done a commendable job. Terry and I take our fiduciary responsibility over public funds very seriously and would never misappropriate funds, which is unlawful under Nevada Revised, revised Statute. Is that All right, Mr. Page, I asked you a question last time. As, was this a budgeted item? When it was approved by the board in December, it became a budgeted item. So yes, it was a budgeted item. I don't recall it being in the budget. And you know, there, there's some things that have been dispersed by the, the board last year. One was $365,000 just out of the blue to get a federal grant to build a road. That money went right in the hopper, wasted. That's my money, taxpayer money, and fiduciary responsibility that we have. And you talk about a fiduciary responsibility. Now we've got $1.1 million that in a panic session in the last part of the year was shoved through, no discussion, no nothing. And <clears throat> now it's just, well, yeah, yeah, everything's okay. I wanna find out where this came from, who approved it and where, how it got to where it is today. That's all. And this hasn't been established yet. So we're not talking about reneging on anything. We just want to know where this came from. We want to hold the money until it's time. And it's my understanding that we don't have to disperse it all at once anyway. We can disperse it as the, the contract progresses. So nobody's going to be out any money. Uh, can we, uh, Mr. Ritchie. Thank you, Chairman. Doug Ritchie with the Douglas County District Attorney's Office. Uh, thank you for that clarification. Uh, just to reiter reiterate, the, the agenda item is not being changed. Um, the item before the board is the adoption of resolution 2021R18. That's what's before the board, which specifically talks about the transfer of 1.1 million from the RTC fund to back to the general fund. Um, the basis, the reason for that, obviously you've shared some of your reasons, um, but, um, and that is why um, some of the public comment that started to go into like possible reasons why the funding might be used, that the actual contract is with the, within the jurisdiction control of the Douglas County Regional Transportation uh, commission, the RTC. So just, just to clarify, because there may be some misunderstanding, this agenda item is about the transfer of 1.1 million from the RTC back to the general fund. The, the reasons for that and further, the board may take further action on that, may have, a, as the chairman indicated, uh, additional presentations on the funding. Right now, as the board knows, you're in the middle of the budget process, but, um, Again, this agenda item is for uh, the board's consideration whether resolution 2021R18 will be adopted, which is the 1.1 million transfer from the RTC to the general fund. Thank you, Mr. Ritchie. Now it can become a budgeted item during the budget uh, for whatever remaining amount is, is owed or, or something of that nature. That's all it is. It's not nothing. We're not stopping anything. <clears throat> Any other, Commissioner Tarkanian? Um, I'm a little confused. I understand you can make budget items when you pass the budget. So maybe this is a question for Mr. Ritchie. Can you pass budget items at other meetings designating certain funds for that use? 
or does it have to be at the end at the at the meeting where they uh, allocate the budgets originally for each year? Not to interrupt, but the board just did that in this very meeting with the uh, greater than anticipated fund balance. So I would say absolutely yes. They can make budget uh, items at any time they choose throughout the year. And I'm a little confused why this would be a concern if the money was provided from the general fund because certain budget items were paid for by CARES money and it was approved by the board. What's the issue? Well, the issue goes back to all of a sudden, this 1.1 million is allocated and it was not issued, it was right at the end of the year. We had a transition of new uh, members on the commission and it was to provide an opportunity to establish what was going on here. We wanted to know what the urgency was and where the money came from. Now we're finding out you know, at this juncture that uh, it came from the CARES Act fund. Well, okay. When we looked at that and we were gonna have the audit committee review the CARES Act fund, which hasn't been done yet. So th this was nothing more than to establish where this came from, why it came up, and uh, what the urgency was at the last minute. It was shoved through, and it was never an agenda item or never a, a budget item. Well, it just, I, it's my it's my understanding there's over four million dollars of care funds that are going to be put put back into the general fund because the cares fund paid for budgetary items that were allocated in the budget. So instead of using those budgetary funds for that item, they use the care funds, which they were allocated for. It's all perfectly legal. It, I mean, unless I'm misunderstood what was explained to us before, the money's legal. So is it the question that it was done in the last board meeting and you want to overturn that meeting because it wasn't discussed with the new members or is it because uh, it can't be because the funding's not right. They just, the funding's been explained to us. Well, there's a combination of things going on here, but basically uh, we, we all have a fiduciary responsibility. And my concern had been, where did this 1.1 million all of a sudden come from? And it hadn't really been discussed by the board. It had been jammed through and it was like, well, what's going on here? So rather than just disperse it all at once, we wanted to bring it back and get a couple of things. We don't have to disperse the 1.1 million all at once. And we also want to find out what the terms of the contract are. Do we not know the terms of the contract? I don't know what they are. Mr. Cates? Uh, so the contract is under the authority of the RTC and mm -hmm. They approved the contract. I know it's a time and material contract for the design of Muller Parkway. I know John Herb is uh, on this call as well, if you want more details than that. Well, there's been a lot of discussion. Is it, uh, here we get to the parkway. Is it one lane or two lanes or four lanes? How many lanes is it? And then there was a discussion about doing the two outer lanes first. So. There's a lot of things in this contract or agreement or whatever it is. Um, I don't know what the answers are. Yep. Um, Mr. Ritchie. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Doug Ritchie with the Douglas County District Attorney's Office. Um, the contract is in the RTC agenda, which is uh, a public record available at the county's website. It specifies uh, the terms of the contract but again, for the, as the county manager, Patrick Cates indicated, this contract was entered by the RTC under its separate statutory authority. So all those questions, um, that's really for the RTC to discuss. Um, again, this agenda item is about a resolution regarding funding. From, back from the RTC, back to the general fund. 
the, the funds can still be dispersed, but you don't have to do it all at once and we can get some questions answered. That's all it is. But then are you, su are you suggesting that we fund part of it right now to get it started? <coughs> Some come back and discuss the final part. Some of it I'm, I'm, has not, been dispersed. I'm sorry, so, I'm not. I'm not understanding. Some of the money has already been dispersed. Did, did you hear that? Yeah, I did. I, I'm not. You know, and, and and this is another another question too. We we don't have to disperse the full amount and. As the work progresses, we can pay for the services provided. So, uh, why are we just giving all this 1.1 million right all up front? Oh, what? No, sad. Uh, in reading the uh, the agenda item, approving a transfer of 1.1 million from the county's regional transportation fund. How did 1.1 million get in there in the first place? Mr. Cage, you want to answer that? It was transferred in by a action of the board in December from the general. And, and where does CARES come in in this? Uh, I can go through what I read before. So the CARES <laughs> Act reimbursed the general fund for last prior year expenditures sufficient to take those monies, which are now general fund money, and transfer them to RTC. Who authorized you to do this? The Board of County Commissioners, sir. I didn't authorize it. A majority of the Board of County Commissioners had a vote, sir. Would you name those commissioners? No, sir, I will not. Okay, we can go on with this taffy pull forever. Anybody want to make a motion? I think we need public comment. Uh, we've had public comment. I'll make a motion that we leave the funds in place. I'll second that motion. We have a motion and a second to leave the funds in place. All those in favor signify by voting aye. Mr. Aye. Mr. Commissioner Gardner. I had I had discussion on the motion. Okay. I believe that discussion on the motion is allowed. Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, what I want to say is that I agree with Mr. Slade's public comments regarding the optics of this issue and the fact that they were extremely poor. Um, that, that, that being said, uh, I also understand our legal obligation of our, of our phase of Muller Parkway under the Park Ranch Holdings Development Agreement. And I'm not gonna get into that, uh, but I'm not trying to negate that either, okay? Um, I, I understand what you're saying regarding a budgeting issue. Uh, however, uh, uh, once again, the optics are, are extremely poor on that. I do have some questions for Mr. Erb, who is our uh, who is on our Regional Transportation Commission and uh, was part of this and uh, is in charge of our roads division, I believe is what his title is. So uh, Mr. Erb, uh, I appreciate you being here and, and coming online uh, with us. Uh, the Board of the regional transportation, so the board uh, did an augment to the regional transportation commission budget of 1.1 million on, I believe it was December 30th. Am I, am I correct about that? Or no, they did it on December 17th. I'm sorry. That's correct. But they augment. Okay. Then the regional transportation committee commission met uh, on the very next night, the 18th. And at that time it was discovered that the contract was actually for 1.3 million for the design element, not 1.1. And since that was not uh, 
publicly noticed in the correct manner, not, not agendized in the correct manner, uh, you did not allocate that 1.1 million uh, in lieu of waiting until a meeting on December 30th to reconvene the Regional Transportation Committee, at which time you allocated 1.3 million out of the Regional Transportation Commission budget. Is that correct? Connor, uh, for the record, uh, you are absolutely correct on the timeline there, yes. Okay, has the Regional Transportation Commission uh, entered into the contract with CA Works? Uh, the contracts with CA Group and it, and it was initiated at the RTC meeting, correct, when they approved the contract. Okay. So we're already committed to that. The Regional Transportation Commission and Douglas County is already committed to that. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. We're proceeding on with the design of Miller Parkway. As Mr. Ingalls is asking, how far, how deep are we into that dollar amount on that or or is that a is that is that a pay as you go, or is that a uh, one point three million dollar commitment that's been been allocated, paid, and and dispersed, and uh, and really is not retrievable by the uh, or or we're not into a timely contract with them on that. I that's what I'm asking. Um, so it is a time and uh, John, for the record, it is a time and materials contract. Uh, so any time and materials they've used up to uh, this point uh, would be the responsibility of the county to uh, um, refund them. Okay. Okay. Um, those uh, are the questions I had uh, during discussion of this motion. Um, and Mr. Mr. Herb, how much uh, has been dispersed up to this point? I have not received an invoice yet, but they have done the surveying, uh, has been started, um, and there's been some work with the subconsultants uh, um, to get started. So, so if the 1.1 million comes back to the county, we can disperse it as you were invoiced for the work that they do. Is that correct? Uh, I, I see. Um, the short answer is we could do that. However, if Terry Willoughby were here, she would tell you that the appropriate way to budget is to put the full amount for the contractual obligation in the appropriate fund in which the obligation exists. I understand that. Where is the 1.1 million or whatever balance there is now? It's in the RTC where it should be to meet that contractual obligation. I don't, I don't agree with that. We can disperse the funds to the RTC as the work is provided. I move the question. Commissioner Tarkanian. <laughs> what? I'm sorry. I just heard uh, Wes say he moves a question. Is that moving for the vote? Oh, no. Uh, uh, John, Herb? Um, yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, um, so we have a contract obligation to pay invoices on a 30-day period. So when they, when we receive an invoice, we have 30 days to pay that invoice. If I have to agendize it and go to the board every time to um, make a payment, uh, we're not going to make that 30 days. Um, so I'm not sure how you, I mean, that's how we do our contracts with uh, contractors or professional services with any engineering firm. We'll receive an invoice. We have 30 days to review it and make a payment. Um, so, okay, thank you, Commissioner Gardner. Is there a payment penalty, Mr. Mr. Erb, uh, for failure to pay on a time limit? Uh, most contractors and firms I've worked with have been, they've never hold us to it there, but you know, that's their, that's their choice. Um, uh, 
that would be a question for uh, Mr. Ritchie. In regards I, I guess why would you want to have the county in default of payments or late on payments? If the money's well, there, why we, would you want that to happen? We don't. Have I wouldn't. I wouldn't, Mr. Tartani, and I'm just asking the question. I, okay. I called for the question quite a while ago. That's not debatable. Is there, is there still a motion on the floor? Yeah, I made the motion to keep the funds where they are. And there was a second by me, Commissioner Rice. Okay, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Nay. So we have uh, Commissioner Gardner, did you vote aye? No, sir, I did not. Uh, well, I, yes, I did. Um, I, once again, I, I hate the optics of this. I abhor the optics of this. Uh, but in my opinion, it's a done deal and we should go forward with it. So mm -hmm. I, will, so I will vote aye. The motion is carried uh, three to two. Thank you, gentlemen. Can, can I just clarify? So the vote was to take the money back from RTC. No, no sir. No. It was to where it is. With is the it? RTC. Okay, sorry. I was confused. Thank you for clarifying. Is everybody clear on that? All right. Item number 15 for presentation only. Reports, updates from county commissioners, members uh, concerning the visitors, boards, and commissioners that may be a member of or a liaison to or meetings, functions. Does anybody have any comments in, on any of the boards and commissions they belong to? Mr. Chairman. Yes. Okay, at the LTVA, uh, Cody Bass, who is the council member from South Lake Tahoe, was uh, placed on the board to replace another member. Uh, the board approved the uh, National Hockey League Lake Tahoe Outdoor Game Sponsorship, which will occur this Saturday and Sunday and will be televised nationally. It will uh, happen at the Edgewood and it's going to be an outdoor tournament. And uh, oh, the uh, advertising campaign was it was slated for the winter. It's been moved to the spring and early summer, as Operation Sierra Storm Medium event uh, will with Al Roker will be uh, uh, here in uh, Lake Tahoe by by uh, by Zoom. That's my report. Who's that? Who's doing the advertising for the event? Do you know? Uh, yeah, it's on uh, NBC, and they are giving a uh, a uh, several million dollars worth of uh, uh, advertising free. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Does that involve our local team, Mr. Rice? Sir? Does that involve our local team? No, sir. This is I NHL. Uh, the... Um, you well, mean I mean, Vegas, local, Vegas, local is in Nevada. Okay. <laughs> Vegas Knights aren't local? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, as far as I'm concerned, Las Vegas is not. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, the Golden Knights will be uh, playing on Saturday. And uh, uh, two teams from the East will be playing on Sunday. And I, I don't have their, their names with me. Is that going to be televised? Yes, sir. It will Holy be televised cow. nationally. I, I'm somewhat disappointed uh, that they're not playing on Pat's Lake, but uh, uh, with the recent uh, temperature rise, uh, we've lost the, uh, the layer of ice on, on Topaz Lake. So uh, anyways, I guess we have to have it up on a golf course. <laughs> Indeed, they have, uh, they have built a uh, uh, ice rink there on the, uh, on the 18th. And, um, there will be, unfortunately, no spectators, but um, they will be uh, practicing on Friday 
and uh, <coughs> uh, it would be lovely to be able to be there. But uh, it's probably going to be colder than a, you know what's rear end. So uh, I, was, I was thinking more of a witch. That'll work. <laughs> <laughs> we could have uh, spectators on Zoom. Ooh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Rice, with, with your pull up there, I would think that you'd get special dispensation for the Board of Commissioners to at least inspect the ice ring during the, uh, during the game. No, sir. Uh, the, uh, the, N the NHL and uh, NBC have been very specific about the fact there will be no spectators. I'm not talking about ex uh, no. spectating. I'm talking about inspecting. By our board of commissioners. When did you become an ice inspector? <laughs> <laughs> okay, enough of this levity. We'll be here all night. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, um, closing public comments. Do you have any comments, Natalie? Um, Natalie Wood, for the record, I do have a few people in there. Um, Doug wanted me to remind everyone that closing public comment is for items um, that public comment was not taken on throughout the agenda. Um, is that good, Doug, or is there anything else I need to state there? That's right. Just to clarify, if uh, on item 14, if you felt like you were not able to speak during that item, closing public comment, you're allowed to speak. If you... Uh, drifted off topic on item 14 or any other item. Closing public comment is, a, you can speak. Okay, and I do have Jim Slade, so I'll start with him. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Who are you now? <laughs> Jim Slade. Well, that was a fun meeting. We tranquilo. <laughs> I promise that I won't delay happy hour by more than three more minutes. Of course, the beauty of being on Zoom meeting from your own house is that happy hour can start anytime you want. Also guarantee you'll still be done long before 930. That, by the way, is not the record. As Mr. Noah said, mentioned, it's more like 1130. Uh, just a few more comments on the Ironwood Senior Living Community that was before the Planning Commission last week that I discussed earlier in public comment. Not only was a special use permit under consideration for a second two-year extension, but so was the major variance to the height of the building. There was insufficient justification to grant the original variance, and even less now that the applicant has changed the project from three stories to two. The applicant has made major changes to the concept and design, none of which was in the agenda packet or supplemental material. As county code states, quote, in reviewing any such extension, the final decision maker must consider the continued appropriateness of the development permit and may add conditions as necessary to ensure the project does not adversely impact other properties in the area and protects the public interest. That was not done. In addressing the required findings for a variance in County Code 20.606 reads, the Planning Commission must not approve a major variance unless it finds that by reason of exceptional narrowness, shallowness, or shape of the property in question, or by reason of exceptional topographic conditions or other extraordinary and exceptional situation or condition of the property in question, the strict application of the provisions of that title would result in peculiar and exceptional practical difficulties to, or exceptional and undue hardships upon the applicant. It is absurd to say that requirement applies to the applicant's primary justification, which was, quote, the architecture of the building includes 10 foot ceilings, creating an open and spacious feel for the residents. That is completely unrelated to the exceptional narrowness, shallowness, or property shape of the property, which do not exist. If that is the main reason for the variance, it would not be an exceptional undue hardship to have normal eight foot ceilings. This sounds like they want to build luxury high-end condos well beyond the means or needs of most seniors. Code also requires that the granting of the variance will not result in material damage or prejudice to other properties in the vicinity. Of course, a 45 foot or even 41 foot tall building would material da materially damage and prejudice the homes on Los Alamitos Street, the adjacent property. How would you like to look out your back window of your home at a 41 foot tall building? What would that do to your property value? I urge the board to look into this travesty of justice. The applicant has not provided any justification whatsoever for a variance for their new two-story proposal 
that was sprung on the planning commission and the public in the middle of consideration on this issue. The required findings for a variance cannot and never could be met. I urge the board to find a way to force the applicant to start all over and come back with a building design no higher than 35 feet as required by county code. And again, we should also hold a joint meeting with the planning commission and staff to make sure that they understand the viewpoint of the current board regarding development because they seem very confused. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, I don't have anyone else with their hands raised for public comment. Do the commissioners have any comments, questions? Seeing none. This Can we meeting. talk some more about the VHRs? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, go, go, go in the closet and talk. <laughs> go back and repeat that whole agenda. Okay. Thank you. Seen, seen none. Um, the meeting is now adjourned and we are at 840. 841. Okay, I'll take that. Good deal. We're done. Okay. Good night all. Bye. Thank Good you. night.